The Anomatron 6000. You know what it is and what it does. Not too long ago, we had it simulate a battle between the SCP Foundation and the slimy, sinister superhero Homelander, who terrorizes the world of the boys. And in the comments, we kept seeing one name pop up, Omni-Man. The terrifying, almost unstoppable Viltrumite warrior who scared the hell out of all of us in Invincible. So, we decided to run a simulation to see if the SCP Foundation could find the same success battling this diabolical, corrupted Superman. The video you're about to see is that simulation. Enjoy, and keep an eye on the skies. It was unthinkable. Panic had spread throughout the Foundation as reports came in that several of the most high-profile groups of interest across the globe had suffered unbearably brutal attacks from an unknown assailant. Notable among the groups targeted were GOC, Global Occult Coalition, as well as its opposing organization, the Serpent's Hand. In all incidents, key buildings belonging to the groups were demolished, and the bodies of all leadership personnel were discovered beaten to a pulp. These massacres appeared to send a terrifying message. Whoever was behind these attacks, the Foundation was most likely next on the chopping block. As all containment sites prepared for the worst, it was Site-17 that received subsequent news on the matter in the most unsettling way imaginable. A small flying object was discovered in the site's airspace and retrieved by an MTF issue helicopter. The object appeared to be an action figure of world-renowned superhero Omni-Man, and it bore the trademark of Dr. Wondertainment Toys. The mobile task force that discovered the action figure had been on such high alert that the appearance of this toy almost seemed comical. There was uneasy laughter within the helicopter, which immediately turned to silence when the toy began to speak. Boys and girls, for the very first time, Dr. Wondertainment presents to you... Run! Run for your lives! Omni-Man is coming for us all! The toy continued what was apparently a pre-recorded voiceover, which became increasingly frightened and desperate as it went along. The contents of the recording confirmed that the one responsible for the devastation of the other groups of interest was none other than Omni-Man himself. His reasons for doing this were unknown, but he seemed adamant on wiping out all groups with significant control over the planet's anomalies. Whoever was in charge at Dr. Wondertainment had uncovered the truth shortly before Omni-Man arrived to do the same to their group, and had deployed the toy in a last-ditch effort to warn the SCP Foundation. It was an uncharacteristically opaque gesture from the terrible toy maker, but the Foundation had little choice but to take it seriously. If Earth's most powerful superhero had really gone rogue and was going after influential organizations in some bid to eliminate competition, the Foundation would have to develop appropriate countermeasures as soon as possible. The first priority was securing the safety of the O5 Council, who would most likely be the intended victims of Omni-Man's rampage. Fortunately, their current location was extremely classified, so rather than shuffle to a new location, the Council chose to stay where they were. A conspicuous relocation process could inadvertently give the game away, especially if the aptly named, Ah, Redacted! It just launched us into space. Procedure was in effect. Omni-Man was known for his spacefaring capabilities, and was fully capable of pursuing and boarding the O5 Council's getaway shuttle if such a thing was attempted. Additionally, there would be no movement of forces to the location of the O5 Council. Mobile task forces that were already in the field would be instructed to immediately cease their current mission and focus on locating Omni-Man. While the superhero was incredibly dangerous, it was paramount that valuable time was bought so that a better attack plan could be formulated. That was one advantage that the Foundation had over most of the other groups of interest, the reserves to prolong a war of attrition, no matter how strong the enemy was. There was also the matter of establishing protections for Site-17, since Wondertainment had sent the action figure there of all places to deliver the message. It was likely that Omni-Man would be headed there first. Site staff requested the immediate transfer of the infamous mobile task force Tau-5 Samsara, a unit of immortal cyborgs with superhuman physiology. While Omni-Man was known to have fought and defeated everything from the spawn of ancient gods to cyborgs to immortals, the four members of Samsara were all three and had strength in numbers. The request remained pending for several minutes, causing one researcher to blithely remark that the O5 Council had probably called dibs. Fearing that MTF Tau-5 wouldn't arrive to intercept Omni-Man, 
the researchers assessed which anomalies contained on site would be best suited to holding the superhero back. One Keter class SCP in particular immediately came to mind, SCP-4051, a male humanoid with the anomalous ability to create extra-dimensional wormholes. These wormholes could be used to produce any object that SCP-4051 desired, including exceedingly unstable cognito hazards. While SCP-4051's powers were certainly formidable, it was the fact that the humanoid, who went by the name Rainier Miller, had previously been acting as a vigilante in the United States. In other words, Rainier Miller was likely to be of special interest to Omni-Man, even if that interest merely amounted to having one more target to wipe out. While it wouldn't be the only humanoid SCP that could be considered similar to a superhero, 4051 was definitely the closest at hand. Not too long after the discussion took place, the sight radars began to pick up Omni-Man closing in. His approach was extraordinarily fast, breaking through the sound barrier and landing with great force in the center of Site 17. There was no time to waste, and all available guards and mobile task force personnel were ordered to zero in on Omni-Man's location and open fire. As one might expect, bullets weren't exactly effective against the superhero-turned-serial killer, but they did provide a plausible distraction while the researchers mobilized to find other means of neutralizing Omni-Man. It was a terrifying sight watching the costumed man stand there within a hail of bullets, bearing no outward signs of distress aside from a stern facial expression. He moved smoothly through the air towards the nearest soldier and shattered every rib with a single punch. He then grabbed another and used him to bludgeon several other agents. Even with the substantial advantage in raw power, there was a considered tactical reason for each of Omni-Man's movements. He systematically made his way through the site, crushing all within his path with absolute prejudice. There were going to be no survivors if this continued. Fortunately, one of the Site 17 other contingencies was about to come into play. You see, the Foundation had done their research, and with the corroboration of information from other groups including the United States government, had deduced that Omni-Man might have psychological weaknesses that could be exploited. Namely, his teenage son, Mark, otherwise known by his superhero alias, Invincible. While the Foundation was far too cautious to directly contact Invincible, mostly out of fear that the boy could be an accomplice, the next best thing could still stall Omni-Man and give the researchers a chance to get SCP-4051 ready for combat. It certainly took Omni-Man by surprise when he was floating down one of the newly blood-soaked corridors and saw Invincible standing at the end staring him down. Dad, what's going on? Why are you hurting them? Said what appeared to be Mark. Omni-Man stopped in his place and his expression changed to a look of concern. For the first time since he arrived at Site-17, Omni-Man spoke. Mark? Come on, Dad, this is crazy! You should stop this and go back home to Mom! Omni-Man froed his brow. Something was off here. For one, this version of Invincible had both feet on the ground, even though he would have all the same powers of his father. Also, the fact that Invincible had an approach suggested that this individual was in such fear of Omni-Man that it refused to approach. Omni-Man had been caught off guard by this at first, worried that his son could be afraid of him to this extent, but it was starting to seem suspicious. Mark was no coward. He had become a superhero like his father because he wanted to protect the world from all manner of threats. Although the difference in combat experience between the two was vast, Omni-Man knew that the Invincible he knew was reckless enough to challenge him, or at least have this conversation at a regular distance. His intuition was right on the money, as this was not Invincible at all but SCP-953, the polymorphic humanoid, instead. While this Keter-class SCP was known for taking many forms, usually that of beautiful women, the Foundation staff had given it access, all available information on Omni-Man and Invincible's father-son relationship, and in doing so, successfully convinced it that taking the form of Omni-Man's son was the best path towards self-preservation during this perilous scenario. SCP-953 continued to make attempts at talking to Omni-Man, doing its best to remain still, not wanting to reveal the vulpine features beneath the invincible costume it was wearing. But Omni-Man proved to be too clever for this gambit. He chuckled, then suddenly zoomed forward with his fist raised in front of him. SCP-953 flinched in terror, 
only to find that Omni-Man had pulled his punch. At first, SCP-953 was relieved to still be intact, but this soon dissipated as the humanoid looked at Omni-Man and found none of the compassion that was on his face just moments ago. You're not Mark, Omni-Man said. He's stronger than this. SCP-953 trembled in fear. The polymorphic humanoid only had one card left to play, and it prayed that it worked. 953 shapeshifted again, this time into Omni-Man's wife, Debbie. Her fox-like features were more pronounced in this form, but it was clear that the sight of his human partner's face made Omni-Man hesitant to attack. This hesitation was all the time that the polymorphic humanoid needed to run away, as several guards and SCP-4051 arrived to take over the duty of stalling Omni-Man. Several wormholes opened up around Omni-Man, deploying sonic grenades which stunned him for several seconds. The guards unleashed all of their ammo and drew Omni-Man's aggression while Rainier prepared his next weapon, a wormhole to a pocket dimension filled with flamethrowers, which he directed at Omni-Man, hoping to at least cause some lasting pain if not proper burns. The flames did temporarily obscure his vision, but that didn't hinder him for long as Omni-Man moved straight upwards through the ceiling before descending back down into the building, massacring the guards surrounding SCP-4051. He looked on Rainier with disdain, especially as the humanoid opened a wormhole and pulled out an aluminum baseball bat. You really think a piece of Earthling sports equipment is going to do anything to me? Omni-Man said. It doesn't matter if it does or doesn't, Rainier replied. You're not the hero you once were and someone has to try to stop you." Omni-Man paused, reminded of his own son. Though mere sentiment wouldn't be to spare Rainier Miller the fate of the rest of his planet and its people, but Rainier opened a wormhole directly in front of himself, which contained multiple anti-tank rifles that fired in Omni-Man's direction. The impact didn't phase Omni-Man, but it slowed the superhero down just enough for Rainier to tuck and roll behind him. Rainier reached into another wormhole for a gas mask, which he quickly donned as another one of his wormholes unleashed deadly poison gas into the corridor. Omni-Man held his breath and flew towards Rainier, grabbing his aluminum bat mid-swing and bending it into an L-shape without any apparent effort. Rainier let go of his weapon, but Omni-Man quickly grabbed him by the wrist and lifted him into the air before slamming him down on the ground. Rainier Miller, SCP-4051, was incapacitated, perhaps fatally. Before Omni-Man could confirm his kill, he was tackled and immediately thrown to the nearest wall by the combined force of four individuals in cybernetic armor. Mobile Task Force Tau-5 Samsara had arrived, and together they surrounded Omni-Man and hit him with everything they had. Punches and kicks bombarded him from all angles, offering barely any window for a response. The formation didn't last long, as Omni-Man withstood the hits and maneuvered behind one of the members of Samsara grabbing and snapping the cyborg's neck in one quick motion. One of its fellow members swung for Omni-Man's face, only for him to catch the blow and severely batter the arm of the attacker, rendering it unusable. Omni-Man grabbed the last two members by the throats and squeezed until he heard the familiar pop and crack, then he let their bodies fall. Of course, this wasn't enough to neutralize Samsara completely. The cyborgs were down, but not out, as their fast regeneration began to fix their injuries. With detached contempt, Omni-Man stomped forcefully on their heads, shattering the skulls of each member of Samsara one by one. That should be a lot harder to fix, Omni-Man thought to himself. He was almost finished here, then it would be on to the next containment site, and eventually to the O5 Council itself. His planet wouldn't need meddlesome groups like the SCP Foundation, made up of inferior humans playing at civilization. He made sure they knew how powerless they were before the rest of the people of Viltrum arrived to complete the conquest of Earth. He applauded the short-lived bravery of Rainier Miller, and in an uncharacteristic moment of mercy, chose not to go back and check if his previous opponent had truly been killed. Omni-Man rationalized that he had already inflicted a killing blow, but deep down, as he concluded his rampage through Site-17 and departed for the site of his next slaughter, he knew that he had subconsciously gave the boy a chance to live. That's right. It's time once again to activate the famed Anomatron 6000, our patented machine that definitely wasn't developed in affiliation with Dr. Wondertainment. We swear. After recalibrating, rebooting, and hitting restart, our infamous specialized supercomputer is ready to bring you all manner of improbable scenarios. We'll simulate encounters between the SCP Foundation's various anomalies and any other character from any other universe you could possibly imagine. Here's a question for you. 
What do you think would happen if SCP-096, the notorious shy guy, ran afoul of someone he couldn't just kill for daring to look at it? What if the Scourge of the Underworld, Battler of Demons, and the Devil himself set his sights on SCP-096? Well, we're about to hit the button and discover the outcome of SCP-096 versus the dreaded Doomslayer. So, you've heard the old philosophical debate about a tree falling down in the woods, and whether or not nobody being around to hear it brings into question if it actually happened at all, right? Well, let's reframe that one a little. If an interdimensional rip in the very fabric of the time-space continuum opens up in an SCP Foundation secure facility and nobody is around to witness it, does a six-foot-tall, 360-pound hulking killing machine still emerge to slaughter everything in his path? It turns out, yes. Yes, he definitely does. Horrified screams and the loud bang of shotgun blasts rang out through the hallway as Foundation researchers ran for their lives. The Doom Marine had just been unceremoniously dropped out of a portal into a strange and unfamiliar environment. Mere minutes earlier, he had been awakened inside a sarcophagus within a facility on Mars in the year 2148. Unfortunately, Doom Guy hadn't had the best start to his day, given that the base he'd woken up in was being overrun by the forces of Hell itself. Thanks to a rogue scientist opening up portals to the underworld and allowing all manner of demonic abominations to come pouring through. So naturally, when another portal brought the armor-clad Demon Slayer to a site run by the SCP Foundation, the intensity of battle had led to the Doom Slayer believing that the unsuspecting staff were actually all demons in disguise. And to him, the only good demon is one he got to send back to hell in the most brutal fashion imaginable. He wasn't going to stop until he'd torn through wave after wave of Foundation personnel, thinking perhaps if he killed enough, he'd be returned to his previous locale for more demon killing. As the Foundation dispatched its security forces and mobile task forces to take down the unstoppable force of Carnage decked out in head-to-toe green armor, it seemed nothing they could throw at the Doom Marine was enough to take him down. A hail of bullets rained down on him from the MTF's weapons, ricocheting ineffectually off his protective plating as he continued his assault, remaining tireless thanks to his immense physical conditioning. The SCP Foundation tried and failed to contain Doom Guy. They assumed him to either be a new, undocumented anomaly, or a violent and unhinged maniac from the Church of the Broken God. Given his armor resembling cybernetic augmentations and machine parts grafted to his body, along with his arsenal of advanced weaponry. But there were no enhancements, no augmentations made to the Doomslayer. He may have once been mortal, but centuries of killing demons had allowed him to transcend ordinary human physiology. He did not tire, never lost strength, never needed to eat or drink, and was near enough a mortal. Yet among all the chaos that was unfurling, a solitary researcher had just managed to slip out of the Doom Slayer's reach. He ran as fast and far as he was physically able. The mobile task force troops were getting eviscerated, and the Slayer could easily tear through the whole Foundation. Then, fleeing for his life, the researcher had an idea. Either a stroke of genius or total idiocy, and a risky move either way. He would send an anomaly on the Doom Slayer. He turned to the nearest containment cell, a windowless room with a heavy locked door. Hurriedly inputting his security clearance code, the researcher heaved the door open and covered his eyes with his arm. It wouldn't have been his first choice of SCP to send into battle. SCP-096's cell was the closest. Lumbering out of its containment chamber on its misshapen, elongated legs, SCP-096 scanned the area. Alarms were blaring. It was loud and frightening to the timid, albeit terrifying creature. It reached up to cover its ears in bewilderment. Not that the researcher who had freed it could see what it was doing. For one, his eyes were still covered, and for another, he was already dead, thanks to the Doomslayer barging shoulder first through a nearby wall and raining debris onto the nearby researcher. Beneath the visor of his helmet, the Marine breathed heavily, panting but not tiring, as he looked at the pale, skinny creature in the corridor before him, it was clutching the sides of its head, its huge jaw hung open, 
As far as the Slayer knew, he was making progress. His attack was working. He'd killed enough of these demonic imposters that they were starting to reveal their true forms. Although in all his years of bloodshed and being a scourge to the denizens of Hell, he hadn't quite ever seen a demon that looked like the Shy Guy. Not that it mattered to Doom Guy. Before long, it'd be dead like all the rest. The towering, stick-thin creature turned to face the armor-adorned warrior and shrieked. Immediately overcome with anguish having a full-blown breakdown as it often did whenever someone looked at it. As the demon killer stomped down the corridor towards it, the Doom Blade, a long, sleek, razor-sharp edge extended from the Slayer's gauntlet where it was mounted on his wrist. He reached down and yanked the ripcord on his chainsaw too. He was long overdue for a glory kill. But before he could strike at SCP-096, the Shy Guy moved with impossible speed, faster than even the Doom Marine himself. It zipped behind the encroaching Marine, moving quicker than he could perceive. One second SCP-096 was crying and wailing in front of him, then not even a full second later, the creature was towering over Doom Guy from behind. SCP-096 gripped the Doom Blade and snapped it with ease, like breaking a twig before reaching its other long arm down and pulling the chainsaw from Doom Guy's hand. The motorized blade was still running as it clattered to the ground, cutting a hole through the floor and falling down into the lower level of the facility. Enraged as he very often was, the Doom Slayer reached both arms back behind his head and gripped the elongated torso of SCP-096. The virtually immortal killing machine hurled the creature over his head with ease, thanks of course to his immense strength. Doom Guy could lift objects far heavier than most ordinary humans and carry heavy weapons without tiring. He had even grappled hand-to-hand -hand with demons. Throwing the Shy Guy down the corridor like hurling a basketball was no trouble for the spacefaring slaughterer of Satan's spawn. Screaming and howling in pain, SCP-096 crashed to the ground at the far end of the corridor, tumbling over itself thanks to its long limbs before landing in a confused heap. As the Shy Guy reoriented itself, struggling back onto its feet and standing up at its full height, it was instantly knocked back down as the force of something struck it. Barring down on SCP-096, the Doom Machine charged, his signature double-barreled sawed-off shotgun drawn. It was hardly leaving a scratch on SCP-096's pale skin, despite the moderate amount of damage the weapon was capable of. Two shots would ring out, reeling the creature but not harming it. Then, by the time SCP-096 managed to recover from the blast, the Slayer had finished reloading in time to open fire yet again. Even as the Doom Slayer raced nearer, closing the distance between him and what he thought to be another demon for him to kill, the shotgun seemed to have little effect against the Shy Guy at close range. Stowing the weapon, Doom Guy put all of his focus and energy into his charge, heavy boots stomping against the ground as he raced towards the Shy Guy still stunned by the latest shotgun blast. Before the creature could steady itself, this time it was struck by another force, a heavy object barreling towards it. The Doom Slayer shoulder barged SCP-096, sending the pair of them crashing through the nearest wall. They burst into a neighboring room, with the Doom Slayer keeping a single-armed grip around the Shy Guy, while repeatedly delivering vicious punches to its gut with his other hand, not once relenting. SCP-096 screeched in pain, clawing at the Slayer, but unable to tear through his impenetrable armor. As they crashed through yet another wall, SCP-096 did something it rarely ever did. In fact, maybe something it had never ever done before. It ran away from someone that had looked at it. While the creature was deeply insecure and so self-conscious that it would kill anyone who saw so much as a photograph of it, it didn't often feel afraid. But the Doom Slayer, this muscle-bound killing machine that had brutally butchered actual demons was so imposing, so threatening, and so effective at dispensing painful punishment that he scared the fight out of SCP-096. Sobbing with terror, the creature zipped away using its anomalous speed, trying desperately to put as much distance between it and the Doom Marine as it possibly could. But therein lay the problem. No sooner had SCP-096 gotten away from the scourge of hell than the creature immediately felt the familiar pull. Whether it was an inescapable compulsion to kill everyone who looked at it, or the fact of the Shy Guy's biology, it could only distance itself from the Slayer for a few seconds before it reappeared next to him. 
From the Doomguy's perspective, it seemed like the creature was intentionally disappearing and reappearing, using its teleportation-like speed to evade a volley of his attacks. SCP-096 came at him again, stuck in a loop of trying to attack the Doomslayer for looking at it, to immediately regretting that course of action and fleeing in fear of its hulking, heavy weapon-toting target. Doomguy drew every weapon he had in his arsenal, launching a barrage of high-explosive ordnance from his rocket launcher to try and kill SCP-096. The resulting damage practically reduced an entire wing of the Foundation site to rubble, but still couldn't kill the Slayer's opponent. Meanwhile, in the moments that the Shy Guy temporarily forgot his own fear for the Doomguy, it managed to rush towards him, swiping the Marine's various technologically advanced armaments out of his hands, before instantly remembering why he was so scared of the green armored force of destruction and dashing away. Doomguy's supply of weapons had all but depleted. Neither he nor SCP-096 were getting tired out by their constant back and forth. They were locked in a stalemate, until the Shy Guy tried to get back to its cell. Zipping away once again, it cowered in the corner, reaching for an old worn-out paper bag that had slipped over its head. It sat down, trembling, rocking back and forth in a fetal position. The Shy Guy was terrified. An overwhelming, debilitating fear gripped it. Fear that became pure dread as the sound of heavy boots began to stomp closer and closer. Kicking the steel door off its hinges, the Doomslayer walked into SCP-096's cell, carrying something huge in his hands. It was one of the most devastating weapons Doomguy had at his disposal, capable of unleashing untold destruction, the BFG-9000. Without remorse, not caring that the creature seemed to have retreated and was cowering away from him, the Slayer raised the powerful weapon and fired an enormous ball of green energy. The blast engulfed the entire room, tendrils snaking out from the energy projectile, causing additional damage to the surrounding area, until there was nothing left of SCP-096. Here we are again with the Anomatron 6000 our state-of-the-art simulation computer that helps us create hyper-accurate simulations of some of the world's most bizarre scenarios. Whether it's SCP-096 vs. Siren Head, Abel vs. Chainsaw Man, or now perhaps our most ridiculous matchup yet, SCP-035, the Diabolical Possessive Mask vs. The Mask, the popular Jim Carrey character based on the hyper-violent comic book of the same name. So, what the heck are we waiting for? Let's crank up the machine and see what the results are. Somebody stop me! Okay, so what have we got on intake today? Researcher Werb asked, a tone of boredom hanging off his every word. A uh, possible anomalous entity? His compatriot Dr. Mackney replied, sipping his coffee, sounding equally as unenthused. Caucasian male, early 30s, a team of our agents picked him up in... The Foundation doctor checked his notes. Some place called Edge City? Real appealing tourist spot. He added sarcastically. Now, oh, what's so anomalous about him? Werb questioned. His eyes lazily scanned over a file Mackney had handed him. Says here he's just an ordinary bank teller. There's one prior arrest on his record, but the charges were dropped later on. Man, this guy's a nobody. Apparently, he was in possession of an anomalous artifact, came the doctor's reply. He looked through the one way glass into the interrogation room, sat at the table wearing a matching pair of hideous pajamas, was a wiry, brown haired man. What was it? Researcher Werb asked, not bothering to check the file. A mask, apparently, Macme replied. This thing can form a symbiotic connection with whoever wears it. This guy's had it for a while. It causes him to undergo a dramatic intensification of his personality when he puts it on, as well as granting him some, uh, unusual abilities. Hold on, aren't you just describing SCP-035? Werb said, looking confused. Nope, the doctor responded by handing him a clear evidence bag. And it was a single wooden mask, a dull, darkish green tint to the object. It looked to be almost Viking in its design, with three holes on its surface, one for the mouth and two for the eyes. It was hard to deny, it was completely different from the white porcelain of SCP-035. What's this guy's name again? Werb sighed, looking at the scruffy, pajama-clad man waiting for them. Ipkiss, his colleague replied. Stanley Ipkiss. Meanwhile, locked up tight in a hermetically sealed glass case was another anomalous mask. SCP-035 was kept under lock and key by the Foundation, guarded constantly by a pair of armed security officers. 
One of them, Officer Riegert, had noticed something strange about the infamous possessive mask today, or stranger than usual anyway. SCP-035 was known to compel people to wear it if they were close enough, often through subtle, psychic whispers, but today it seemed restless, almost agitated, like it found something nearby to be intensely annoying. I already told you everything I know. Stanley Ipkiss sighed exhaustedly. He'd been dragged out of bed at the crack of dawn by strange agents and was now being interrogated about what he knew of the wooden mask he'd come across floating in the river one fateful night. I don't know where it came from, I swear. I didn't even realize I still had it. Uh, we threw it back in the river, but my dog must have swum out and fetched it, Stanley explained. You have no idea what this thing is, not even from any first-hand experience, Mr. Ipkiss? Dr. Mackney asked, holding the mask up. Look. I did take it to a psychologist who told me it might be Scandinavian, a representation of some Norse night god, uh, Loki, I think, he answered. We're not interested in this mask as a historical art piece, researcher Werb retorted. Tell us what happens when you put it on. Stanley paused for a moment, clearly aware he was in real trouble, but nervous about coughing up the details to his shady captors. With a sigh, he decided it was best to confess. I don't know how it works. But whenever you put it on, it's like it brings your deepest desires to life. When I wear that mask, I can do anything, be anything, he described, remembering a key detail. But it only works at night. Dr. Mackney and researcher Werb exchanged looks, uncertain if Ipkiss was just a lunatic or if there was truth to what he was telling them. Assemble a security team, Mackney sighed. We'll arrange a safe environment for you tonight, Mr. Ipkiss. Elsewhere in the facility, Riegert and his fellow security officer, Duggan, was watching over SCP-035 with growing concern. What do you reckon has this thing so agitated? Duggan wondered aloud. Who knows? Riegert sighed. I've already reported it to command, told them 035's in a mood. They said to proceed as normal. Suddenly, as the words left his mouth, Officer Riegert felt strange. It was like he had been hooked by an overwhelming urge to put the possessive mask on. He barely noticed he had reached to unlock the door sealing the area where SCP-035 was contained in its case, and as he stepped through, Officer Dugan's pleas for him to stop barely registered. The other officer tried in vain to pull Riegert back as he walked towards the possessive mask, only to feel his co-worker grip his shirt and swing him face first over and over again into the glass case containing the anomalous object. His body going completely limp after being used to break the glass, Rieger dropped Dugan to the floor, too lost in his trance-like state, to realize he'd just killed a fellow Foundation security officer. He was too focused on SCP-035 as he lifted it up and placed it over his face. Meanwhile, Stanley Ipkiss had been brought to a testing area, a team of security officers standing around him. The fact that they were all armed did little to ease Stanley's nerves. Dr. Mackney strode up to him, pulling the green wooden mask out of the airtight bag it had been sealed in, and handed it to Stanley. No funny business, Mr. Ipkiss, the doctor warned. I really can't promise that, Stanley replied. He looked at the mask in his hands, noticed a green shimmer over the reverse side of it. As much as he had gladly given it up, part of him had missed wearing it. He could already hear the low rumbling of thunder outside as he lifted it towards his face, feeling it almost leap out of his hands and latch itself onto him. The green mask eagerly became attached to Stanley, the surface of it spreading out where it covered his face and wrap around his entire head. Around him, the guards cautiously stepped back as they watched Stanley convulse and writhe around the place uncontrollably, like a man possessed. Both researcher Word and Dr. Mackney looked at each other in wordless disbelief before turning back to the scene unfolding before their eyes. The booming noise of thunder and cracks of lightning rang out, despite this all taking place indoors, as Stanley Ipkiss vanished in the center of a miniature tornado that spun wildly around the testing area, before slowing to a halt. In its place stood a maniacal wide-eyed figure, dressed in a garish yellow zoot suit, and wearing an enormous toothed grin on his bright green face. How do, fellas? The mask bombastically hooted at the guards. Having been trained to deal with absurd anomalies aplenty, the security team all defensively raised their weapons out of a mix of instinct and confusion. Eesh, rough crowd, <laughs> the green-faced lunatic stated to nobody. It looked like he had turned aside, as if addressing some invisible audience. Outstretching both arms and one leg, the mask instantly zipped off, hurling around the room in a whirlwind of absurdity in the style of an old Tex Avery cartoon. 
The spinning, cackling combination of Stanley Ipkiss and the magical mask weaved in between the Foundation guards, all of whom tried in vain to restrain him until he disappeared out of the door. After him! Dr. Mackney yelled with urgency in his voice. The guards all turned to run after the mask, only for each one of them to trip over and land face first on the floor of the testing area as if something had tied them all up by their ankles. It was only after the security officers all struggled back up to their feet that they noticed their pants had been yanked down, leaving the Foundation's finest somewhat embarrassed, to say the least. Outside the testing area, Stanley, or rather the mask, had already closed the door behind him. Out of nowhere, he produced a series of wooden planks and began hammering them into the doorframe boarding it up before speedily adding chains and padlocks to the mix. Sighing and in an over-exaggerated manner, wiping the sweat from his brow, he turned around, only to be met with the sight of even more SCP Foundation guards lying in wait, their guns all trained on him. The mask gave a scream of pure terror that briefly sent his skull popping out of his head and his eyes shooting out of his skull before everything zipped right back into its original place. His eyes darted around at the faces of the Foundation security, wondering how he was going to get out of this one. Oh gee, this all seems familiar, he said either to himself or his audience. Well, if it ain't broken, hit it! In the blink of an eye, the mask's bright yellow outfit had transformed replaced by a silk blue rumba shirt with ruffled sleeves, white pants, and a wide-brim black hat. As they watched him stood at the ready, a few of the guards noticed the sound of… music? Not one of them could tell where it was coming from, nor could they help starting to tap their feet or bob their heads to the rhythm of the Cuban Pete rumba. The entire security team quickly erupted into a full-blown dance number that anyone who saw it couldn't resist joining all led by the mask, wildly waving maracas in the air and singing. Elsewhere in the facility, Officer Riegert was beginning to melt. He still had SCP-035 covering his face, the frown of the possessive mask conveying the entity's sheer discontent. The black ooze secreting from its porcelain surface had the unfortunate effect of corroding and melting down anyone that wore it dissolving them entirely after a short period of time. Determined, SCP-035 pushed on, plotting its host towards a storage room. If it remembered correctly, the SCP Foundation had stored a number of temporary hosts for it, mannequins that, while not human, had enough of a humanoid shape for the possessive mask to use. Of course, after all of its attempts to escape, the Foundation had rescinded its privilege to be granted new hosts, not that it could stop it from taking them by force. Using the last of Officer Riegert's dwindling strength, SCP-035 barged its way into the storeroom. Sure enough, waiting there for it was a row of discarded mannequins. Lifting Riegert's hands before they had fully melted away, the possessive mask used him to place itself on a new body. Elsewhere not too far away in the Foundation facility, a conga line of security officers and research personnel was parading through the corridors, all happily dancing and jiving to the music, despite still no one being able to figure out where it was coming from. Dashing away from his spot at the front of the line, the mask zipped around a corner, his clothes having changed back to his signature brightly colored zoot suit. Never say no to a party, he exclaimed after having danced his way to freedom. The sound of something shuffling closer quickly caught the mask's attention. He turned around to find himself standing green face to porcelain face with SCP-035. You. The masked mannequin raised a hollow arm, pointing a finger from its host at Stanley. You bear the god of mischief's carving. I could sense its presence since you arrived. Still in my look, nobody likes a copycat fella, the mask replied. Although intimidation is the sincerest form of flattery, and that's how Jim Carrey's career started. <laughs> he added, exploding with raucous laughter. Cease your prattling! SCP-035 hissed with spite. Say, perhaps we're related. The mask ignored it. Oh, we could be long lost family. You know, I always wanted kids of my own. Son of the mask has a nice ring to it, right? He paused once again, turning away to his unseen audience. On second thought, maybe not. The SCP-035 controlled mannequin leapt forward, gripping the mask's arm causing him to scream in shock at the advanced. His eyes bulged out of their sockets, zooming in on the corrosive black secretions oozing from SCP-035. The mannequin's other hand started reaching upwards, gripping his oversized green head as if it were trying to lift the mask right off of Stanley's face. Zooming away again, he sped down the nearest corridor his arms stretching behind him, still clamped in SCP-035's grip. 
Coming to a screeching halt with the comical sound of car brakes, the mask wobbled his outstretched arm. A ripple traveled all the way along the elongated limb, as if it was made of elastic. His wrist still being held by the mannequin sporting the possessive mask, the force of the flailing rubbery arm was so great that it flung SCP-035's host body around, sending it head first into the ceiling, then plummeting back down to the ground. Its grip loosened, allowing the mask to reel back its stretchy arm, although it didn't return to normal length right away. His own hand pinged back and hit him in the face, only to start urgently trying to communicate of its own accord. What's that, boy? The mask said to his hand as it started performing a series of signals. Little Timmy stuck down a well. You'd like a Friday night off? There's a two-bit chump wearing another mask walking menacingly down the hall towards us? The hand suddenly turned the mask's head to look in the right direction. Sure enough, SCP-035 was using the mannequin to walk down the hall towards him. His elongated arm quickly returned to its normal size, as the green-faced lunatic took a quick draw stance, facing his oncoming adversary. Now, you have to ask yourself one question. He sneered, doing a fairly convincing impression of a green Clint Eastwood. Do I feel lucky? With a sweep of his hand, the mask had drawn an enormous weapon. The thing was a gigantic mass of different artillery, clicking and whirring. There were barrels on top of barrels, rockets, and other explosives locked into place. Do I feel lucky? The mask continued. Well, do you, punk? SCP-035 did nothing to slow its advance, so the mask pulled the trigger. Every one of his weapon's various components spat out a tiny flag with the word BANG written on it. Ah, performance issue. He said, doing his aside once again. Not that I'm overcompensating for anything. Clearly growing agitated, piloting its host, SCP-035 started charging towards the mask. Immediately, he spun around, becoming a tornado of hyperactivity and whooping noises as he sped down the adjacent corridor. The possessive mask staggered after him. The ooze leaking from the porcelain anomaly was dripping onto the mannequin wearing it causing the plastic to be melted away, exposing the flimsy metal skeleton beneath. It knew it had to merge with a new host, find something else to corrupt. SCP-035 chased after the cartoonish troublemaker, knowing that if it could catch him, he'd be able to survive merging with it. His body, while wearing the other mask, barely obeyed the laws of physics, making him invulnerable to damage and possibly even the corrosive substance oozing from the possessive mask. As if those weren't enough reasons, his powers seemed virtually limitless. Combined with the green-headed lunatic, SCP-035 could do anything. Reaching a stop at the end of another corridor, the mask spun around, wearing a comically undersized baseball uniform. He reached into his pocket and produced an oversized baseball bat, then proceeded to start hurling baseballs into the air and swatting them as hard as he could. As the mask increased the speed of his swings, a volley of hard cork baseballs were fired down the corridor like a barrage of bullets, ricocheting off the walls and hitting the oncoming SCP-035. Each one struck its target, reeling the mannequin, but doing little much else to stop it getting closer and closer, until, with an almighty swing, the mask brought his bat crashing into SCP-035 with enough force to send the possessive mask and its hosts careening down the corridor. It sailed through the air, bursting through a wall, then flew into a research lab, tearing a huge hole in the next wall as it kept going. Finally, it came crashing out of the last wall, the outer wall of the facility, and dropped multiple stories to the ground outside. Changing costumes back to his classic suit and dashing after SCP-035, the mask passed through all the holes his adversary had left in the multiple walls it had crashed into. He screeched to a halt again and paused after getting through the outer wall, only to realize after a moment that he was hovering in mid-air, not standing on anything. Reaching into his suit pocket, the mask pulled out a sign on a stick with a single word written on it. Yikes. He plummeted down to ground level, landing with such an immense crash that his body cracked into the asphalt below. It left a perfect outline of him imprinted in the ground, causing the mask to go completely pancake flat head to toe. Suddenly, before he could peel himself up off the ground and go back to being three-dimensional, SCP-035 staggered to its host's feet and pinned the mask down. Finally, it growled. I've caught you. I've won. 
Your power is mine. Once I've combined with you, I will be able to ravage this world. I'm going to fuse to your face. Then I'll start with decimating those wretches that imprison me. The foundation will fall, and then so will the rest of their precious world. Forcefully, the mannequin's hand wrenched the mask off the ground. But as SCP-035 turned to look at what it had hoped to be its next host, well, let's just say the tragedy frown carved into its porcelain face had never been more appropriate. It wasn't holding the mask, it was holding a life-size cardboard cutout of a photo of the mask, grinning out from one side. Enraged, the possessive mask tore the decoy in half with its mannequin's hands. Hey, Pachuco! said a cartoonish voice from right behind it. Did you miss me? The mask had reappeared for real this time, grinning with his huge teeth, clearly getting a kick out of having someone to torment. SCP-035, on the other hand, had been getting increasingly irritated by all the wacky cartoon antics. With all the aggression it could channel through its mannequin host, it gripped the mask by the throat, his eyes bulging out of his head again. See, no need to get all choked up over it! He gagged. You are so tiresome! The possessive mask yelled, having finally run out of patience. You know what? I won't merge with you. I should just kill you and put an end to your buffoonery. Let me take this thing off you first, though. Its mannequin fingers started to hook into the mask's seam at the back of his bald green head. Wait, wait! The mask begged, putting up both his hands in surrender. At least give me a final request, huh? Master Mask! Before the possessive mask could respond, the mask had swept it off its dissolving mannequin feet. He started to spin it around in a wild, over-the-top dance number, bopping and swinging to a tune that seemed to be coming from nowhere. The longer it went on for, the more and more of SCP-035's host's body started to dissolve away, until the mannequin finally wasted away. All that was left was a bubbling pile of black goo on the ground with the possessive mask laying in the middle. The mask chuckled, noticing the fumes trailing upwards into the air as the corrosive substance melted away the last of SCP-035's host. Talk about smoking! What's up, gamers? Hello there, everyone. My name's SCP Explained. A lot of SCP fans have played the free survival horror game SCP Containment Breach. The game's story places the player in the shoes of a D-Class at one of the Foundation's containment sites, as they try their best to survive a massive, catastrophic containment breach. Many players, including some of our viewers, feel as if the simulated experience has given them the tools they would need to survive a real-life containment breach. But can playing a video game really be sufficient training for encountering some of the deadliest SCPs in containment and escaping with your life? In order to answer this question, we're going to speculate based on one of the game's most prolific players, famous YouTuber and gamer Markiplier. If playing this game counts as training, then Markiplier has enough hours logged to be a bona fide expert in facing off against the many dangerous anomalies at the SCP Foundation. So kick back, crack open some G Fuel, and let's see if Markiplier lives to game another day. To set the scene, let's all imagine that somehow, through a hiccup in time and space, or by some sort of wish on a cursed monkey's paw, Markiplier found himself inside of an SCP Foundation containment site. That would be bad enough, but the blaring alarms and sounds of chaos signal that he arrived at the worst possible time during a containment breach. The security systems are down, the cells are open, and danger lurks around every corner. Armed with nothing but his wits and winning personality, the only thing he can do is try to navigate the facility as carefully as possible, remember everything he's learned from his time streaming the video game version of this place, and hope he can escape with his life. Let's start with one we know he'd be well equipped to face, SCP-173. The next snapping sculpture is the main antagonist of SCP Containment Breach, so Markiplier would be familiar with the necessary precautions to avoid winding up as its next victim. If he happened to walk into a room and spot the figure, frozen in his gaze, he would know to keep his eyes on the sculpture no matter what, and slowly back out of the room without blinking. Plus, with all of the time he spends looking at screens, he's definitely used to keeping his eyes on one thing for a long period of time. Congratulations, Mark. You survived that one. He's managed to get away from SCP-173 with his neck still intact. Hooray! But as he sneaks through the hall, trying not to draw any unwanted attention, a French-accented voice breaks the silence behind him. Good evening, my fine fellow. Are you feeling quite well? There behind him is SCP-049, the Plague Doctor, in all of his beak-masked, black-robed glory. 
You look feverish. Please, allow me to administer some simple tests. In this scenario, Mark would have to think fast and use some of that patented Markiplier charm to get himself out of a potentially sticky situation before one of those gloved hands can touch him. He would need to politely excuse himself, insist that he just saw his doctor earlier that day, and then, before the plague doctor can take another step closer, run as fast as he possibly could in the opposite direction. As Markiplier stops to catch his breath, having thrown the plague doctor off of his trail, the sound of sobbing in the corner signals that he might have just escaped the proverbial frying pan only to wind up in the fire. A quick cursory glance up, and the sight of a long-limbed pale humanoid form would confirm his suspicions. Yes, yes indeed. He's found himself alone with SCP-096, the Shy Guy. Remembering the details of this particular anomaly from the game, he would look back down at the ground immediately, making sure not to glimpse the creature's face. As long as he avoided looking at its face, it would stay in the corner of the room, scarcely even acknowledging him. Then he would be free to make a mad dash for the exit. All the while, SCP-096 would stay hunched over, crying and completely aware it was briefly in the presence of a beloved YouTube personality. Things might be going pretty well for Markiplier so far, but uh oh, what's that sound? The slither of tentacles on tile, the thumping of a large heart, and the murmuring voice of an elderly Englishman? Poor Markiplier. Video games definitely wouldn't have prepared him for the arrival of SCP-058, the heart of darkness. It's come out of its cage, and it's doing just fine. But the same can't be said for any living thing that this creepy, animate, and highly hostile creature encounters. Endless suffering is the woe of ignorant men who never lack to see the depth of their own hearts and only see the wealth of a poor world suffering of silver and brutal gladness, the heart whispers as it scuttles towards the hapless YouTuber. Without much prior knowledge of the anomaly, Mark would be thoroughly unprepared for any encounter with it. He would likely fall victim to its spiked tentacles or the sharp stinger, and any attempt to physically fight it off would be ineffective due to the anomaly's resilience to physical attacks. We don't need to get into the details of how that specifically might end. It would be a bit tasteless. But there are friendly anomalies that Markiplier might stumble upon too. Suppose, instead of suffering an untimely end at the tentacles of a heart monster that speaks in creepy, atmospheric gibberish, he found himself face to face with SCP-073, Kane. It would be a nice reprieve, to be sure, as Kane is generally pleasant and congenial to any humans he meets. You never know, he might even be a fan of Mark's work. The same can't be said for Kane's counterpart, SCP-076, however. It's nothing personal, Abel feels murderous rage towards any and all human beings, but it's hard not to take it personally when you see Abel running at you at full speed, brandishing a massive sword that's poised to take your head off with one swing. If Markiplier faced Abel on his own, he would unfortunately not stand much of a chance. Again, it's nothing personal, he's a super powerful ancient warrior with a taste for bloodshed. If Cain was in the vicinity, however, then he might just be able to escape unscathed. Kane is one of the few anomalies that can easily oppose Abel, as any damage Abel manages to do to him will only affect Abel. So the best case scenario for Mark would be to let the two immortals go at it while he sneaks away quietly. After all the stress of navigating the containment site, Markiplier would probably really need some cheering up. After all, his entire sense of reality is crumbling around him at a rapid pace. Good news, because SCP-999 can always sense when someone nearby needs that frown turned upside down. The Tickle Monster doesn't appear in the Containment Breach game, so Mark might not know what to expect when he sees a large mass of bright orange slime oozing toward him at a rapid pace. But once SCP-999 wrapped him in a big hug and its natural mood-boosting properties kicked in, he would know that this particular creature is friend, not foe. He would give the slimy visitor some affectionate pats, and the Tickle Monster would coo happily in return. SCP-999 might try to follow Markiplier down the hall, but he would insist it stay where it is needed, helping the various humans and anomalies of the Foundation when they need a little bit of sweetness and light in their lives. Then the two would part ways, each with their spirits lifted, and with fond memories of their new friend that would last a lifetime.
But you can never let your guard down at the SCP Foundation, not even for a second as you're enjoying a hug from everyone's favorite happy slime creature. If you relax and forget to keep your wits about you, you might not notice the wall behind you starting to warp and melt as something horrible reaches through it from a dark place outside space and time. If Markiplier turned around to find himself face to face with the cold dead eyes of SCP-106, the old man, what would happen next? The rotten old man appears in containment breach, so Mark would know exactly how bad things can get if this ominous octogenarian gets his decaying hands on him. He would also know that doors, walls, and other solid objects are not enough to deter this entity once he sets his sights on taking you. It is possible that Mark could run, could stay out of the old man's sight until the creature gets bored or find some other more convenient prey to snatch up. But it's more than likely that SCP-106 would be excited by the chase and would delight in the fear and pain that he is causing. Unlike in Containment Breach, where SCP-106's movements can be predicted, the real thing is far more crafty and malicious. And there's no starting over if the old man catches up to you in the real world. Unfortunately, Markiplier would likely find himself pulled through the wall and into the entity's lair, where only Doom would be waiting. How might Markiplier fare against another prominent character in Containment Breach, though? Say, one very tricky, possessive mask. Thankfully, his experience with the game would have taught Mark in advance that SCP-035 cannot be trusted under any circumstances. However, the mask in the game is at least a little bit helpful, offering valuable information about navigating the containment site, and even providing insight into other threats to the player's safety. The real thing is nowhere near as generous. It has no desire to help humans or anyone but itself, really. If it wound up in the same room as Markiplier, it would only have one goal and one goal only. Get him to take it out of its case and put it over his face. Hopefully Markiplier would know better than to wear the wicked porcelain mask, but its psychic influence is strong. We couldn't blame him if he wound up succumbing to it, putting it on and becoming the mask's newest human host. It would be thrilled to have found such a famous body to take over, too, who would pilot Markiplier out of the containment site, take him back home, and become the first SCP with over 1 million YouTube subscribers. Aside from this channel, of course. I shudder to think what SCP-035 would do with such a massive platform. It definitely wouldn't be anything good. Now, there aren't just anomalies at the Foundation. There are lots of staff members working to keep the well-oiled machine running smoothly. Of course, some are better at this than others, and some staff are just agents of chaos all on their own, but that makes life more fun. Imagine a team-up between the most fun-loving, memeable researcher at the SCP Foundation and Markiplier. That's right, Dr. Jack Bright himself. Now, many people don't know this, but Dr. Bright is a big fan of gaming YouTubers and has wanted to start a channel of his own for quite some time. The Foundation won't allow him to run any of his own social media, concerned about the potential for secure information leaking to the public, but a chance encounter with one of his favorite YouTube creators would be just the kind of opportunity Dr. Bright has been waiting for. Sure, Markiplier might be caught a bit off guard by a strange man in an amulet asking him to collab, but Dr. Bright's big personality, sense of humor, and high energy would make him a great guest to have on the channel. At least until he finds something else to distract him from his own existential dread and abandons his streaming dreams for that. He'd definitely get Markiplier to autograph the amulet first, though, that's for sure. Lots of people love Markiplier. He's a congenial guy with a passion for making enjoyable content, but there's one anomaly at the Foundation that wouldn't like him at all. In fact, it would find him, frankly, disgusting. But that's not his fault. SCP-682 hates all living things. That's kind of its whole deal. Well, that and being impossible to kill. The massive rageville reptile is incredibly dangerous to anything and anyone it encounters, and sadly, Markiplier would be no exception. This creature doesn't care about likability or how much a person has contributed to contemporary internet culture. It only cares about destruction, about snapping the poor YouTuber up in its jaws or knocking him into the wall with one swash of its enormous tail. Unless Markiplier happened to have a spare nuclear warhead on him, it's not likely that he would make it out of meeting with SCP-682 in one piece. Oh, no, not his head. Wait, is that the bite of 87? Sorry, I had to do it for the meme. Speaking of 87, however, how would Markiplier fare if he stumbled upon SCP-087, the stairwell? 
It's not the likeliest of events, seeing as the doorway leading to it is constructed of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock and is disguised as the entrance to a janitor's closet in an undisclosed building, but in this world, stranger things have happened. Markiplier has played more than enough horror games to know that finding yourself in a dark staircase that seems to go on forever where you can hear the distant cries of a distressed child isn't something anyone would ever want. He could try and descend the staircase, looking for a way out, but if he did, all that would await him is creeping dread and paranoia, and an encounter with the frightening face of SCP-087-1. His best hope in this scenario would be to take a seat at the top of the stairs and wait for his loyal fanbase to notice he hasn't been online for a while. The internet is a powerful thing, and it's possible they could track him down and rescue him before things got too dire. Otherwise, well, best not to think about that. Over the span of their careers, many online personalities and digital content creators have found themselves in need of a rebrand. Maybe they decide to make a new type of creative work. Maybe they wind up at the center of a scandal. Or maybe they just got bored of doing the same thing over and over again. If Markiplier ever decided to change things up, there are dozens of ways he could go about it. But there's one that he would need to visit the SCP Foundation for. It wouldn't be necessarily advisable, but what if Markiplier decided to engage in some anomalous self-improvement using SCP-914, The Clockworks? Using live test subjects with this machine is always a bit dicey, and he would need to be extremely careful about what setting he used. The very fine setting could produce some really exciting results. Maybe it would improve his eyesight, or give him the ability to work long hours without experiencing creator burnout. Maybe it would give him the ability to fly, or to spontaneously generate a Wi-Fi hotspot no matter where he was, or how little phone signal he had. Yes. Maybe it would make him the greatest gamer in the world. There's really only one reason to find out. Just make sure to hit the right button, or several million people would be very, very sad. Speaking of self-improvement, what would happen if Markiplier got his hands on an anomalous computer program? Not one of the dangerous ones, but an educational one intended to help children learn new skills. SCP-5094, Miss J's WizKid Schoolhouse, would be a perfect fit. He'd have to find a way to play it on his computer, but once he did, Markiplier could livestream his experience with the software. It's uncertain how the anomalous effect of SCP-5094 would translate into a massive audience, but it would be amazing to see if thousands of people could learn a new skill at once. It would be potentially life-changing for everyone involved. Speaking of helpful anomalies, Markiplier would greatly benefit from an introduction to SCP-662, The Butler's Handbell. Running a YouTube channel takes a ton of work, and having an eager supernatural assistant on call 24 hours a day would probably really improve the quality of life for everyone involved. Mr. Deeds would be happy to assist with whatever day-to-day -day tasks might come up, and could even become a beloved background character on the channel. Whether it's bringing Mark a bag of Takis or helping edit video footage, there's very little this helpful British butler can't do. When you get famous and successful, and when you become a public figure online, it seems like everyone out there wants a piece of you. People want money, attention, to ride someone's coattails to fame. But what about an anomaly that quite literally wants a piece of Markiplier? Or any person, really. SCP-082 Ferdinand the Cannibal would love to meet Markiplier and would love to make Markiplier his meat. He would probably use his habit for lying and spinning elaborate stories to attempt to entice Mark into a dangerous situation. Hello, Markiplier, it's me, your friend Jack Set the guy. He would say while very visibly not being who he claims to be. It's time to film a new video challenge. See how long you can stay in the soup pot. Just hop in the pot of boiling water. Don't mind me cutting up carrots and onions into it. As long as Mark keeps his wits about him and doesn't fall for the extremely obvious lies, he would likely escape this confrontation without ending up in a YouTuber's stew. Markiplier is somewhat familiar with the layout of the SCP Foundation containment site, thanks to the gameplay of Containment Breach. But what if, after freeing himself from one anomalous nightmare, he stumbled into another one altogether? What if months after his inexplicable teleportation into the containment site, after life was starting to get back to normal, he was in the market for a brand new gaming chair? And what if he decided to prioritize convenience and Scandinavian furniture engineering in his selection process? And what if, on top of all of that, he had a craving for some Swedish meatballs consumed in a public food court? Why all of those factors might just lead him to Ikea. 
And while there are hundreds of Ikeas around the country, it's not impossible that he might just pick the wrong one and find himself lost inside of SCP-3008. Markiplier is a fairly observant guy, so it likely wouldn't take him long to notice that something is a bit off inside of this particular retail store. There wouldn't be any other shoppers around him, the aisles would go on forever, and the employees inside wouldn't have faces. That last one would probably be the biggest giveaway. Unfortunately, once someone is inside the infinite Ikea, it's pretty unlikely that they will ever leave. He would give it a noble effort to be sure, exploring his surroundings and finding the best places to hide from the Ikea staff when the lights go out. If his phone is fully charged, he might even be the first person to live stream from the depths of this anomalous furniture outlet and spread the word to his fans about the existence of SCP-3008. But sadly, that stream would probably wind up being his last, unless he somehow figured out a way to recreate his YouTube setup inside of his strange new home. If he did though, that would be pretty cool, almost cool enough to make up for the fact that he would never see any of his friends or family ever again. Fortunately for everyone involved, it's highly unlikely that Markiplier will end up interacting with any SCP anomalies without the safe barrier of a computer monitor in between them. But just in case reality ever bends in on itself and worlds begin to collide, hopefully Mark will remember everything he's learned. And to anyone who's ever told you otherwise, see, playing video games can help you in the real world. It might even save your life. Good grief, said Jotaro Kujo as he, his grandfather Joseph Joestar, and the rest of their allied group of stand users hid from the light of day in the shadows of a ruined building. Outside, amorphous semi-humanoid monstrosities roam free in search of life. How could this have happened? Jotaro's family had been on some bizarre adventures, but this one was proving to be the most bizarre of all. The sun, now designated SCP-001, was burning with intense bright red light, and an anomalous level of heat. It beat down on the world below like an evil and sadistic god of the desert. The entire world was at the mercy of these oppressive solar rays, and high temperatures were just the beginning. From the looks of it, any living thing exposed to the rays of SCP-001 would quickly dissolve into a horrible gooey substance that would ooze towards other organisms in an attempt to absorb them into its biomass. Basically, it was like a zombie apocalypse straight out of an easy-bake oven. The Stardust Crusaders had been passing through this city on their globe-trotting adventure, only to find that morning had brought with it a disaster the likes of which had never been seen before. By mid-afternoon, when the sun was highest in the sky, most of the people had already been converted into slime monsters, and those who fled into the shadows found themselves relentlessly hunted down and absorbed. Only the stand users of Jotaro's group, who were already on the lookout for strange happenings, had been clever enough to pick up on the situation immediately. They had been the subject of many unusual supernatural attacks over the course of their journey, so the initial anomalous effects of SCP-001 seemed to be another routine brush with an enemy. Hey Jotaro, this has to be the effect of an enemy stand, right? Joseph said. What? Are you stupid or something, old man? spat Jean-Pierre Pondreff. The Frenchman was ever the impulsive one, and he always found something to complain about when a woman wasn't present. He was selectively polite, one might say. It was fitting given the fact that his stand, Silver Chariot, took the form of a sword-wielding knight, and its reaction speed was the fastest of any of the Stardust Crusaders. You think one stand could do all this? Polnareff was adamant about making his point. Jotaro's fellow high school classmate, Noriaki Kakeoin, was the next to speak. Polnareff, keep your voice down. We can't be sure it's not a stand, but either way, those flesh monsters are looking for us. Kakion was younger than Polnareff, but tended to carry himself with more composure. This likely had something to do with the fact that Hierophant Green was the group's most technical stand and often used for reconnaissance. What do you think, Avidol? Kakion continued. You're the expert here. Muhammad Avdol, a fortune teller who possessed a stand that controls fire, Magician's Red, was often knowledgeable about the supernatural. A stand this powerful would have to be limited in the range it could affect, Avdol said. What we have to do is get further away from this area, then we'll see if this strange sunlight fades. But what if the user is following us? Joseph interjected. How will we know we aren't putting more people at risk? Mr. Joestar, we can't win this battle without more information, Avdol replied. Kakion, your Hyophant Green has the longest range, 
Send it to Scout for a place outside of the stand's reach. Our stand shouldn't be visible to those transformed humans, and the heat from the sunlight won't affect something without mass. Friendly reminder to those of you at home unfamiliar with the properties of stands. Stands are spectral entities formed from the soul of the user, and are essentially superpowered ghosts without physical presence. As such, they won't be affected by SCP-001 the way a living thing would. Now back to this bizarre adventure. Right, Kakyun nodded. Herofin Green! Kakyun summoned his stand and began threading Herofin Green's long, stretchy body throughout the ruins as far as it could go. The young man concentrated, looking through the eyes of his stand. As Kakyun and his stand searched for the end of the anomalous effects of SCP-001, Polnareff continued to complain as usual. So, we're still not sure what's going on, but from what I've heard, you're already calling it a stand? Did I get that right, Avdol? Polnareff grumbled. Do you have any better ideas, Polnareff? Avdol said sternly. Iggy! Barked Iggy, the last member of the Stardust Crusaders. He was a Boston Terrier who commanded a sand-manipulating stand known as the Fool. Iggy didn't really have much to add to the conversation, but he liked to be heard. Listen, said Joseph Joestar, when I was a younger man, I actually did go head-to-head -head with some terrifying beings who might be able to turn people into monsters like these. But every single time, the sun was the enemy of those guys. Nobody is interested in hearing your stories right now, old man, Jotaro chided his grandfather. Meanwhile, far from where the Stardust Crusaders were hiding out, Herofriend Green was reaching the limits of its effective range and seeing no sign of an end to the anomalous effects. Kakian was baffled. Could it be true that the entire world had been affected by the frightening ability of the sun, now that it was SCP-001? If that was true, then the apocalyptic wasteland was more than just the work of an enemy stand user. This would mean that the sun itself had become the enemy of all life. Kakian wondered about his family back in Japan. Would they manage to survive this terrible catastrophe? He couldn't help but hope that there was some way out of this utter devastation even though the information gathered by his stand told him otherwise. Kakion withdrew Hirofin Green and brought his companions up to speed. However hard it was to accept, the world as they knew it was gone with the daybreak. Polnareff was beside himself in sadness, while Avdol and Joseph exchanged a meaningful glance. For once, Iggy's bad attitude subsided, and the dog simply whispered. Only Jotaro remained determined to carry on. Good grief, would you all get a hold of yourselves? Jotaro said. We'll remain human as long as we aren't caught in that light, so I'll use Star Platinum to tunnel our way underground. Jotaro's Star Platinum was a short-range stand, but in terms of raw power, it was off the charts. Its punches could easily tunnel through solid rock and create a subterranean passageway for the Crusaders to retreat to a safer area. That a boy, Jotaro! Joseph exclaimed. We'll make our daring escape mole-style! Jotaro nodded and called Star Platinum, shouting its signature battle cry of Ora Ora! Star Platinum smashed through the earth below, instantly creating the entrance to a tunnel. At that exact moment, every flesh monster in the nearby vicinity turned its attention towards the sound. The stand users had to move quickly, because they would soon be completely surrounded. Oh my god! shouted Joseph in his usual way, as a couple of flesh monsters began to enter the ruined building. Luckily, Polnareff and Avdol sprung into action and summoned Silver Chariot and Magician's Red to fend off the flesh zombies. Silver Chariot delivered an inescapably fast fury of sword strikes to one of the monsters, while Magician's Red burned them away with its supernatural flames. The two men high-fived at a job well done. Just then, the wall next to them burst open, revealing a new monster and caused the sun's rays to enter into the building's interior. With split-second intuition, Avdol pushed Polnareff further into the shadows. The Frenchman tumbled backwards into the hole Jotaro made, and before he could get his bearings, he caught a glimpse of Avdol being absorbed into the monster's mass. Avdol! He cried out, but it was too late. Avdol was already starting to show signs of transformation into an ooze-like zombie himself. The fortune teller breathed in deep and called the name of his stand with determined fervor. Magician's Red! Before Avdol could be fully taken by the slime, he unleashed the totality of his firepower on every zombified life form within range, its destructive heat enhanced by the dryness of the atmosphere. Avdol turned back to his friends and gave them a heartfelt thumbs up before he disappeared into the flames. 
Polnareff cried out for his friend again with tears in his eyes, but Kaokin and Joseph grabbed him and made their way deeper into the tunnel. As badass and heroic as it was, Avdol's sacrifice wouldn't keep those hordes of monsters at bay for long. While Kaiokin and Joseph dragged a crying Polnareff through the underground escape route, Jotaro and Iggy were already at the front of the group, using a combination of Star Platinum's digging ability and Iggy's sand manipulation to stabilize the tunnel. The Stardust Crusaders were deep beneath the surface of the Earth now, so a cave-in could be a real problem. We have to go back! Polnareff shrieked. Avdol needs our help! It's too late, Polnareff, Joseph said with grim conviction. Avdol is gone. We, we, we don't know that for sure, Polnareff carried on. Let me go! But Kakin and Joseph held on to Polnareff tightly and continued to drag him down the passageway, hoping not to lose him to this daytime nightmare as well. On the inside, Jotaro was shaken by the loss of one of his companions, but nobody would have been able to tell by looking at his stoic exterior. He was solely focused on keeping the tunnel expanding so that he and the remaining crusaders could survive this ordeal together. Suddenly a noise from the opposite end of the passageway put the group on high alert. Like a flood of liquefied horror, the flesh monsters had begun pouring themselves into the pit and were now moving towards the group inch by inch. Oh no! Joseph shouted. He loosened his grip on Polnareff, and both of them immediately booked it towards Jotaro and Iggy. Kakin, however, stood in place and braced himself. He didn't like it, but he knew what he had to do. Right now, his stand had the ability to stop these things, but first he had to slow them down. Emerald Splash! Kakion shouted, prompting Harrowfin Green to launch a stream of concussive green gemstones from its hands. As planned, the attack slowed the slime monsters down. Kakion was then able to put the second part of his plan into effect. He identified what appeared to be a face on the monster in front, and sent Hierophon Green to make its way inside the creature's body. This was his stand's most terrifying ability, and one Kakin seldom used. Hierophon Green had the power to control the bodies of other physical entities from within. Once his stand had established control, Kakin forced the massive ooze to stop in place, instantly plugging the tunnel and preventing the rest of the monsters from getting any closer. How long could he keep this up, he didn't know. But because of Hierophant Green's properties as a remote stand, Kaokian was able to run and rejoin Jotaro and the others at the front of the tunnel. The tether between himself and his stand was stretching farther by the minute, but he dared not let his control of the oozing entity slip, lest he and his companions suffer the same fate as Avdol. Before long, Jotaro felt a different sort of surface at the front of the tunnel. Rather than earth, it was brick. With one punch from Star Platinum, he smashed through and into what appeared to be an abandoned subway station. The power was still on, though most of the lights had faded. It was fortunate that there was no natural sunlight in this place. As everyone's eyes adjusted to the light, the stand users crossed the tracks and made their way onto the somewhat safer area. Polnareff drifted over to the magazine kiosk, searching for signs of anyone behind the counter. There was nobody here and Iggy soon helped himself to some of the coffee-flavored chewing gum at the concession stand. The dog couldn't resist his favorite snack, after all. Jotaro stood by the tracks, as if waiting for a train, while Kakin did his best to maintain his hold on the monsters further behind them in the tunnel. With a bit of searching, Joseph found a large portable music player designed for CDs, also known as a boombox. With the use of his divination-focused stand, Hermit Purple, Joseph created purple thorny vines which weaved their way into the wires of the device and generated a psychic message. Hermit Purple could usually be counted on to provide more detail about a situation, but its powers were limited by the device used to gain the information. In this case, the CD within the boombox had a copy of the Beatles' famous 1969 album Abbey Road, so Hermit Purple's message to Joseph came out as a garbled but oddly appropriate rearrangement of the lyrics to here comes the sun. Little darling, I see their faces slowly melting. Little darling, it seems like years since it's been alright. Here comes the sun. Do -do -do -do. Here comes the sun, and I say, I feel I've been slowly melting. Sun, sun, sun. Here it comes. Oh my god, Joseph said to himself quietly. Just then, 
Kakun felt the body that Hirofen Green was controlling give way. Apparently the pressure of so many other ooze monsters had been too much for it to hold back, and now these things were barreling down the tunnel towards the Crusaders. Rather than pulling Hirofen Green back completely, Kakun unleashed his Emerald Splash over and over again in an attempt to force a cave-in, but the creatures were too resilient, and their ooze-like structures meant they could squeeze past mere rocks in their path. Kakin told the rest of the group that it was time to leave, and as if on cue, a train began to pull into the station. Unfortunately, the crazy train pulled into the station with several cars full of ooze zombies ready to grab the poor team and drag them into the sun. There was no way out but up the stairs, back into the sunlight they had done everything possible to escape from. As Polnareff, Jotaro, Joseph, and Iggy did their best to fend off the attacking creatures using their stands, Kakin made one last-ditch attempt to contain the monsters. He stretched Hirofen Green down to its most basic form, a series of long, green, fibrous strings, and created a net to ensnare the creatures. While the Uses could still seep its way through its wiry form, Kakin rigged his stand to set off an emerald splash on every bit of anomalous goo that made it past the net's defenses. It was a sustainable and effective wall against the monsters, using both the tensile strength of the stand and its energy attacks to effectively stymie their progress. There was only one problem. In order to maintain this perfect defense, Kakin would have to stay behind. I'll hold them! Go on without me! Kakin said. Kaki Owen! Joseph shouted as the rest of them ran as fast as they could out of the subway. Having effectively lost two members of the group, the Stardust Crusaders were low in spirits. Looking up through the subway exit, they could see that they would soon be in contact with the sunlight, meaning that even their survival would become unlikely. But Jotaro wasn't about to give in. He grabbed Iggy and held the dog out in front of him. All right, Iggy. It's now or never. Either show us you can be a team player or be the first to turn into one of those blob monsters. Iggy struggled in Jotaro's grip, but to no avail. The dog knew that Jotaro was serious, so in an act of self-preservation that was unusually generous of him, Iggy used the fool to stir up the sand on the ground above into a gigantic shady sand dome. Moments later, he compressed it into a compact fortress of sand, Iggy's moving castle, as it were. No light could enter this fortress, but because of the granular nature of sand, oxygen was flowing freely. The Stardust Crusaders now had a method of travel in this world torn apart by SCP-001. Of course, there was still the matter of dealing with the flesh creatures outside. Even if the Fortress of Sand could move across the surface without sunlight getting in, the surrounding oozes could still impede its progress. With the help of all three of Jotaro, Joseph, and Polnareff's stands, a solution soon became clear. Joseph would use Hermit Purple on the sand to divine the location of any approaching threats, while Jotaro and Polnareff would patrol the outside of the miniaturized fortress with Star Platinum and Silver Chariot, respectively. That way, whenever a flesh creature got too close, the two attack type stands could unleash full force barrages to knock them away. The next thing to do was for Iggy to increase the speed of the sand construct by adding wheels to it. It was like a gigantic sand monster truck zooming through the ruins, with a platinum brawler and a silver knight repelling anything that came too near. Once Iggy gained enough velocity with the Fool, Joseph used Hermit Purple to discern the location of a bit of rubble shaped conveniently like a ramp. The sandcastle vaulted off the ramp and into the air, while Iggy augmented his creation once again with a pair of gigantic gliding wings. Now, they were soaring. Out of the reach of the flesh monsters, Joseph and Polnareff shared sympathies over the loss of their two important friends. Avdal and Kaukin had both bravely given themselves to protect the team, and none of the Crusaders would be here if it wasn't for them. Jotaro focused on helping Iggy pilot the sand glider, using Star Platinum to kick the ground whenever the vehicle got too low. Nobody was sure what they would encounter next in the daybreak, or what bizarre adventures were yet to unfold, but they had each other, and for now, that was enough. Everyone in the sleepy mountain town had heard stories about the abandoned mall and the malevolent creature that lurked in the wreckage there. There had been enough missing persons cases, lost children, teenagers sneaking out to explore and never returning home, 
urban explorers who stumbled out of the darkness disheveled and traumatized with an eyewitness account no one wanted to believe. There wasn't anyone left in the surrounding area willing to set foot in that cursed place. But that didn't stop opportunistic out-of-towners from paying the occasional visit, especially if they felt like there was money to be made in those crumbling corporate walls. Grant and Jason, the hosts of up-and-coming investigative reality show Ghostly Happenings, were two such visitors. When they heard the rumors about an abandoned mall haunted by some sort of dark presence blamed for the disappearance of local children, they packed up their van, picked up their underpaid cameraman Derek, and headed straight for the infamous building. Uh, are you sure we're allowed to be here? Derek asked shakily as he began filming. Nope! Grant answered cheerfully. That's part of the fun, Jason laughed. Look, man, this place has been left to rot by the city. No one cares if we're shooting some footage. Besides, we're less about the cops and more about the ghost of the mall. Grant grinned. Ooh, not funny, Derek grumbled. Come on, serious faces, we're rolling. Jason nudged his co-host, and the two snapped into their on-camera personalities. Once a bustling center of suburban American life, this shopping mall has transformed into a den of terror. Grant's voice dropped into a lower register, his expression intense. Locals swap stories of something inhuman that calls this place home, something that doesn't take kindly to trespassers, Jason added. A ghost? A demon? Just an urban legend? That's what we're here to find out. Grant pulled out an EMF reader, which began beeping as he turned it on. Ah, uh, there seems to be a lot of activity in here already. I'm picking up something. Don't know if you folks at home can see this, but the meter's going crazy, Jason exclaimed. It was a fake meter, of course. One that they rigged up to beep and react when Grant pressed certain hidden buttons. But the audience didn't need to know that. They were tuning in for story, for spectacle, not for the truth. If they wanted that, they could flip over to the Nature Channel and watch some lions chasing a gazelle. On this show, they were chasing pure entertainment. They continued deeper into the building, taking in the massive echoey space, the dusty storefronts, the beams of rotten wood strewn across the ground, the rats that skittered across the floor. It was the perfect creepy atmosphere. Maybe a little too perfect, a little too creepy. What was that? Derek practically jumped out of his skin, spinning around to look at something behind him. Hey, stay on us! Grant snapped. I saw something moving back there, Derek insisted. It was a rat! Jason rolled his eyes. There are tons of them in here! Derek shook his head. No, it wasn't a rat, it was way too big. Okay, a raccoon then, come on, get it together! We've been in way worse locations than this, remember that old tuberculosis hospital? Grant shuddered. <laughs> God, no, that was scary! This is nothing! Well, not nothing. Jason elbowed his partner. I did a good job scouting this place, right? Grant was about to answer when his foot bumped something on the ground. He looked down and saw a Polaroid camera next to a long, empty water bottle and a small backpack. Oh man, get a shot of this! Derek obliged while Jason took a closer look. This must have belonged to one of the urban explorer types who came in here. He unzipped the backpack, rummaging around. Hey, look, photos! Tons of them! He dumped the pictures out onto the ground. Think he got some spirit photography done before he bit the dust? Well, might as well see. Grant joined Jason on the ground, sifting through the photos as Derek watched anxiously. Boring, boring, deer, dog, sunset. Now oh, wait a minute. He stopped, holding up one specific Polaroid. This is the money shot right here. Derek, zoom in on this. All three men looked at the picture, illuminated by the camera's light. It showed a tall, long-limbed, pale creature, vaguely humanoid in shape but at the same time distinctly not quite human. Its mouth was stretched wide in a wordless screech, its eyes bloodshot and wild. Its long, tapered fingers were reaching towards the camera. Damn, that's spooky, Jason laughed, a bit of nervousness creeping into his voice. How do you think he set this up? Grant asked. What if it's real? Derek swallowed the lump in his throat. Don't be an idiot, Grant scoffed. But then, from the outside, not 100 feet away, they heard a scream, ears splittingly loud, filled with rage, pain, and animalistic instinct. It was like nothing any of them had ever heard before. The scream was followed by the sound of splitting wood, branches crashing to the ground, and horrifyingly, the sound of something breaking down a nearby wall. What did you do? Jason backed away from the sound. Me? You opened the backpack? Grant shot back. Guys, I think we need to get out of here. 
Derek watched in wide-eyed terror as two pale hands ripped a hole in the wall in front of them, making an opening for that pale, hairless head from the photograph to poke through. All three men prepared to make a break for it and run for their lives, but as soon as the creature saw them, it was already too late. With another scream, SCP-096 sprinted toward them, grabbing each man and throwing them to the ground. The camera shattered into pieces from the impact, and Derek skidded painfully across the ground. As he rolled onto his side to try and push back up to his feet, he caught a glimpse of the monster opening its mouth impossibly wide and descending on his bosses. He really didn't want to focus on what happened next, but suffice to say, there was nothing of them left afterwards. Derek tried his best to escape, but he was no match for the brute strength and speed of SCP-096. From the moment he saw its face, his fate was sealed. There was no escape. Soon, the beeping EMF meter, the scattered photographs, and the broken pieces of the camera were the only thing left of the crew from ghostly happenings. Their devoted fans would never get another episode, but at least one being in the abandoned mall could rest easy now. SCP-096 was safe again. No one was living who had seen its face. It slowly crawled back to the hole it had made in the wall, ready to return to the forest and climb back up the mountain. There, it could curl up beneath a tree and stay there for as long as it wanted. But as SCP-096 reached the hole in the wall, where it had once been able to see night sky, stars, and the trees in the distance, there was only blackness. It was as if something dark was stretching over the opening, blocking the outside world from view. 096 reached out a hand to push the blockage out of the way, but whatever it was, slithered away from the touch faster than the pale hand could move. The wriggling darkness crept back into the building, weaving in and out of the shadows as SCP-096 watched it curiously. Whatever it was, it hadn't looked at the creature's face yet. It wasn't sure if this thing even had eyes. But then, stretching out of the darkness and into view, was a garish face with wide, white eyes with massive pupils, a round nose, and a wide, wide mouth stretched into a toothy grimace that might have once looked like a smile. This was the creature that had made the Maul its home, the apex predator of this biosphere, and it was staring directly at SCP-096's face. Its face. With a shriek, 096 flew into a primal rage, clawing at the cat-like creature, but before 096 could reach it, the thing was gone. Where was it? Where did it go? 096 roared, tearing at the floor, ripping up the tile and gouging long, deep scratches in the concrete beneath. A sound in the distance drew 096's attention, and it bolted in the direction of the noise, swinging at any obstacle in its path as it went. It ripped down a banner advertising free frozen yogurt samples, crushed an empty cell phone kiosk, and threw a gumball machine to the floor with a crash. It would rip the entire mall apart if it had to, if that was what it took to destroy the being that had caught a glimpse of its face and disappeared. Then, 096 could see it. That face. That wide-eyed, grinning face. It sprinted toward the face as fast as it could. The cartoon cat was looking at 096, not from a place in the room, but from behind the screen of a television in the electronics store window. Somehow defying the laws of physics and reality, it had made its way into the TV. 096 didn't pause to ponder the logic of this. There was no room for critical thought. There was only the need to shred, to consume, to destroy. It burst through the window, sending shards of glass in every direction, and reared back to attack the screen. It was so focused on its singular task that it didn't notice the long black arms snaking across the floor, winding around its feet. All of a sudden, 096 lost its balance as its legs were pulled right out from under it, those stretchy arms dragging it into the TV screen itself. When 096 regained consciousness, it was in a place it did not recognize. Gone was the inside of the mall or the familiar forest and mountains outside. Instead, SCP-096 was in some sort of hand-drawn world, a massive house with a hallway that seemed to go on forever, lined with infinite doors leading to who knew where. The floor tipped and tilted at odd angles, and the geometry made no three-dimensional sense. It was dizzying and deeply off-putting. 
SCP-096 had no frame of reference to compare it to, but a human witness might have noticed that this place looked like something out of an old cartoon, from the days of Steamboat Willie and the like. SCP-096 did not think such a thing. It only knew that it was in an unfamiliar place, one that felt threatening, though there were no visible threats, and it knew that it still hadn't gotten its hands on the creature that had seen its face. All along the walls between each door, there were clocks in the shape of that horrible cat, eyes ticking back and forth with each second, wide smile mocking SCP-096 as if to say, Try and find me. SCP-096 would not be discouraged. There was no room in its mind for that sort of thing. There was only the singular goal of finding the cartoon cat and tearing it limb from rubber hose limb. Psychological warfare would have no effect. Still, Cartoon Cat would give it his best shot. This was his world, and he could do whatever he wanted here. Cartoon Cat poked his head out through a random doorway, waving to 096 with one of his puffy white gloved hands. As 096 wailed and began to give chase, Cartoon Cat slammed the door shut, only to open another door down the hall and poke his head out of that one. He did the same trick over and over, jerking SCP-096 around from end to end of the ever-expanding animated hallway. After some time passed, however, it appeared SCP-096 was not going to get tired, and was not going to give up hope of catching its prey. It was time to end this. Cartoon Cat wrapped one long arm around SCP-096's neck, restraining it against the wall, and began to squeeze tighter and tighter. But nothing happened. SCP-096 did not collapse, did not react at all except to tear at the arm around its neck until it broke free. Then it returned to the relentless pursuit, tearing door frames apart, pulling up floorboards, punching through walls. Every time it dealt damage to the environment, the space filled itself back in, an unseen pen scribbling in the gaps in the floorboards, sealing up the holes in the walls. Two powerful beings going back and forth, locked in a seemingly equal-matched battle. Cartoon Cat tried to destroy SCP-096 in a myriad of ways. He tried to rip the beast apart, to snap its neck, to do any manner of unspeakable violent acts it had done before with great sadistic glee, but this pale abomination would not fold, would not break. This wasn't going to be any fun if there was no ending, and if 096 kept destroying one of Cartoon Cat's favorite pocket worlds, that was quite enough. Cartoon Cat grabbed hold of 096's arms and legs, the creature thrashing viciously as he did so, and threw it into the blank space just beyond the illustrated world. Back in the mall, SCP-096 crashed back to Earth. It was about to resume its search for Cartoon Cat when suddenly a bright light illuminated its face. A police officer stood a few feet away holding a flashlight. Excuse me, you can't be in here, you're trespassing. The officer started to warn, but his words were interrupted when 096 began to scream. Soon, he would be screaming too. The aftershock shuddered through the foundation. Emergency alarms wailed as injured staff and security helped each other out from underneath rubble that had fallen on them as the building was shaken by the quake. It had only lasted a few short seconds, but still managed to leave a trail of destruction in its wake. While the wounded were bandaged up, anyone and everyone who was still able to started frantically checking the containment of every anomaly on the site. The Foundation could worry about the origin of the quake later. First and foremost, they needed to assess the damage. Luckily, multiple rapid sweeps of the facility revealed that there weren't all that many high-level threat anomalies whose containment had been breached. A few of the safer ones were found cowering under tables or buried under fallen rubble in their quarters. But for the most part, every anomaly was accounted for, and none had been provided with an opportunity to escape and cause further havoc. At least, that's how things seemed at first. It was only when the chaos started to die down and repair efforts were underway that personnel noticed an odd change. Something was missing, but nobody could quite put their finger on exactly what. As a matter of fact, most could pinpoint exactly when they noticed this odd feeling. It had only begun after the emergency alarms had been shut off. There was a sound that everyone working at the Foundation had gotten so used to that they practically stopped hearing it, or at least, they'd stopped noticing it. 
It was only now that the noise was gone, its absence no longer drowned out by blaring alarms, that staff realized it had always been there. Everyone had just learned to subconsciously tune it out, crying. The low, soft whimpering that could be heard emanating from SCP-096's containment chamber. It had stopped. The cell within had fallen silent, and once someone at the Foundation made the right connection and investigated, they happened upon a startling discovery. SCP-096 had vanished. Panic immediately engulfed the facility yet again. The Shy Guy could be anywhere, and a search effort to find it would only end in deaths. After all, in order to find something, you have to look at it, and that was a fatal thing to do when SCP-096 was involved. Closer examination showed no trace of the missing creature. There had been no reported incidents of incursions with it anywhere in the world. Every known photograph, video recording, or other visual depiction of SCP-096 was either securely stashed away or destroyed completely by the Foundation. There was no way it could have possibly escaped, and it was seemingly nowhere at all. But still, the question remained, where in the world had the Shy Guy gone to? if it was still even in this world. From SCP-096's perspective, one moment all had been normal. The next, it was lost somewhere strange, unfamiliar, and above all unsettling, even to the Shy Guy. Before the sudden quake had hit, it had spent the day the same way it usually occupied its time, alternating between aimlessly pacing the far wall of its containment chamber and sitting in a fetal position in the corner, sobbing all the while. But then the room had started shaking, and in the blink of a deeply sunken eye, the Shy Guy found itself, well, it had no idea where. Around it was a large carpeted room, open and sparse, with little occupying all the space. The wallpaper was a nauseating, sickly shade of yellow, made all the more garish by the rows of fluorescent lighting from the ceiling above. The entire place seemed to resemble an office space, although seemingly one that was in a total state of disuse. There was no furniture, not even one solitary inanimate object to make the place seem at least the tiniest bit closer to normal. Little was SCP-096 aware, it had somehow been transported to a strange and terrible place. The Back Rooms Unless someone remains wary and ever vigilant, they can unknowingly slip their way out of reality. It can happen anywhere. All that a person needs to do is be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they will noclip into the back rooms. All around SCP-096 was the stench of old, wet carpet, and a labyrinth of uninhabited rooms with the same drab yellow walls, the endless buzz of the fluorescent lights stretching out for who knows how many square miles of empty rooms. In short, the Shy Guy was trapped in a purgatory-like nightmare. However, there was at least one small mercy for SCP-096 as it wandered around its new surroundings. There was nobody else around, no other signs of life, no SCP Foundation, no ordinary human beings, no one who could see it. Here in the solitary confinement of the back rooms, SCP-096 could not be perceived, and yet this brought the self-conscious creature very little in the way of comfort. Despite being completely alone, there was an awful, lingering feeling that hung in the air like the smell of the old carpet underfoot. SCP-096 still felt like it was being watched, and yet if someone or something really was watching, it wasn't triggering the Shy Guy's usual rage state. As it lurked through the various rooms and corridors, the creature kept expecting to find someone to look them in the eye directly and get the same inescapable urge to race towards its observer and kill them. But it never came, because there was nobody else around, at least for a little while. Adam Jenkins had been out riding his bike when it happened. Pushing one pedal around, then the other, he gradually climbed higher up the slope of a hill. His house was down at the bottom of the other side, and Adam knew once he reached the peak, he could slip nice and easily down the rest of the way. As long as he was careful not to let the extra momentum carry his bike too far and too fast, he just had to keep in control and gently compress the brake if he needed to. He made the same journey every day. Nothing could go wrong. Sure enough, Adam reached the top of the hill and allowed the bike to slowly tip ever so slightly over the other side. Gravity started to do the rest, 
the wheels starting to spin rapidly, the pedals pistoning his legs as he plummeted downwards. It was one of the few childlike joys left in Adam's life, those few brief seconds of the day where he got to speed down the hill back home with reckless abandon. He was blissfully unaware that he wouldn't have enough time to miss how much he enjoyed it. Without warning, a car came speeding out from around a corner on the way down the hill. It was dark, and the driver had carelessly decided to leave their headlights off. So when Adam saw the vehicle, he only had a split second to react. He was still going too fast. So if he applied the brakes now, his front wheel would stop too suddenly and send him flying forward over the handlebars. Instead, seconds before colliding with the car's hood, Adam wrenched his bike's handlebars and swerved around the car. But the added speed of going downhill caused the entire bike to topple as it turned so violently, launching Adam off and sending him hurtling towards a nearby wall. Adam could tell in the split second after coming off his bike that he was about to collide with the wall. His brain and body anticipated the impact, bracing him for the painful crash, but it never came. Instead of hitting the wall, Adam passed through it. That may well have spared him a devastating injury, but now a whole new problem now faced him. Just like no clipping through a virtual environment in a video game, Adam had passed directly out of reality, right into the back rooms. The first few hours were the worst, shouting as loud as he could for someone, anyone, to come and find him. Each yell rapidly growing more and more frantic as Adam rushed around his haunting new surroundings. The whole place was unsettling just to be in. It gave off a hostile, unwelcoming energy that was impossible to ignore. It was only after an hour of trying to find a way out that Adam realized he was well and truly lost. He'd strayed too far away from his original point of entry, and just as he had the idea of trying to make his way back to the world from the same place he came in, it was already too late. The back rooms, at least on this first level, all looked the same. No two rooms were distinct enough for him to figure out if this was somewhere he'd been before, or an entirely new area. It didn't take long for an overwhelming sense of hopelessness to set in. Adam had quickly given up calling for help. There was no sign of anyone around that would be able to help him, until the shuffling of footsteps came from nearby. It was such a noticeable break in the dull, unsettling quiet of the back rooms that it made Adam's ears prick up. The yellow-hued maze had been so void of life since he had arrived, so unnaturally empty, that he wasn't entirely sure he had made the sound himself by his jacket brushing up against the wall. But no, there was definitely something here with him. He could hear it wandering nearby, and it had certainly heard him too. Calling out yet again with more caution in his tone, Adam Jenkins turned the next corner, met with yet another dingy yellow corridor, although unlike the others, this one had a key difference. SCP-096 stood right in the middle of it. The split second that Adam's eyes fell over the shy guy, it was already too late. He barely had time to process the sight of the creature, its tall, humanoid shape, wiry thin and pale skin, jaw hanging unnaturally wide. In fact, SCP-096 dashed towards Adam so quickly that he couldn't even finish his startled scream. Meanwhile, back at the SCP Foundation, efforts were still underway to retrieve the Shy Guy. Researchers were baffled that there was not a single trace anywhere on the globe of SCP-096's presence. They had quickly rolled out their usual method for recalling the creature to containment. Requisitioning one of D-Class personnel, this individual was instructed to stand in SCP-096's cell and then was given a photograph of the monster to look at. Knowing that the Shy Guy would track down anyone that saw its face, even as a single tiny pixel in a picture, the Foundation expected the creature to simply reappear in its containment chamber to kill the D-Class they had used as bait. But nothing happened. The D-Class was able to look at the photo of SCP-096 and survive. It was almost as if the creature's link to reality was weakened, wherever it was. It might still be aware someone had looked at it, but the Shy Guy was somehow being blocked from traveling to its most recent observer. Having drawn a blank on trying to determine SCP-096's whereabouts, the Foundation eventually turned to SCP-343 for his input. Naturally, the powerful reality vendor was reluctant as ever to get involved. The Foundation insisted, knowing that SCP-343's omniscience meant he would already be aware of where they could find the missing Shy Guy. He refused multiple times, admitting he did have the answer they were looking for, but not wishing to divulge that information. 
Fine. SCP-343 sighed, coming to a compromise. I can't tell you exactly where 096 is, but when I tell you where to look for answers, you'll know. Async. The researchers were stunned into silence. Nobody in the Foundation had heard that name used in a long time. But SCP-343 was right. They knew exactly what it meant. Back in the 1980s, Async was another shadowy organization that had been investigating the existence of a liminal space connected to reality, a place they had called the Backrooms. Gathering up a mobile task force, the SCP Foundation dispatched its agents to a site that had long since been abandoned. It kept a watchful eye over the disused lab, keeping the public away, making sure nobody stumbled in by accident and got trapped. As the MTF commander gave the word, the outdated 80s technology was fired up, and Async's great achievement was reactivated. They had constructed a portal into the back rooms, moving information the MTF operatives filed into the empty yellow space, unsure if they'd find SCP-096 alive, or if it would even want to come back. Meanwhile, in the back rooms level zero, only the Shy Guy remained having completely annihilated poor, unfortunate Adam. He was enjoying the solitude once again, knowing that now nobody was here to see him, until one wrong step changed everything. He no-clipped from level zero to level one, where he would have a lot more company. Man, it's even better on the 15th read. Oh, hello, I didn't see you there, dear viewers of SCP Explained. I'm on break between supervising SCP-682 termination attempts and inspecting the mops we use on SCP-173's leavings, so I decided to do what all the cool people are doing in their spare time right now. Rereading Chainsaw Man, the hit manga by Japanese author and artist Tatsuki Fujimoto. For the uninitiated, it's the story of Denji, a poor young man from Japan who makes his living hunting devils, dangerous creatures that are embodiments of mankind's greatest fears. But when that living leads to him dying at the hands of a gang of zombie Yakuza, believe me, it makes sense in context, he bonds with the legendary Chainsaw Devil and is reborn as Chainsaw Man, an unconventional superhero who chainsaws first and asks questions later. Naturally, I was eager to see how one of our own bloodthirsty killers would fare against Denji's Chainsaws of Fury, so I selected the most violent, battle-hardened, and carnage-hungry anomaly out there. SCP-076-2, the immortal warrior known as Abel. The two of them have a surprising amount of things in common. Both are effectively immortal and can revive after sustaining massive physical injuries. Both absolutely love to fight with their array of deadly weapons and anomalous strength. Both have been part of experimental operations groups, with Denji being a member of Japan's Public Safety Devil Hunters Division 4, and Abel being an ex-member of the SCP Foundation's disastrous Pandora's Box Mobile Task Force, most of which he later massacred out of boredom. You can probably see why these two really did feel like the perfect matchup. So after forcing the trusty Anomatron 6000 to read every currently available volume of Chainsaw Man, and compute years of Abel's gruesome battle data, I've set up the perfect simulation for your viewing pleasure. And hey, fellow fans of the manga, isn't it horrifying that even we beat MAPPA to the punch of animating this thing? <laughs> ah, god, that joke will age poorly if that anime comes out before this. Anyway, let's crank this machine into action and let her rip. Japan, 1997. Everything is roasting in the July heat. Men in Black. Harrison Ford's Air Force One and Airbud are hitting theaters for the first time. Everything is right with the world. That's why over in the headquarters of the Public Safety Devil Hunting Department, Denji, our chainsaw-loving hero, is being praised by his kind boss and mentor figure, Makima, a lovable, supportive woman who will never do anything wrong. She even loves dogs. How could a person who loves dogs ever be evil? That very morning, Denji and his Chainsaw Man form managed to defeat the accidentally making a mistake on your tax forms and now you're going to prison devil, who had been terrorizing downtown Tokyo. It was a challenging battle, but in the end, he'd managed to turn the tables and defeat the creature by setting it on fire. Needless to say, Makima was extremely pleased with Denji's work here, but now she had considerably more graver news to impart. She'd gotten word from an envoy of another organization that hunts down dangerous and anomalous creatures, 
the SCP Foundation, that an extremely lethal entity had breached their containment and was now somewhere in Japan. The entity in question was not a devil and thereby would be working on a different rule set. Makima opened a file faxed to her by the Foundation. Yes, remember, this is set in 1997 and gave Denji the crucial lowdown. Several hours ago, the entity known as Abel had resurrected from his huge black sarcophagus in the underwater chamber of the classified facility Containment Area 25B. After waking up, Abel had slaughtered his way through the entire base, killing every SCP Foundation operative in his path and then swimming out into the Pacific Ocean. Sometime after that, he infiltrated a Japanese cargo ship and murdered all the workers on board before steering the ship back towards the land of the rising sun, where he hoped to claim even more victims. Makima told Denji that it would fall to him and his associates to stop this Abel, with a little help from the SCP Foundation's intelligence. But be warned, Abel is an incredible combatant with extreme physical strength and durability, as well as surprising tactical intelligence. It wouldn't be an easy fight, but Makima promised that if Denji won, she'd hug him and go to a nearby karaoke bar with him. Denji replied, Consider him dead already, Miss Makima. Meanwhile, Abel was walking through the slums of Tokyo, marveling at the neon signs for bars and clubs. His journey to Japan hadn't been an accident. Abel had been to Japan once before, in the year 1605. He'd faced the legendary Japanese philosopher and swordsman Miyato Musashi, considered by many to be one of the greatest warriors in human history. Abel had dueled Musashi, who famously wielded two katanas at once, in the hills of the Harima province where, after a tense battle, Musashi cut him down. Abel would not resurrect again during Musashi's lifetime, but the battle gave him a deep and abiding respect for the legendary warrior. Abel knew that if the opportunity ever rose again, he would return to Japan in hopes of experiencing such a brilliant battle yet again. But the industrial and technological boom had changed so much. It was no longer the quiet and pastoral Japan he'd experienced, but a booming epicenter of trade and commerce. He found it all strange and perplexing. Suddenly, he found himself surrounded by a group of Japanese street thugs, many of them wielding switchblades. They laughed at his strange outfit, which to them looked like an old, worn bedsheet. One of the smarter members of the group had already decided to go home when the others made up their mind to mug Abel. The warrior's extensive tattoos made him look like a Middle Eastern Yakuza Don. The rest, however, were happy to take their chances with him. Empty your pockets if that goofy toga even has pockets, the leader said, holding up his switchblade. Unless you want to get cut. Abel just smirked and drew a pair of long obsidian daggers. In the following moment, the alley was filled with screams, then was silent yet again. Abel walked on, breathing a sigh of disappointment at how incredibly mediocre this first fight had been, his blades dripping with fresh blood. Musashi is rolling in his grave, Abel thought to himself. Meanwhile, across town, Denji and the rest of Division 4 were mobilizing. It was him, the serious sword-wielding Aki, and the adorable, pathologically lying, blood-fiend Power. They'd been told over the phone by a man named Dr. Bright that Abel would be relatively easy to track down. He's not known for his subtlety. All you need to do is follow the trail of carnage he causes wherever he goes. From the way he talks about him, it seems almost as though Dr. Bright bears a personal grudge against Abel. How strange. Power didn't seem intimidated. She proudly proclaimed, I don't think this battle will be difficult at all. In fact, I've faced this Abel before and defeated him handily. Aki sighed and asked, When did this happen? Last Tuesday, of course. She replied, Power had only heard about Abel this morning. But Denji and Aki had learned better than to dispute her at this point. Suddenly, a large television screen that had been previously relaying an ad for a cutting-edge stereo system cut to an emergency news report. There had been a horrific incident in downtown Tokyo, where a bar had been attacked and most of its patrons murdered by a deranged, tattooed man carrying a pair of huge swords. Aki immediately recognized this place. The bar was Yakuza-owned. If this Abel was on the hunt for worthy opponents, it makes all the sense in the world that Japan's iconic crime syndicates would be his first target. Denji, Aki, and Power knew exactly where they needed to go. 
Over at the bar, Abel was having a whale of a time. Innocent patrons were running and screaming, while the Yakuza engaged in an all-out war with the terrifying inhuman warrior. Several of them had already been cut down. Two Yakuza soldiers behind the bar were reloading illegal Uzis and preparing to return fire. Both were sweating, terrified by the sudden, random attack. When they'd shot him before, he'd managed to dodge most of the bullets and expertly blocked the rest with his swords. Who the hell had sent this monster? Was he with the Triads, the Russian mob, or some devil summoned by the Japanese government to crack down on them? Whatever the case, he seemed almost impossible to kill. The two men stood back up and opened fire. Abel held his two swords and spun like a propeller, blocking all the bullets almost effortlessly. He then produced another dagger, seemingly from thin air, and threw it directly into the heart of one of the two remaining Yakuza behind the bar. He dropped to the ground dead instantly, leaving only his friend alive in a bar full of corpses. That's when Abel noticed a decorative katana behind the bar. He smiled and ordered the surviving Yakuza soldier to pick up the sword and give him a real fight. The hapless mobster realized in that moment that this guy was truly crazy whoever he was. But what choice did he have now? With terror in his heart, the last surviving Yakuza grabbed the katana and unsheathed it. Good, Abel said, his voice deep and menacing. Now, come fight me. Let's see if you last a few seconds longer than your worthless friends, shall we? He did not. The second the Yakuza ran towards Abel and the ancient swordsman swiped at him with one of his blades, cutting through the katana and the opponent holding it. A puny gangster never stood a chance against a deadly immortal warrior, and Abel was furious. The last time he was here, he faced a truly expert killer, who even managed to end Abel's life in a single combat. And now he was slaying insects in a karaoke bar. Pathetic. Suddenly, his ears pricked up. He turned to see a red axe flying at his head at incredible speeds. With his superhuman reflexes, he managed to dodge just in time, but the axe still cleaved off a chunk of his hair as it passed. Abel could see the one who threw it standing at the entrance to the bar. It was the blood fiend, Power, who'd made the axe out of her own blood. Standing next to her were Denji and Aki, Denji wielding an axe and Aki stoically observing. Damn, Miss Makima promised we'd do karaoke at this bar if I beat you. Denji said, you're going down for this. Abel smiled and pulled out another pair of blades. Finally, he roared, warriors who fight the old-fashioned way. I feared the years had stolen you all from me. Power stepped forward, producing another blood axe from nowhere. She yelled, Tremble in fear, Abel. Tis I, your arch nemesis, the mighty power. Abel had literally never seen her before in his thousands of years of life, but he appreciated that these warriors were at least able to match his level of drama. As far as he was concerned, the fight was on, but even Abel didn't know the level of fighting he was getting in for here. As he charged forward, the trio split, immediately surrounding him. Good tactics, Abel thought to himself. Already, this was promising. Aki, who had remained quiet up to this point, attacked first. He drew a Titano knife from his suit jacket and slashed at Abel with impressive speed. But unlike three of the other combatants in this situation, Aki was only human, which gave him a serious disadvantage. Abel decided it would be best to put him out of commission first. With a quick and brutal kick to the chest, Aki was thrown against the wall with the majority of his ribs broken. Revved up by his own bloodlust, Abel turned to Denji in power and grinned like a maniac. This was already the most fun he'd had in a long time. Who are these people? Doesn't matter, he thought. They'll be dead soon anyway. While Abel was still locked in thought, Power pulled out a comically large hammer made out of her own blood and brought it down towards Abel. He was surprised by the sudden attack. Did this girl have the same weapon producing powers as him? This just keeps getting more interesting. Tis the end, Abel! Power screamed as the hammer came down. You have once again been defeated by the mighty Power! Again, just to clarify, these two had never met each other. But it was already too late. Abel punched upwards, his clenched fist colliding with the hammer. He hit it with such terrifying force that Power's blood hammer shattered against his knuckles. In that same instant, Abel noticed Denji running at him with an axe from behind. Abel produced another obsidian dagger and threw it into Denji's forehead, dropping him to the ground immediately. Pathetic. 
Power tried to produce another weapon, but she used up too much blood already. Before she had a chance to make anything substantial, Abel sprung forwards with terrifying speed trying to land a killing blow. But even weakened, Power was freakishly fast. She was able to dodge his blow and kick him in the ribs, momentarily stunning him. Of course, she took the time to gloat, putting her hands on her hips and laughing victoriously. Need a second to catch your breath, Abel. It is to be expected. None can keep up with me, she grandiosely announced. Perhaps you should just give up and agree to become my servant. I might even teach you a thing or two about fighting. Suddenly, Abel was standing right in front of her, squeezing her throat with his iron grip. He smiled, flashing teeth, and said, If you want to kill, kill. Don't talk. With a surprisingly minimal amount of strength, he squeezed and heard a crunch from Power's neck. He dropped her limp body to the ground. Lucky for Power, Abel wasn't aware that a fiend like Power can survive an injury like this as long as she's fed some more blood. Instead, he just sighed in disappointment. Is that all you weaklings have to offer? He bellowed. Aki, barely conscious after being kicked against the wall, remained just conscious enough to activate his contract with a powerful beast known as the Fox Devil. He twists his hands into a strange gesture and whispers the word, Come, before falling unconscious. But that's still enough. Suddenly, a gigantic demonic fox claw bursts through the wall of the bar, spraying dust and rubble everywhere. Abel was definitely not expecting that. He dodged several times as the claw swiped for him, often barely missing him. For its last strike, it lunged forward and raked four claw marks across his chest. Abel was shocked by the sudden pain. It felt fantastic. He pulled a long obsidian spear out of one of his pocket dimensions and forced it down through the fox devil's paw and into the ground, pinning it in place. After a moment of thrashing, the claw dissipated into smoke, lending Abel another victory, though even he would admit this was a more exciting fight than the other ones had been. Was that it? Had he gained total victory once more just like he so often did these days? He was about to take pity on himself when Denji rose up behind him. How about a rematch? Denji asked. Abel grinned. He liked this kid. Challenge me, child, Abel said. Well, since you asked, Denji smirked. Denji reached into his shirt and grabbed the ripcord emerging from his chest. It was time to go into overdrive on this thing. He gave it a mighty yank, and like the rev of a chainsaw, the madness began. Denji transformed, giant blades emerging from his arms, and his head transformed into a toothy saw blade nightmare. He gave a mechanical roar that spewed smoke. This wasn't just Denji anymore. This was Chainsaw Man. Now this, Abel thought, feeling his adrenaline spike, is more like it. Following Denji's lead, Abel reached into one of his pocket dimensions and pulled out one of his favorite weapons, one he'd only previously used against the mighty hard-to-destroy reptile SCP-682, the Chainsaw Claymore. A huge two-handed sword with the eternally twisting, shredding teeth of a chainsaw ever circulating around it. It was time for Chainsaw vs. Chainsaw. What the hell are you waiting for? Chainsaw Man roared. Are we gonna stand around all day or are we gonna fight? Abel couldn't have said it better himself. The two charged at one another at lightning speeds, chainsaw clashing against chain sword. The sheer force of the contact was enough to send a shockwave blasting through the bar. It rapidly became a power struggle, each of them trying hard to force their chainsaws out of the stalemate. Realizing that this time he perhaps couldn't win with raw strength, Abel back flipped away to reassess his options. But Chainsaw Man had no intention of giving Abel time to think about it. He darted towards Abel with the weight and momentum of a runaway freight train. If Abel hadn't raised his claymore to parry, he would have been shredded to pieces by the devil's saws in an instant. Instead, the two of them rocketed out of the nearby wall in a cascade of debris, causing everyone on the outside street to run for their lives. The two quickly stood from the stumble. The two quickly stood up, catching their breath. Impressive, Abel said. You're much better than the others. Instead of replying, Denji briefly retracted his arm chainsaws and grabbed a nearby parked car, throwing it directly at Abel. Abel reacted quickly, cleaving the car in half with his claymore and charging for Chainsaw Man again. Just before Abel could land a lethal strike, Chainsaw Man deployed his chainsaws again, blocking the blow. Abel sped around him trying to strike again and again, but Chainsaw Man blocked every strike with stunning efficacy. Abel was astonished. 
Few had ever been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him like this before. He could feel his heart pounding gloriously in his chest. He would give Denji a warrior's death. With a furious yell, Abel brought down the Chainsaw Claymore for a devastating vertical strike, but Chainsaw Man was ready. He arranged his arm chainsaws in a cross formation like a giant pair of scissors and caught Abel's chain sword between them. Chainsaw Man pulled his arms in opposite directions, slicing Abel's mighty sword in half. The immortal swordsman skidded backwards to avoid the fallout, producing two smaller blades immediately. This Chainsaw Man just kept exceeding expectations, didn't he? Abel would need to change tactics if he wanted to win this one. Chainsaw Man was impressed by the speed and tenacity of his foe. For someone who apparently wasn't even a devil, Abel sure packed a hell of a punch. Did he ever run out of those damned weapons? As though attempting to answer Chainsaw Man's question for him, Abel began running around his flank, rapidly producing and throwing blades and axes in a startling volley. Chainsaw Man was able to use his chainsaw arms and face to block most of them, but not all of them. Several daggers and small throwing axes splattered into the tender flesh of Chainsaw Man's chest. Abel had successfully wounded him, and he wasn't done. Feeling a little more confident now, Abel decided to take a different tactic. He produced a large spiked mace from thin air and ran at Chainsaw Man while the devil was still recovering from his projectile attack. With one brutal whack, he sent Denji flying down the street, carving a rut into the concrete beneath him. But Abel wasn't done. While Chainsaw Man was still trying to recover, Abel leaped onto him and began beating him into the ground with his mace. The strikes were so brutal, they shook the earth and sent cracks across the surrounding ground. Then, Abel stopped. He realized, for a moment, that he was letting his bloodlust get the better of him. This was dishonorable. Where would be the fun in beating this boy to death while he lay on the ground and depriving himself of one of the greatest opponents he's had in quite some time? No, that would not do at all. He'd give him one more chance. On your feet, boy, Abel said. You fight well. Get up and carry on. I won't let a beast as rare as you die like a common dog. Rise and fight me. And Chainsaw Man did as he was told. Abel was shocked to see the very ground shatter underneath him as Chainsaw Man burst up through it, all his swords at the ready. The mace was thrown from Abel's hands as Chainsaw Man launched up towards him, all metal teeth and fury. Luckily for Abel, he pulled out a battle axe just in time to block the flurry of brutal strikes from the patron saint of chainsaws. Now this was a fight even Musashi would be proud of. Yes, boy, yes, Abel yelled. This is true combat. Chainsaw Man replied with the swing of his blades, which Abel was nearly able to dodge. The two finally landed back down on the ground, and Abel was fast enough to bury his battle axe in Chainsaw Man's shoulder. Before the devil could return a blow to Abel, the anomalous swordsman pulled out a pair of his favorite swords and locked Chainsaw Man's arms in place. Chainsaw Man was undeniably incredibly powerful, but it looked like Abel's superior experience and tactics might save him this time. What the hell are you? Chainsaw Man roared. You've been a worthy opponent, boy. Those are few and far between, Abel said. I'll remember you for this. But before Abel could execute a killing blow, he felt a blood-red throwing axe stick into his back. Abel winced in pain to see Power and Aki about 30 feet behind him. Power was propping Aki up. He donated some of his blood to bring her back to life, and she was just as delusionally cocky as ever. Abel was about to say something, but he already made a fatal mistake, letting his guard down. Before another word could pass the cursed warrior's lips, one of Chainsaw Man's armed chainsaws passed directly through his heart, tearing it apart with Abel's chest. It was a sudden and decisive killing blow. Chainsaw Man pulled his saw back out of Abel's chest, stained with the deadly anomaly's blood. Abel collapsed to the ground, wheezing and bleeding profusely from the hole in his chest. But strangely, as Power, Aki, and Chainsaw Man converged around him, they realized he was smiling. Thank you, Abel said, and died yet again. With the battle won, like an incredible hulk made of metal, Chainsaw Man transformed back into Denji. The trio stood around Abel's corpse, deeply confused as to what had just happened. If this was the kind of thing the SCP Foundation normally dealt with, they all silently agreed that perhaps it would be better not to get involved with them in the future. Except Power, of course, who said, You two should be thanking me for defeating him. You both owe me drinks for this. 
Hundreds of miles away in a black sarcophagus deep underwater, surrounded by professional SCP Foundation divers, Abel's body once again returned. Who knows how long he'd remain sleeping in there. But what we do know is that his deathless sleep was suffused with the sweet dreams, knowing that this world still held worthy opponents, and for Abel, that was everything. Reality Warpers Real pieces of work, aren't they? It's one thing when an anomaly is all claws and fangs like SCP-682, or if their attack of choice is snapping necks like SCP-173. But it is an entirely different story if an anomaly can turn the air you breathe into chocolate pudding or shove you into a pocket dimension that looks almost like our own reality, except everyone is just a walking, talking pile of spiders. See what I mean? Reality warpers. Real handfuls. Though, of course, not all reality warpers are created equal. Some are relatively weak, only affecting the world around them in a mild, ambient fashion. Others can rattle whole dimensions with their tremendous power. The same also goes for morality. Some reality warpers are loving and benevolent, such as SCP-343, the kindly, old, all-powerful being known to some as God. And some are pure evil beings who want nothing more than to use their immense power to sow chaos and misery among everyone else. And personally, we can't think of a better example of the latter than Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls. This demonic Dorito wants nothing more than to take over our dimension and rebuild it in his image of absolute insanity. So naturally, we started wondering, if these two reality warping titans, SCP-343 and Bill Cipher, ever came to blows, who would win? We were so curious, in fact, that we fired up the Anomatron 6000, our state-of-the-art simulation supercomputer to see how exactly the two might meet and how their epic battle would play out. Who do you think would take the coveted W on this one? Let us know down in the comments, along with any other out-of-universe what-if situations you'd love to see. But in the meantime, let's fire up the machine. Be warned, folks, it's gonna get weird. The date was July 12th, 2013. For SCP-343, it had started out as a relatively normal day. He'd spent the night playing solitaire on the astral plane before warping back into his humanoid containment cell by morning, leaving the Foundation none the wiser. After all, he was really here voluntarily. If the Foundation had truly wanted to try to confine him here, they were welcome to give it a go, but it would be about as effective as trying to catch a whisper in a butterfly net. While God had come to this place to experience the joyful illusion of giving up control, it truly was little more than an illusion to him. If he wanted to, he could exterminate the SCP Foundation in less than an afternoon, then retire to Burger King for a Whopper. So really, they're all just lucky he is a benevolent being, more interested in hanging out than dispensing wrath on those he perceived as insolent. That was Old Testament him. He'd done a lot of soul-searching and growth since then. It'd been at least a millennium since he'd smote anyone for that matter, and the last guy really had it coming. However, today was going to be a little different. God knew that something was going to happen today. He sensed a great source of energy emerging, something dark and malevolent. He sighed and he closed his eyes for a moment, focusing himself. He knew whatever the nature of this threat, it would fall upon him to face and destroy it. How irritating. He was hoping to finally binge Stranger Things today. Elsewhere in Site-19, things seemed to be inordinately peaceful. There hadn't been any containment breaches or new anomalies brought in. There hadn't been any attacks from rival groups of interest. Dr. Bright hadn't even done anything stupid or started any fires. To borrow an old cliché, it was quiet. Too quiet. Perhaps the only person who wasn't having a relatively mellow day was Security Officer Frederick Simmons, a mid-level guard who'd been stationed at Site-19 for four years now. He just wasn't really feeling himself today. The work didn't bother Simmons, emotionally at least. Typically, even after seeing rather traumatic things or being in near-death situations while in containment breaches, it hadn't left any lingering effects. But lately, he'd been having the strangest dreams. It always played out the same way. Shortly after going to sleep, he'd open his eyes in a strange multicolored void surrounded by bizarre, seemingly random floating objects, none of which seemed to have any real relevance to him or his life. And just when he'd begin to question it, the other recurring element of the dream would occur. Out of the shimmering oil-slick rainbow of mind-boggling colors, 
a strange being would suddenly emerge. A glowing golden triangle, almost like a drawing of a pyramid, the eye of providence, with a stovepipe hat, a little bow tie, thin black arms and legs, and most notable of all, a single large eye with a slit pupil staring out from the center. The eye almost seemed to have a strange hypnotic quality to it. Simmons felt bewitched whenever he looked into it. He wasn't afraid, quite the opposite actually. For reasons he couldn't understand, this strange creature from the world of dreams seemed like a good friend of his. He said, Well, 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 if it isn't my number one guy, the Fredmeister, in the house. I've missed you. Have you missed me? Put her there, good buddy. The entity extended his hand and Simmons shook it. The Foundation Guard could feel a strange tingling sensation jolting down his arm. The first time Simmons had encountered the entity, he'd told him his name, Bill Cipher, and he told him how incredibly important it was that Simmons kept their little nighttime meetings a secret. In exchange, Bill was here to listen. Simmons would spend his time in the mindscape pouring out his worries and frustrations with his daily work as Bill paid impeccable attention. The strange little dream entities seemed fascinated by the work Simmons did, all the peculiar and wondrous anomalies he guarded at Site-19. But to Simmons, it was all just boring work. Zombie creating supernatural plague doctors and immortal men with metal limbs lose their shine after you see them day in, day out, for years on end. Frankly, Simmons needed a day off, but he'd already used up all his PTO when he'd gotten the flu earlier that year. He just didn't know what to do. Luckily for him, Bill had a solution. Bill, as it turned out, had a fancy little ability. He could occupy the body of a human being and operate it for them. Bill could take the wheel while Simmons took a load off in the mindscape. How hard could standing around pretending to look busy at the SCP Foundation really be? As Bill explained the offer to him, Simmons couldn't really see any flaws in his reasoning. After all, Bill was a friend. Why would he have any ill will towards him? With that, he shook hands with the bizarre supernatural triangle and felt the sudden rough sensation of having his consciousness ripped from his body, only for Bill to slither in and take his place. The new Simmons, the Bill-occupied Simmons, opened up his demonic yellow eyes and grinned. He gave a demented laugh to Simmons' floated disembodied soul. <laughs> oh man! He said, wiping away a tear of laughter with Simmons' finger. With your body, I can use the SCP Foundation's technology to take over the multiverse! See ya, sucker! And with one last demented chuckle, Bill left for work at the SCP Foundation, with Simmons being the latest in his long line of meat puppets. After arriving at Site-19, he sneaked through the facility, knowing exactly where he needed to be. You see, Bill is a native entity of the second dimension, the world of flat shapes, but he's able to access the minds of beings in the third dimension, like us, through the medium of the mindscape, rather than the physical realm. Bill's life goal has always been to find a way to permeate and take over the third dimension, turning it into his personal playground. All he needed was the right anomaly to bring him forth into our world. In this case, a little anomalous device favored by Dr. Kane Pathos Crow, SCP-158, also known as the Soul Extractor. While Dr. Crow left to the courtyard for his evening walkies, the being that most people assumed was Fred Simmons secreted himself into SCP-158's containment chamber and locked the door behind him. He didn't have much time. He'd need to do this perfectly if he wanted a real chance at taking over the universe. He was amused by the irony, at the least. The fact that in order to take over, he needed to sneak into the midst of the people most likely to destroy him. Still, where's the fun in life with no risk? At SCP-158's control console, he inputted the data to soul extraction and set a timer. However, there was one difference between this and the usual procedures performed with the soul extractor. There was no containment receptacle on the other end. Whatever was extracted would just be released into the world. And this was exactly what Bill was counting on. He laid Simmons' body down on the gurney and watched with glee as the robotic arm lowered towards him. It reached into his chest and pulled out the essence of one three-sided threat to reality. Bill Cipher. One quick journey through the bowels of the machine later, the nightmare scenario had come to pass. 
Bill floated around the room, dragged into physical reality. He let out a long, conceited cackle and spun his cane around. This was going to be fun. Elsewhere in the facility, alarms were going off and guards were deploying. Nobody was meant to be in Containment Chamber 158, so how was the Soul Extractor currently operating? This couldn't possibly end well. Bill, on the other end, was having a wonderful time. He was pondering all the different ways he could make the drab clinical corridors of the SCP Foundation into his vision of perfect weirdness. Maybe he'd turn all the researchers into mice and turn Site-19 into a giant maze to run them through. Maybe he'd turn the air into farts and release winged beasts from the Hell Dimension to ravage humanity. Maybe he'd go out into the parking lot and key everyone's cars. Oh, the diabolical possibilities were endless. As he floated out into the hall, his fantasizing was interrupted by a group of Foundation security operatives wielding assault rifles. They entered an attack formation and trained their rifles on him before opening fire. Bill just found himself laughing again. The gunfire just tickled. Wow, you guys are hilarious! Bill said between fits of laughter. But wait, I can think of a better way to make you even funnier. He snapped his fingers and suddenly the guards were transformed. Instead of the serious first line of defense for the SCP Foundation, they were now a gang of literal clowns straight from the circus, holding balloon animals molded into the shapes of assault rifles. They giggled and threw pies at each other. Bill was right. This did make them even funnier. And he was just getting started. Turning this Foundation snooze fest into a party of cosmic proportions, Bill began running a rampage of weirdness across the site. Essentially being the ultimate cosmic troll, he decided he'd simply bother every single anomaly he could with his demonic antics. First, he appeared in SCP-096's chamber and pulled a brown paper bag over his head, with the words, Ugliness Lies Within written on the front. And just for fun, he then teleported the temperamental beast to a nearby Amish community. It quickly became enraged when a gust of wind blew the bag off its head, and a man named Jebediah saw its face. It then killed several others, also named Jebediah, during the rampage. Bill thought it was hilarious. He then released SCP-682 into Site-19, and just to annoy the creature into further violence, he stuck an indestructible party hat on the monster's head. No matter how hard 682 tried, it couldn't remove the party hat. This caused it great frustration, which it took out on any Foundation staff it happened to find in the area. It had fulfilled Bill's expectations wonderfully, but his quest for amusing carnage didn't end there. Next, he went to bother SCP-049 the Plague Doctor, who was in the process of doing surgery on a Foundation-provided dead goat. With a snap of his fingers, Bill transformed the Plague Doctor's surgical tools into colorful Play-Doh cutting tools. Needless to say, the supernatural surgeon was less than pleased. He was about as annoyed as Dr. Clef was when Bill turned his favorite shotgun into a bouquet of flowers, then sealed his feet into the floor. Or how vexed Dr. Gears was when Bill turned his plain beige necktie into a considerably more loud and colorful tie. People there at the time reported hearing Dr. Gears say, I just don't think that was necessary. Oh, and he also did some more minor acts of malice. He filled the break room with an army of flesh-eating zombies. He made a moat filled with molten lava around the site that prevented anyone from escaping from his reign of terror. And he even covered all the walls in cognito-hazardous doodles that instantly drove any weak-minded human who saw them into complete gibbering madness. It was clear this reality-warping nightmare needed to be stopped before he got bored of playing with his new Foundation toys and decided to go remodel the universe in his own image. Thankfully, there was one anomaly on sight who was up to the task. Bill was treating himself to another evil laugh in the Site-19 canteen when something peculiar happened. He looked down to see a man in what looked like a tunic with graying hair and a beard. He walked with a peculiar kind of calmness, his face blank. Why wasn't this guy panicking? Was he stupid? Bill would seemingly need to teach this guy a thing or two about fear. Hey Gramps! Don't know if it's escaped your attention, but I've been giving this place an extreme makeover. Did you forget to put on your glasses this morning, or are you just that senile? The stranger remained calm as could be. He replied with a voice that was measured as it was deep. Now, Bill, let's not resort to name-calling. That's just childish, don't you think? Bill's single eye widened at this. Wait, wait, hold up. How did you know my name? Bill asked, irritated. 
Are you a friend of the time baby or something? He floated over and began circling the stranger, hoping to intimidate him. Much to Bill's frustration, it didn't appear to be working. I know lots of things, Bill. Lots of things. The stranger replied. That's my line! Bill screeched, turning red. Who do you think you are? The stranger gave a quiet, reserved chuckle that infuriated Bill. Oh, personally, I just like to think of myself as a humble craftsman, watching his beautiful creation play out. He said, But I suppose some of the people around here like to call me God. Bill didn't like this. This whole universe was going to be his, and he certainly didn't appreciate some insolent old man acting like he ran the roost around here. Bill would give him an education in who was really holding the reins, and it would be the kind of education that left scars, if it left anything at all. He extended his spindly black arms and released bolts of lightning against the stranger, who simply continued to smile as the electricity rippled around him, seemingly causing no effect. Are you done? The stranger asked. Bill laughed, hoping to hide his irritation. I'm just getting started, he bellowed. With a thunderous roar that shook the very foundations of Site-19, Bill began to grow and shift. No longer a silly little triangle, he became a huge red pyramid of pure nightmares, covered in glowing golden arms and teeth, with long black tongues drooping out of each level. It was the most terrifying and demonic form in his entire arsenal, and yet he was astonished to find that the stranger still didn't seem to show any kind of fear. Very impressive, Bill. The stranger said, sounding almost bored. But I think you might be trying a little too hard. Oh, that does it. Bill would simply have to destroy him. It was a matter of pride now. He raised several of his huge golden fists and began pounding down on the comparatively tiny humanoid stranger. It was an assault so powerful that the ground began cracking around their feet, and yet it seemed that with almost no effort, the stranger was able to intercept and block every single blow. Naturally, Bill was infuriated. It was time to finally unleash the full breadth of his power on this beardy wise guy. He launched thunderbolts, fireballs, legions of giant mutant wasps, hailstorms, maelstroms, bubbles of pure madness, snakes made out of barbed wire, and even incredible coarse language. But despite it all, this man, the one who claimed people called him God, was utterly unfazed. You can dish it out, he said. But let's see if you can take it. Bill began to laugh. What the heck's that supposed to mean? You can't- God snapped his fingers, and Bill was gone, vanished, and with a flick of his wrist, all the damage and transformations that Bill had performed had disappeared. It was as though the demonic triangle had never even been there in the first place. Though Dr. Bright, who was acting site director at the time, had some Scranton reality anchors turned on around the perimeter just to be safe. You can never be too careful with reality warping demons, after all. Later that day, Dr. Bright approached God and asked him what he'd actually done with Bill. God chuckled and replied, For a being of such immense power, he really had a rather childish mindset. So I sealed him away inside a children's cartoon where he couldn't do any further damage. What was the cartoon? Dr. Bright asked. A charming little Disney show called Gravity Falls, God replied. Well, hello there, SCP fans. Let's get this out of the way first. You've seen the title and thumbnail, and you're probably wondering, wait, is Siren Head an SCP? And the answer is no. Siren Head is not an SCP. It's a freaky internet monster created by renowned Canadian horror artist Trevor Henderson. Your next question is probably, what's with this crazy looking server bank behind me? Allow me to introduce you to the Anomatron 6000 the latest advancement of supercomputing owned and operated exclusively by the SCP Foundation. It's capable of a whole bunch of interesting features, calculating ideal containment methods, running state-of-the-art Foundation web crawler software, making and editing fun SCP YouTube videos. But the most interesting feature that the Anomatron has to offer is running hyper-advanced simulations regarding all things anomalous with data fed into it by thousands of real-life experiments conducted by the SCP Foundation. It's going to save countless dollars and lives for Foundation researchers, but way more importantly, it's going to let us explore all kinds of weird and wacky what-if scenarios that would never happen organically. 
Could SCP-343 beat Goku or Superman? Who's a deadlier supernatural killer? SCP-106 or Freddy Krueger? Would the world simply explode from adorableness if SCP-999 and Baby Yoda ever crossed those multiversal barriers and met? We can explore all of these questions, along with any others you may have down in the comments. Seriously, comment it, we dare you. But to get things started, we figured we'd make the Anomatron pit the Foundation's lankiest nightmare monster, SCP-096, against the Internet's, Trevor Henderson's, Siren Head. Sorry, Slenderman, you're just not cool anymore. So without further ado, let's kick the Anomatron into gear and see how this wild battle plays out. It's time for SCP-096 vs. Siren Head. Ricky and Elliot, a pair of aspiring travel YouTubers from California, were taking a vacation to the Pacific Northwest to spend some time in the area's beautiful lush forests. However, while the duo were both big fans of travel for its own sake, they weren't just here for the trees and fresh air. You see, despite their jet-setting lifestyle, Ricky and Elliot's subscribers and views hadn't exactly been phenomenal lately. Turns out hiking vlogs and GoPro footage of the two of them jumping into absurdly blue water in Bali weren't exactly that interesting to people who weren't actually there. But Ricky had formulated an ingenious plan to pull the two of them out of obscurity. They would hunt down and film real footage of the legendary Siren Head, a supernatural monster said to haunt forests and isolated graveyards. There were plenty of fakers out there on YouTube, but if the two of them could get real footage of Siren Head, and also preferably survive the experience, they'd be framing their golden play buttons in no time. But they were already encountering certain issues. For starters, the two Californians had severely underestimated just how cold it was in the Pacific Northwest, and as such, were already shivering from bone-deep cold. The second issue was food. While the two of them had thought ahead and brought a selection of tasty protein bars, they'd also gotten hungry during the early hours of their walk and eaten all of them leaving them feeling severely out of luck by the time dinner rolled around. And the third and perhaps most problematic issue of all was the fact that Ricky and Elliot didn't exactly have a great sense of direction. During all of their previous trips, they'd been on guided tours with local experts. In this instance, wanting to take all the siren head glory and clout for themselves, they decided to come in alone with the incredibly janky Google Maps app to guide them. As such, as the night was creeping in, the two aspiring YouTube celebrities had no idea where they were. Needless to say, it wasn't exactly an ideal situation. And to make matters worse, Ricky and Elliot had been experiencing some strange feelings for the last couple of hours, when they'd gotten particularly deep into the forest. That dread-inducing sensation of being watched by something lurking just out of sight. A gaze with some unknowable and darkly malicious intent boiling behind it. These two poor saps had no idea what was in store for them tonight. And wouldn't you know it, the one watching them right now wouldn't even be the only monster after them. After an expectable amount of bumbling and buffoonery, Ricky and Elliot managed to gather up enough tinder to make a semi-respectable campfire. They could sleep out here tonight, then set off in search of Siren Head or Civilization, whichever came first, in the daylight the next day. The duo did what they could to remain chipper, in spite of the ominous circumstances. Sure, they were trapped in the depths of the woods alone, but think of the amazing vlog footage they'd get. They'd be like the next Blair Witch crew, except they'd live, hopefully. But as the duo sat next to their campfire, they felt that ominous sensation again. The hairs on the back of their necks started standing up. They felt shivers that didn't just come from the cold. More and more, they started to feel certain that something in this forest was watching them. Something ancient and powerful and evil. That's when they heard the telltale crackle of radio static, and their skeletons almost jumped out of their skin. Could it be him? The patron saint of gone missing without a trace, of creeping dread, of bad things coming. Siren Head himself. Both men fell silent. All they could hear was the crackling of their own fire. Had the sound before just been an illusion? A product of a pair of paranoid minds also predisposed to sense siren-headed monsters lurking amongst the trees. They'd been reading about a higher rate of disappearances in this area, along with a number of frightening sightings of tall, thin beings and radio static that seemed perfectly consistent with siren head activity. That's why they'd come here in the first place, but had they come here to their deaths? 
The two needed to distract themselves, or they'd go mad from the paranoia. They decided to share a few fun little anecdotes of the travels they'd had before meeting one another, showing the photos they'd saved on their smartphones. Ricky had been to Hawaii, Tahiti, Bora Bora, Fiji, St. Lucia, and the Maldives. Clearly, he liked his vacations warm and sandy. Elliot, on the other hand, tended to like his trips to be a little more adventurous. He'd seen volcanoes, waterfalls, deep and treacherous cave systems, and, of course, a little guided mountaineering. One photo that Elliot showed Ricky was particularly breathtaking. He was standing in the foreground of a snowy landscape, with an incredible mountain range behind him. When Ricky asked Elliot where exactly he'd taken this picture, strangely enough, he drew a complete blank. Maybe somewhere in Canada, or Siberia, or something like that. But it was a hell of a trip, whatever the case. He remembered having a great time. It was such a tiny detail, but when looking at the photo, Ricky couldn't help but notice something in the background. A speck of white. Sure, not exactly newsworthy in the snowy mountain range, but this wasn't snow. It was a speck of white that seemed to be a slightly different shade than the rest of the mountain. Strange. Perhaps it was just some tiny particle stuck on the lens whenever the photo was taken. The two continued to chat and warm their hands against the fire, having no idea of the horror they'd just awoken in doing so. Over a hundred miles away, at an SCP Foundation containment site, researchers and guards walked around the perimeter of a huge airtight metal cube, reading off diagnostics and audio recordings. For reasons that should be obvious to everyone who's a fan of this channel, there were no camera feeds coming from the inside of the great metal cube, only a faint whimpering sound like a sad, wounded animal, and the clanking of pacing feet moving back and forth over the metal, dragging forlorn knuckles. It turned every head in the room when the crying started to get louder. Soon, it wasn't just quiet weeping. It was a series of horrendous, slobbering sobs, wails of pure pain and despair. Someone in the room screamed, Close your eyes and hit the deck! Knowing exactly what had happened, they learned well enough from the infamous Incident 096-1-A containment breach that there was no way of stopping this thing until it run its course. The best they could do was minimize their own fatalities in the process. Everyone in the room did as they were told, hitting the ground, closing their eyes, and covering them with their hands just to be safe. That's when the solid steel of the cube was torn open like crepe paper, and the howling, raging SCP-096 broke free, galloping on all fours through the nearest wall, shattering it, and spraying debris everywhere. As mobile task forces were dispatched to track the rampaging abomination and try their best to clear the path ahead as it sought out its target, one thought was going through the minds of everyone in the room. Woe betide the poor fools who saw that monster's face. Back in the deep dark forests of the Pacific Northwest, the presence of some unnerving force was becoming far harder to deny for Ricky and Elliot. They heard the sounds of garbled voices out in the woods, the squeals and crackles of radio static. They saw shapes moving amongst the trees, tall and thin, like long, spindly limbs. While neither wanted to voice their fear, they were both thinking similar things. If there really was a monster out here, why hadn't it killed them? It had all the time in the world to do it. But that was just it, wasn't it? It had all the time in the world, so why rush? It had every advantage. It could take its time and do this exactly how it wanted to. Ricky and Elliot had made themselves the perfect prey, and as they saw a huge, lithe figure suddenly separate itself from the trees, they began to wonder if it was really worth it to risk both of their lives for YouTube clout. Either way, it was now probably too late for regrets. Ricky and Elliot's jaws fell in horror as the monster emerged from the darkness before them. They recognized the awful, mottled skin stretched over the monster's 40-foot frame. They saw the grasping hands and up above, the nightmarish faceless head split into a pair of sirens pointing in different directions, each one filled with gnashing teeth and slithering tongues. It was even more terrifying than they could possibly have imagined. Siren head speakers crackled into life and hissed out, Nine, eighteen, one, child, seventeen, remove, vile. Ricky and Elliot stumbled backwards as Siren Head advanced, its speakers still bleeding hateful static. Neither could move or speak, only watch as its long, gnarled fingers reached from the dark to grasp them. There was a terrible pained wail in the woods after that, 
but it wasn't coming from Ricky, Elliot, or Siren Head. It was distant at first, but soon became louder and louder as the Force's point of origin came barreling towards them. Even Siren Head couldn't help but turn to see SCP-096, a flash of terrible white fury, come charging towards them in the dark, knocking down all the trees in its path. Leaves and pine needles scattered, trunks exploded into splinters. Nothing would stop the Shy Guy from claiming its prey. Nothing would stop it from destroying Ricky. And now as it approached, Elliot made the fatal mistake of looking at its face, too. 096 lunged, ready to go in for the kill, when Siren Head's hands closed around the Shy Guy's slender torso. In one fluid motion with surprising strength for its scrawny build, it hurled the Shy Guy into the distance, smashing another several trees in its path. The words, My prey! My prey! My! 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 hissed out of its speakers. But 096 was only down for mere moments. It sprung back up on its hind and forelegs and started galloping towards Ricky and Elliot again, who were still frozen in place. This time, just before the Shy Guy's terrible claws could close around the two hapless wannabe YouTubers, down came Siren Head's clenched fist, pounding 096's head into the dirt. Overhead, Mobile Task Force helicopters circled, wearing their scramble goggles and trying to get a visual on the situation unfolding below. They could hardly believe what they were seeing down there. Was some other unclassified anomaly managing to intercept 096 in its rage state? Only a handful of anomalies on record have ever been shown of being capable of such a feat. It seemed that they were dealing with something serious here. Down below, the battle continued. Siren Head had a unique advantage over most other combatants facing SCP-096. It was an extra-dimensional being with no eyes merely an innate psychic awareness of its victims around it. Not unlike how SCP-096 detect people seeing its face in photographs or videos, without need for any kind of direct contact. As such, it was impossible for Siren Head to see the Shy Guy's face, and thus impossible for the Shy Guy to ever actually direct its aggression against it. Whether or not 096 would kill Steel Siren Head's intended prey was another matter entirely. In the night's first minor miracle, Ricky and Elliot remembered that they'd been born with working legs, and decided that right now would be an excellent time to use them. They turned and began to run while Siren Head continued beating the Shy Guy into the dirt, sprinting with all their might. However, the growing distance between them only aggravated the Shy Guy further. It sprang out from the dirt with unstoppable force, and broke away from Siren Head's grip. The Shy Guy never wasted time, ever. It always made a beeline for its intended victim with one directive in mind. Total annihilation. Tonight is no different. Ricky and Elliot screamed as they heard its pounding gallop on the ground behind them. Closer, closer, closer. Then suddenly, defying all spatial reasoning, Siren Head emerged out from the darkness between Ricky, Elliot, and 096. Being 40 feet tall, Siren Head dwarfed even the Shy Guy. It lunged and grabbed the wailing white monstrosity, holding it as one would a particularly vicious cat and trying to keep it in place. Siren Head wanted to crush the monster's bones and carry on stalking its feeble human prey, who were currently in the process of getting away, but somehow, that was impossible. It was almost like the monster had an indestructible skeleton. Up above, the mobile task forces continued observing this clash of the titans from their two helicopters. Seeing how Siren Head was somehow doing a serviceable job of subduing the Shy Guy, one of the task force members joked, eh, maybe we should hire this guy. Another chimed in, I don't think we have any ballistic vests in his size. The laughter soon turned to screams when Siren Head hurled 096's flailing body up at one of the helicopters with incredible force, knocking it out of the sky. It careened down to the ground, a ball of fear and violence before exploding. Anyone who survived the initial blast was unlucky enough to have seen the Shy Guy's face. Their screams rang out briefly, before being abruptly silenced by the monster. Helicopter Alpha had no survivors. Meanwhile, Ricky and Elliot had kept running until their lungs burned and their muscles pumped thumbtacks. Seeing that the chaos was so far behind them now, they took a moment to stop and breathe, recomposing themselves. In the second minor miracle of the night, it looked like the two of them had actually survived this ordeal. Those two horrific monsters had canceled each other out, but Ricky and Elliot were about to learn a harsh lesson. They really weren't that lucky. The last thing the two of them ever saw was Siren Head emerging from the darkness once more. The last thing they ever felt was the monster's terrible gnarled fingers curling around their bodies, too fast for them to escape. 
and the last thing they ever heard was each other's screams, followed by a sickeningly meaty crunch. Elsewhere in the forest, SCP-096's wails died down to its usual mudlin sob. The rage state had ended. All of its targets had been destroyed. It just hadn't been the one to do all of the destroying, per se. Not long after that, Helicopter Bravo descended safely, and the remaining MTF members closed around the blubbering beast. Someone black bagged it, and everyone breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that was at least one monster taken care of tonight. What about the other one? The MTF lieutenant asked. The team's commander shook his head and said, oh, let's worry about that freak later and get 096 back to containment. This place gives me the creeps. Hello, one and all, and welcome back to the Anomatron 6000, our patented device for projecting any seemingly improbable scenario for your viewing indulgence. And today, we decided to do something slightly different with it. Here at SCP Explained, we usually activate the Anomatron to bring you encounters between the anomalous denizens of the SCP universe and other fictional characters, like Doctor Strange fighting the Scarlet King, or Abel crossing paths with Batman. But this Anomatron experiment is one of our more unusual, to say the least. If you've been subscribed to us for a while, some of you might remember our video, What if SCP-096 was put inside SCP-914? In it, the shy guy was tricked into entering the input booth of the anomalous refinement machine during a containment breach. What emerged was maybe the handsomest man to ever live, beautiful both on the outside and within. A lot of our comments pointed out that this refined version of 096 felt akin to a Giga Chad, and that got us thinking. What if SCP-096 was to encounter the real Giga Chad? Well, the Anomatron 6000 has a few different answers for us. Scenario 1, or as we like to call it, the obvious outcome, pits the thin humanoid anomaly against the man behind the meme. Ernest Kalimov is a Russian fitness trainer and model, forever immortalized in the annals of internet history by a series of black and white photoshopped pictures that garnered him the nickname of Giga Chad. Thanks to his practically perfect 90 degree jawline and muscular physique, Kalimov seemingly unknowingly became the archetype for the ultra-masculine, handsome man. However, the man behind the Giga Chad meme is still just a man. The infamous photos of him were heavily edited for an art project known as Sleek in Tears, and while Ernest does sport some impressive muscles from all his time at the gym, that strength isn't enough to save him from the shy guy. After all, he is still just a man. According to the Anomatron's predictions, the most likely outcome, if the two were ever to meet, would end pretty similarly to the grim fate of many others who have gazed upon the face of SCP-096. The moment Ernest looks at the creature, he would, in all likelihood, activate 096's rage state. His physique and above average level of fitness might give him a slight advantage, allowing him to perhaps outrun the shy guy for longer than most, but ultimately, Ernest Kalimov would be able to run, but not hide, from SCP-096. The creature would track him down and hone in on him with anomalous speed, dispatching him before returning to its usual docile sobbing state. The result? An SCP-096 victory. Now we know what you're thinking, is that really it? We had the same reaction too. But hold on for a minute. After giving the machine an additional set of variables, we were able to get a few more interesting outcomes out of the Anomatron. Which brings us to the result that we've given the title of Scenario 2, Shy Harder. Of course, Ernest Kalimov might be the face of an internet meme, and ultimately just a very strong Russian man in comparison to the anomalous traits of SCP-096, but the Giga Chad? The Giga Chad is more than a man. So much more than the sum of his parts. Existing within the online zeitgeist since as early as 2017, the Giga Chad is far more powerful than a mere mortal. He doesn't just represent idealized standards of over-exaggerated masculinity like the action movie heroes of the 1980s. The Giga Chad embodies those ideas. He is the very notion of a physically perfected human specimen given form. You may not like it, but peak performance doesn't even come close to the Giga Chad, and neither does SCP-096. Even at the top of its game, the creature quite literally pales in comparison to its imposing opponent. In Scenario 2, Shy Harder, the Anomatron 6000 predicted that if the two were to meet, the scales would tip in the complete opposite direction from the first outcome. 
for that was SCP-096 against the man, but against the meme himself. Well, this fight is no contest. As a matter of fact, it's hardly even a fight, certainly not a fair one, and instead is more of an execution. From the moment the unstoppable tower of muscle and perfect angular jawline that is the GigaChad clasps eyes on SCP-096, it's practically the beginning of the end. The Shy Guy doesn't even lift, bro, but GigaChad can bench one million times his own body weight in his sleep. So when SCP-096 comes racing towards him, intent on killing him just for looking at its screeching wide-jawed face, the GigaChad does what the GigaChad does best. He lifts. Grabbing SCP-096 with ease as it comes to him screeching, GigaChad casually hoists the creature off the ground. Although he's only using the tiniest portion of his immense and infinite strength, it's more than enough force to send the Shy Guy soaring upwards, crashing through multiple ceilings as it's sent hurtling up the numerous floors of the Foundation facility above. Of course, being lifted is hardly going to kill the Shy Guy outright. The creature is known to be invulnerable, after all. But it's not like Giga Chad can go down easily, either. Don't forget, this is no mere mortal, but an internet meme incarnate. And on the internet, nothing ever dies. His perpetual existence as part of online history aside, the Giga Chad is so strong that no doubt his abs could withstand the firepower of any conventional weapon. Realizing that even if it could reach him, it couldn't even scratch the Giga Chad, SCP-096 would undoubtedly begin a downward spiral. The Shy Guy is a creature so insecure in itself and its appearance that it kills anyone who so much as glances at its face in photos. So being presented with the living embodiment of an idea it could never even hope to attain, the biceps, the perfect right-angled jawline, it's all too much. Sending SCP-096 into a complete meltdown, the creature would be neutralized once and for all by the very existence of the Giga Chad, resulting in his victory. Okay, so we're one point to SCP-096 and one to Giga Chad, and most people would maybe consider leaving it there. But not us. We wanted more than that. You see, we quickly realized that the Anomatron's second scenario was based on a lot of earlier iterations of the Giga Chad meme. Don't get us wrong, that version of the Ultimate Man could still easily destroy the Shy Guy. But around March of 2021, the infamous photoshopped images of Ernst Kalimov started to be used in slightly different formats. That's the thing about memes. They're not only immortal, forever logged in the ancient texts of the Wayback Machine and compilation videos here on YouTube, but memes are also adaptable. They can evolve and change, finding new variations as time goes on. As such, the average fan versus average enjoyer meme saw a new use of the Giga Chad. Before, the Giga Chad, this notion of the ideal ultra-masculine specimen was based on, let's be honest, some pretty outdated ideas about what it means to be a man. After all, it takes more than muscle to be a man. Not every man or masculine presenting person has to work out until they're built like a brick wall. Perhaps the real measure of a man is how sincere, sensitive, and supportive you can be, as well as standing by your interests rather than caving to old societal standards of masculinity. And after we updated our data, the Anomatron 6000 was able to give us a new revised outcome, or what we like to call Scenario 3, the average SCP-096 enjoyer. In this projection, the Giga Chad's true strength isn't just his masculine physique and his unattainable standards. Instead, it's, in part, the inherent adaptability of his status as a meme, but also his compassion. Just like before, he's more than able to resist SCP-096's attacks, and the creature's insecurity comes out, put on full display when presented with Giga Chad's sharp jawline. But rather than overcome his anomalous adversary by fighting him, this scenario sees the Giga Chad comforting the Shy Guy. Through calm empathy and words of affirmation, he reminds SCP-096 that true acceptance of oneself comes from within, and that message strikes a chord with the creature. In a turn of events none of us saw coming, the Giga Chad offers to help SCP-096 overcome his crippling and deadly sense of insecurity. The pair start using the on-site gym together, after hours when there aren't any innocent Foundation personnel around. 
There, Giga Chad not only offers to introduce SCP-096 to an exercise regimen, if that's what the creature wants, but also helps the Shy Guy work on his confidence. They form a friendship, with SCP-096 taking a liking to working out, not because it wants to be buff like its new friend, the Giga Chad, but more so because doing so makes it feel more comfortable in its own skin. SCP-096 gradually starts to like itself more, even eating healthier thanks to Giga Chad's advice. Eventually, the Shy Guy begins looking far more content and even starts to develop self-confidence. It's not often that a story involving SCP-096 exists with the creature getting to achieve some semblance of happiness. Well, there is one that comes to mind. The very same Shy Guy story that sent us on this particular streak of pitting it against the Giga Chad in the first place. But what if we put them together? Would coming across a refined SCP-096 spell the end for the Giga Chad? Or would the muscular, masculine meme undo the Shy Guy's previous happy ending? Well, according to the Anomatron 6000, neither. When we last left him, after being turned into a handsome, nine-foot-tall man, SCP-096 had just started going by the name David. SCP-978, the desired camera, had been used to photograph the refined Shy Guy. It showed him holding hands with the Foundation scientist responsible for his transformation, who had studied the new and improved SCP-096 in great detail. She had quite the understanding of him. But perhaps the photograph from the Desire camera was more of a metaphor, and what SCP-096, or David, really desired wasn't specifically the researcher who'd studied him, but a partner who understood him. Someone to call an equal. Enter the Giga Chad. According to the calculations made by the Anomatron, the embodiment of ultimate masculinity, both strong and sensitive, came bursting into the Foundation facility. There, the moment he and David saw each other was like the meeting of an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Neither one rushed to solve the encounter with violence. Both the Giga Chad and SCP-096 appreciated each other's aesthetic appeal. Both were remarkably handsome and one couldn't bear the thought of ridding the world of the other. Instead, it was love at first sight. Both David, formerly known as SCP-096, and the Giga Chad fell head over heels in love with each other, and looking at both, it was not hard to see why. They were a pair of fine, perfectly chiseled fellas, and they instantly hit it off. The newly established couple enjoyed each other's company, spending time in deep conversations, SCP-096 introducing his new partner to his friends at the Foundation, while Gigachad was comfortable with his own masculinity to express his feelings towards David without fear or judgment. No relationship is perfect, of course. For a short time, a sliver of David's old self re-emerged. The shy guy in him worried that perhaps his relationship with the Gigachad was based purely on both of their extreme good looks and was nothing more than superficial. But by being an embodiment of healthy, idealized masculinity, the Giga Chad was able to sense something was wrong with David. And rather do the insecure thing of letting it fester, he addressed it directly, and they discussed the issue in a healthy, mature, and constructive way. Not just so they could put SCP-096's worry to rest, but so that both of them could further strengthen their relationship and grow as people. And of course, Giga Chad wasn't just attracted to SCP-096's refined good looks. Far from being superficial, he recognized that David was a complete person, beautiful both inside and out, and loved him as a whole, not just because they were both conventionally attractive on the surface. SCP-096 and the Giga Chad stayed together for the rest of their lives, or as we decided to name this fourth scenario from the Anomatron, happily ever after. Somehow, most likely through some nefarious means, a fateful postcard has been sent to one of the residents of the murky, mysterious Araniram Island. Living on this particular island was already a strange and scary enough existence, given the horrors the inhabitants of Anariram share their home with. But perhaps the only thing just as horrible as life on that island was being sent a postcard. Sure, that doesn't sound all that horrible, Postcards are usually used to show a corner of the world far away and extend well wishes from friends or relatives on vacations. But ordinarily, postcards don't depict a photo of SCP-096 with the words, Wish he was there, scrawled on the other side. 
From its containment cell at the SCP Foundation, the Shy Guy instantly sensed that somebody, somewhere, had seen a picture of its face. Breaking down into an enraged fit of homicidal insecurity, SCP-096 immediately broke from its containment chamber and made a cross-country beeline, heading straight for Araniram at anomalously accelerated speeds. Little did the creature or the Foundation know that the Shy Guy was being led straight into a trap, and the poor island resident who had received the chilling postcard, well, they were unlucky enough to be the bait. While the SCP Foundation started frantically trying to track down where it had gone, the Shy Guy had already made its way to a wooden cabin belonging to the unfortunate postcard recipient. Emerging from the now-emptied home once the owner was no more, SCP-096 would have returned to his cell just as quickly as he left. That is, if he wasn't the only monstrous creature on the island. A loud and sudden noise caught the creature's attention the sound of an old steam train whistle. It rang out once more, from somewhere off in the distance, but there was so much thick fog hanging in the air around Araniram that it was almost impossible to see anything, especially with how dark it was. The second time the whistle sounded, it was closer, but there was another sound too, and not the loud chugging of a steam engine that you would expect. It was an erratic, heavy thudding, the noise of lots of somethings drumming against the ground, causing the earth itself to shudder. Legs. They were the steps of multiple huge legs, crawling across the surface of the island, heading straight towards SCP-096. A third piercing whistle rang out, even closer still. This time, the orange glow of a light could be seen, dulled by the surrounding fog but getting brighter and clearer as it came closer. The light was casting shadows against the dark fog, long, spindly shapes of spidery appendages, until before the Shy Guy's eyes, a creature of pure nightmares came bursting out of the fog. It was a monstrous sight, even to SCP-096. Its body was the red front engine of an old-fashioned steam train, hoisted off the ground by four pairs of enormous, black, spindly, spider-like legs that propelled the beast forwards at a terrifying speed. Able to move without the limitations of needing to follow a railroad track, the monster was barreling towards SCP-096, with a twisted smile on its grotesque face. At the front of the locomotive was its circular face, with its unnaturally white eyes and a mouth that sported rows of razor-sharp teeth all covered in blood. This hellish abomination, a being that was part steam engine and part giant spider, was the terror of Araniram himself, the carnivorous Chu Chu Charles. Seeing Charles racing towards them on its eight spider legs would be enough to make anyone freeze up and stop in their tracks out of sheer terror, and SCP-096 was compelled to do the same. Except the terrifying train creature's pale eyes were looking directly at the Shy Guy. As Charles sized the anomaly up as its next meal, he was looking at it. And that meant SCP-096 had to kill him. The question was, how could it? How could the skinny, spindly humanoid hope to even fight something like Choo Choo Charles? He was much bigger, even more fearsome. But as quick as Charles could move on his spidery legs, he was not faster than SCP-096. In the blink of an eye, the Shy Guy raced off shrieking and sobbing in despair, leaving Charles to continue roaming his island territory in search of other human inhabitants to terrorize. SCP-096 had retreated to some nearby woods, quick enough to move out of Charles' path somewhere it could hide, for now. But the Shy Guy could feel a familiar, painful feeling almost pulling him back towards Choo Choo Charles, right back into harm's way. SCP-096 possessed an inescapable compulsion to kill anyone who looked at its face, and that seemed to include horrifying part-train, part-spider hybrids. It was a fact of the Shy Guy's very existence. He had to go after whoever looked at him and make them pay. In fact, it took all the creature's own strength not to instantly rush back over to Charles to try. SCP-096 knew that if it did, 
then there was little chance it would survive coming face to train face with the terror of Aranira. However, while it was watching Choo Choo Charles from a safe distance, seeing him crawl across the landscape on his multiple legs, that SCP-096 noticed something. It was another light obscured by the fog, but this one was much higher up. One could almost mistake it for the moon, if it wasn't getting closer, all the while accompanied by the sound of whirring rotors. While the shy guy had been evading Choo Choo Charles, the SCP Foundation had been tirelessly trying to track down its location, and now they'd found their runaway anomaly here on Araniram Island. As the chopper carrying the mobile task force drew nearer, the tyrannical train turned and took notice. To SCP-096, the Foundation's arrival could have meant a way home and away from the spidery steam engine. But to Charles, the approaching chopper meant only one thing, a new source of food. Captain! One of the MTF troops aboard the chopper called over his headset. What is it? Do we have eyes on SCP-096? The captain replied before realizing what he'd said. Well, not eyes on, because then it would have jumped up onto the chopper and killed us all. I mean, is there any sign of SCP-096 on the island? Negative, sir, although you should probably see this, the soldier replied. Begrudgingly, the captain unbuckled himself from his seat and snatched the Foundation operative's binoculars, using them to look down at Araniram below. It didn't take him long to spot the massive, multi-legged monstrosity that was Choo Choo Charles, who had fallen still, waiting for the chopper to descend low enough for him to reach. Good gravy, what on earth is that thing? The captain exclaimed, before taking another look through the binoculars. Is that? Wait, what is an instance of SCP-2086 doing out here? SCP-2086 was an infamous anomalous species the Foundation had encountered before. Much like Charles, they were anthropod-like creatures with multiple long legs that protruded from a body resembling a man-made mode of transport. However, SCP-2086s usually took on the appearance of buses while in vehicle form. Sir, I, I don't think that's an SCP-2086, the lookout replied. To me, it looks more like an instance of SCP-3023. Impossible all the way out here, the captain retorted. We're nowhere near the region where the anomaly occurs. It could have scurried its way from Germany and taken nest here, sir, the trooper responded. Yet another anomaly that Choo Choo Charles bore a striking resemblance to. SCP-3023 was a rare phenomenon that was known to occur at random, but was limited to a specific area of central Germany. The effect of this phenomenon caused ordinary, everyday, inanimate objects of any shape or size to suddenly turn into aggressive spiders, sporting eight legs that grew from whatever was affected by SCP-3023. Perhaps Choo Choo Charles was indeed an instance of SCP-3023, or some distant evolutionary offshoot of SCP-2086, who was hard to say for sure. The only thing for sure was that Charles was a man-eating beast, more so than an insidious villain. And being so highly territorial, he considered the entire island of Araniram to be his natural habitat and his hunting ground. Anything that arrived in his vicinity was prey to the terrifying train, and his ravenous craving for human flesh meant he was ready to attack the descending SCP Foundation chopper. All right, let's go, go, go! The MTF captain called to his troops, signaling them to start rappelling out of the helicopter and down to the island. Keep your scramble goggles on, Max! We still need to recapture 096! But first priority is taking down this big, ugly beast! Wearing goggles specifically designed to distort the Shy Guy from their view, the team began abseiling out of the aircraft. But Choo Choo Charles was already waiting for them. Rearing back on its four back legs, the nightmarish train spider swiped at the descending MTF operatives. What first seemed like an instinctive, uncoordinated assault quickly became precise and relentless strikes as Charles sliced through some of the cables the MTF troops were using to repel down. Their lifeline cut, the unlucky Foundation operatives plummeted from mid-air, right down towards where the terror of Araniram was waiting for them to fall. A few of the MTFs made it to the ground alive, and immediately began retaliating against Choo Choo Charles. The gunfire from their weapons flickered all around the carnivorous creature, but their bullets could barely chip the red paintwork on his steam train body. Dashing towards his helpless human prey on his many legs, Charles began to feast. Then suddenly, something started pulling at one of his huge spider legs, pulling Charles back moments before he had a chance to claim his latest victim, the captain of the Foundation's MTF. It was SCP-096, 
having zipped out of hiding and shrieking wildly as it used all of its strength to wrench one of Choo Choo Charles's multiple limbs. Angered that it couldn't reach the MTF captain, the part spider, part train hybrid stomped the leg that was being pulled in a successful attempt to free itself from the Shy Guy's grip. But in the same instant, SCP-096 used its anomalous speed to reappear in front of the already angered locomotive monster. With his railroad rage about to reach its breaking point, Charles entered into a relentless rampage, making quick work of the leftover MTF troops before setting his sights squarely on SCP-096. But doing that was his biggest mistake. Now Choo Choo Charles had seen the Shy Guy twice, and to the insecure anomaly, that meant Charles had to go. Traveling faster than even the multi-legged monstrosity could perceive, SCP-096 began racing towards Choo Choo Charles's many legs. The Shy Guy had realized that it didn't stand a chance of dealing with the terror of Araniram the same way it handled all the others that had seen its face. So instead, it had settled on a new approach, specifically tailored to taking down the spider-legged steam engine. One by one, SCP-096 started knocking Charles's many legs out from underneath him, effectively tripping him up over and over again. The Shy Guy moved so quick that the cumbersome Charles could barely react in time, having one leg after the other knocked out from beneath him, causing him to tumble to the ground. Normally, Choo Choo Charles was smart enough to retreat if he encountered something that could fight back. If he was injured badly enough, the spider-like creature would scuttle out of harm's way in order to heal his wounds. But the rage at being constantly tripped up by SCP-096 was distracting Charles from the Shy Guy's true ploy. With every leg it knocked out from underneath the spidery steam train, SCP-096 had been gradually directing Charles towards a nearby gorge. With a terrifying burst of anomalous speed, the Shy Guy caused Choo Choo Charles to topple over sideways, rolling over himself until he landed upside down in the bottom of the rocky gorge. The multi-legged locomotive monster's spindly legs flailed desperately as he tried to reposition himself, but with no luck. SCP-096 had managed what first seemed to be impossible and beaten the terror of Araniram, Choo Choo Charles. Or for now, at least. Silently passing through the inky void of space, a vessel was hurriedly making its way towards its destination. The craft was sleek, designed and built by hands not of this world. Aboard, one of the occupants knelt before its elders. It was time. It gathered its arsenal in a methodical, almost ceremonial fashion. Its spear latched onto its back with its survival gear, a medikit containing surgical equipment and specialized serums. It donned its gauntlets, then reached for the final piece, its mask, that it slipped over its face. Ready for its task, the creature boarded a smaller scout ship, which was jettisoned and began to descend toward the planet below, a world known as Earth. On the surface of the planet itself, a technician was sitting at his desk, bored staring at readouts from satellites and the endless sweeping of a radar scanning the skies above for any signs of disturbance. For a moment as the scout craft passed through the atmosphere, something happened that broke the technician out of his boredom. There was a blip on the radar, the tiny detection of an unknown signal, that of an object traveling on a direct course through the sky. Just as the technician started to take notice, the approaching ship activated a stealth mechanism, reflecting all light away from it in order to render it almost invisible while simultaneously becoming undetectable to radar. The blip vanished from the screen and didn't reappear. The technician shrugged, thinking it was probably nothing but an equipment glitch. Besides, the SCP Foundation didn't pay him enough to follow up on every tiny blip. A few hours later and several continents away, a mobile task force was on an assignment. The oppressive heat and humidity of the Lacondon jungle was bearing down on them, especially in their combat gear. The operatives were all feeling unbearably hot. The Foundation researchers overseeing the MTF's mission via satellite didn't have to contend with the elements in the comfort of their air-conditioned command center. But little did they or their boots on the ground know, there was something else visiting the rainforest too. It had been stalking the squad for a few miles now, and not one of them had noticed, just as the creature planned. A trio of red laser beams cast three distinct dots over one of the MTF operatives' chest. Suddenly, a streak of energy shot through the air, crackling as it struck the agent, tearing through his chest and killing him on the spot. 
Instinctively, the remaining troops turned and opened fire at the treetop where the blast had come from, spraying a volley of bullets, enough to start shredding the wood of the tree, splinters and bark raining down. They hit nothing. There was no sign of whoever or whatever had fired that shot and killed their teammate. From behind them, a pair of discs with a row of long, fan-like blades around their edge flew through the air. There was so much force behind the arm that threw them that the pair of shuriken lifted two of the remaining MTF soldiers off their feet and impaled them to the trunks of nearby trees. The last remaining Foundation operative looked at the bodies of his dead squadmates in horror before turning and fleeing. But just as he ran for his life, something caught him. It was transparent, cloaked, and near impossible to see, but it had plunged a pair of blades into the MTF trooper's chest, lifting him off his feet with ease as he screamed in pain. An invisible, leathery-skinned hand reached for his throat and twisted, and in an instant, with a sickening crack, the man was silent and dropped limply to the floor. From the command center, watching in awe as this imperceptible monster tore through four of their finest operatives with ease, a pair of researchers turned to look at each other. The expressions they both wore were faces of sheer disbelief. They both had heard stories, instantly recognizing the destructive behavior, but never thought they'd see, or not see, it carried out for real. We still don't have a name for them, do we? Researcher Hall asked as the pair of them walked briskly down the corridor. Ah, uh, negative replied his counterpart, researcher D. Ligirio. But the files we acquired from military intelligence suggests they've been coming to Earth for decades, centuries even. The earliest known encounter took place in the 1700s. Uh, can we negotiate with this one at all? Hall asked, fully expecting the answer. I don't think they respond well to that kind of engagement, D. Ligirio said. They seem to come to Earth with one singular purpose, to hunt. For sport? Well, it, it seems so. Uh, what about their capabilities? The senior researcher pressed. Their technology is pretty advanced, even compared to some of the things we've seen, the other explained. On top of that, they're fast, strong, and completely ruthless, pretty much an apex predator. According to Intel, the instances of these creatures that have previously visited Earth have displayed a sort of tribal nature. Care to elaborate? Hal probed. Uh, based on the files, their hunts seem partially recreational, but also like some kind of ritual to prove themselves as capable or to challenge themselves. That gives me an idea, the researcher replied. Contact containment area 25B. If we play this right, we can bag one of these creatures and bring it in for testing. Time seemed to race by as Hall and De Ligirio were bundled aboard a transport and taken directly to containment area 25B a facility built by the Foundation specifically to house a particularly dangerous anomaly. Within the hour, the two researchers were standing facing a huge stone cube, its dark surface sporting a number of symbols engraved into it. Growing impatient, knowing their window of opportunity was rapidly closing, Hall turned to one of the Foundation personnel stationed within the primary containment zone around SCP-076. Play it again, he instructed. Wake him up. Hitting a button, a recorded message began to play over the facility's loudspeakers. It had been translated into an ancient Sumerian dialect that the entity within the stone cube had historically shown a preference for. Come on out, the message stated. We know you don't think any of us are worth your time, but we remember Omega-7. You agreed to work with us before, even though you don't think we present enough of a challenge to you. But we may have found something that will an adversary that you could have the privilege of besting in combat. There was a brief moment of silence before the stone began to rumble. The security personnel on site tensed up, gripping their weapons shakily, nervous hands. Slowly, the circular lock on the side of the cube began twisting, the door it kept sealed beginning to open. Are you sure we can do this, Hal? Asked E. Ligirio. If SCP-076 isn't willing to cooperate, this could go south real quickly. And God forbid, what if somebody found out what we're having him do? Hall didn't answer, instead watching as the door to the cube finally opened, and a lean man in his late twenties stepped out. His gray eyes stared out of a mess of jet black hair, his body adorned with tattoos of arcane runes and occult imagery, the sneering faces of demons over his olive skin. As the guards around him nervously raised their weapons at the ready, SCP-076-2 casually strode up to Researcher Hall until the two were inches away from each other. Where? Abel asked. Fitting him with a communications earpiece and having him board a transport, Abel was sent directly towards the last known coordinates of the now-deceased MTF, deep in the heart of the Lacondon jungle. 
Sat atop a tree as the aircraft made its approach, the creature had lowered its cloaking device, certain it was alone as it polished a skull it had collected from one of the ill-fated operatives. The predator was a member of a species known as the Yucha, one of the few details about its race that Diligirio's files hadn't mentioned. Everything else was accurate, though. It was indeed a hunter, here to claim trophies as proof of its skill. These trophies happened to be the skulls and spines of whatever it killed. Hearing the sound of an incoming vehicle, the Predator instinctively reached for a control on its left wrist gauntlet. Its cloaking device reactivated, bending the light away from itself to render the alien hunter nearly invisible. Through the lenses of its biomask, the Predator watched the craft pass overhead, and the shape of a single humanoid heat signature dropping from it and landing in the rainforest. Trekking through the lush vegetation, Abel walked towards the location he had been given. It always irked the immortal barbarian when the Foundation attempted to use him to perform their menial dirty work. To Abel, such tasks were beneath him, but he had been promised a fight with a worthy adversary, and that was the only reason he had agreed to undertake this mission. Looking around as he reached a clearing, there was no sign of the MTF agents, until, that is, Abel craned his neck upwards and found them. Something had meticulously gathered up the bodies and hung them from the branches by their legs. It felt distinctly like a warning, as well as a taunting gloat. Every indicator pointed to this being the action of a creature that was marking its newfound territory. With a wave of his hand, Abel pulled a black-edged sword out of a pocket dimension holding his weapons, and held the blade at the ready. Looking down, he saw three points of red light had appeared on his bare chest, just as Abel caught sight of the treetops where the lasers were coming from, a bolt of high-energy plasma was fired towards him. Within the same split second, he hurled his sword in the direction of his invisible enemy. The blast struck him and knocked him down, searing his flesh. Not that Abel could feel pain. At the same time, his sword spun through the air and cleaved through the branch where the predator had been perched, causing the creature to drop to the jungle floor with a thud. As the Yaucha stood up, it noticed its gauntlet was sparking, having sustained damage in the fall. Now its cloaking device was flickering on and off. The Predator knew it would need to repair its equipment, but first and foremost needed to collect a trophy from its latest kill. The creature strode towards where Abel was laying. A scorch mark left by the plasma caster burned into his flesh. Its cloaking device still malfunctioning, the hunter reached down to claim its prize. Abel's eyes suddenly snapped open and caught the creature by surprise. Reeling his leg back, he delivered a sharp kick that sent the Predator hurling backwards, despite it being well over seven feet tall and 520 pounds of armor and alien muscle. Abel hurriedly stood back up, facing off against the alien warrior as it too drew itself to full height. The gauntlet on its left wrist continued to spit sparks until the Predator reached a clawed digit over and pressed a control. With an electronic beep, its cloak deactivated fully, and the hunter was revealed. It was tall, standing on two legs like a man. It seemed lithe and agile, but clearly almost as strong as Abel himself, judging by how muscular it was. Long appendages resembling locks of hair protruded from its head. Behind a metal faceplate, a mask covered the true face of the creature below. A clicking, chittering noise emanated from beneath the predator's biomask, as it reached for a sash that went across its front and produced a pair of small metal circles. Abel flexed his shoulders and ran at the creature. The Predator hurled both its discs at Abel, curved blades extending from both of them as they spun through the air. Abel ducked out of the path of one shuriken, narrowly dodging the second as he charged the alien hunter. Reaching for its back, the Predator produced the long, ornate handle of its combi stick. Both ends of its telescopic spear extended, and the hunter began racing forward to clash head-on with its newfound prey. It plunged the spear right through Abel with all its strength, lifting the barbarian off his feet on the end of its weapon. Out of nowhere, SCP-076 produced another of his swords, the Predator turning to look in confusion at the weapon that had seemingly just appeared in the hand of what it had taken for an ordinary human. Catching the off-world game hunter by surprise, Abel swept the sword through the air, cleaving the creature's spear in two, causing him to drop back to the ground, landing on his feet. Following it with a second swift swing of his blade, Abel brought the weapon down on a slash that cut across the creature's chest. It sliced through the thick reptilian hide of the predator, leaving a streak of fluorescent green blood oozing from its torso. The creature roared in pain. It sounded like a call of a lion echoing through the trees. In retaliation, the predator extended a pair of blades contained in its right gauntlet and swiped them at Abel. 
The wrist blades narrowly missed his face as he dodged an incoming attack, only to be caught by the creature's other hand. He gripped his head and plunged downwards, knocking Abel over and sending him face first into the rainforest floor. Reaching for his cloaking device control, the predator disappeared, retreating into the jungle to tend to its heavily bleeding wound. What manner of devil is this creature, Hall? Abel yelled at the researcher over his earpiece, hacking branches out of his path with his sword as he followed the trail of luminous green left by the wounded hunter. It's a warrior from another world, Hall replied. A hunter that tracks its prey by their body heat, considers itself honorable, but often likes to go after more dangerous targets to challenge itself. Not unlike you, Abel. I am nothing like this demon, the barbarian shouted in fury. This gutless monster has no honor. If it did, it would not give itself such an unfair advantage, nor would it run away when wounded. A true warrior would be happy to die a warrior's death in single combat, and would not rely on all its fancy weaponry. Well, from what we can tell, these things have their own codes of sorts, Deligirio's voice said over the comms. You might not think of this hunter as honorable, but it definitely thinks of itself that way. Maybe use that to your advantage? I do not need to be lectured by the likes of you, Abel interrupted. You have not known the heat of battle. None of you at the Foundation have. I will follow the trail of this cowardly beast's blood and cleave its foul head from its shoulders. Unbeknownst to Abel, high above a branch, the Predator was watching him. Its biomask had been zoomed in on him, the hunter listening to the barbarian's outrage. It turned to the task at hand, opening up its medikit and producing the surgical tools within as it tended to the deep green cut across its chest. Stifling roars of pain beneath its mask, the Predator stapled the injury closed and applied a solvent to cauterize it. Night was beginning to fall, and Abel had long since lost the trail of green blood. Frustrated, he thought back to what the puny researchers at the Foundation had told him of his alien adversary. If it believed itself to be honorable, to have a code, then perhaps using that to lure it out to face him might work. With the sun rapidly disappearing beyond the tree line, Abel gathered a number of branches, hacking them off trees with his sword and fashioning them into burning torches. He placed them in a circle around the circumference of a clearing, creating a makeshift gladiatorial arena. He could feel his blood boiling, the urge to defeat this monster making him seethe. Throwing his head back and beating a fist against his chest, Abel roared up at the dark sky. Come out, hunter! He howled. Show yourself! Come on, do it! I'm right here! Watching him from afar, hidden by its cloak, the predator recognized what was happening. This was a challenge, a direct call to engage in single combat. Refusing this challenge and shooting its prey dead would be quicker, easier. But the hunter knew it was being watched, and therefore judged. With a growl, it dropped to the ground and paced towards the circle. Abel turned as the predator revealed itself, appearing almost from thin air. As it did, he drew one of his weapons and stood ready to fight. The hunter shrugged off the technology it carried on its back, dropping the plasma caster and its medikit before reaching up and pulling off its mask. Its face was grotesque. Four hooked mandibles surrounding its mouth flared in anger. You are one ugly, Abel said only to be interrupted by the predator extending the blades from its gauntlet and letting out another bestial roar. Holding his sword aloft, Abel gave a goading beck to his opponent as the pair of them circled one another. Finally, the creature gave in and lunged at him, swiping its pair of razor-sharp serrated blades at Abel. He swung his sword and at the last second, deflected the oncoming blow with a clang of metal. Reaching into his pocket dimension, Abel pulled a second weapon out in his other hand and swiped at the predator, slicing through the creature's hide and leaving another gaping wound at its thigh. Roaring in fury, the predator launched another strike. Abel blocked the attack yet again, this time by crossing his swords, but the predator barged forward, driving its blades into the prey's chest and pinning his two weapons against him. The monstrous alien viciously headbutted Abel, the hooks of its mandibles scratching his face as it did, before reaching up to the back of his neck with its free hand. Abel could feel the sheer strength of the hunter lifting him off his feet, ready to twist his neck and pull his head off to claim it as a trophy. Kicking the predator in the chest, Abel used the force of the impact to push himself free from the creature's grip, backflipping through the air and landing a few feet away. His swords clattered together as they dropped to the ground, the immortal barbarian summoning another and immediately charging at the predator. It had been winded by the kick and barely recovered in time to defend itself as the blade swung for its neck. The predator staggered back, green blood oozing from its hide and pouring from its mouth. 
That blow had mortally wounded it. It was bleeding heavily and knew it might not survive this hunt, but it refused to be bested by a human, even one as seemingly invulnerable as Abel. Hunching over, listening to him slowly approaching to deliver the killing blow, the predator tapped a series of controls on its gauntlet. A gradually accelerating beeping began emanating from the device. Turning around at the last second, the alien hunter impaled Abel before he was upon it, skewering SCP-076-2 on its wrist blades. His sword had been raised above his head to plunge through the creature, and even while impaled, Abel was able to deliver the final blow. Stabbing the predator while it too had stabbed him, the pair were locked in a stalemate angrily roaring each other until an explosion of energy burst from the hunter's gauntlets, reducing both Abel and the Predator to atoms. Watching from their satellite feed, Hal and Diligirio sighed. They wouldn't have their specimen for testing, but at least they knew that Abel would eventually resurrect within the stone cube of SCP-076-1. But even higher up than their satellite, someone else was watching. A group of predators growled and chittered amongst themselves, having witnessed from their ship as one of their own had died in a battle with Abel. Although there was no way of knowing, the noises the hunting party were making could have been expressions of disappointment at their fallen brother or a declaration of war. When you work for the SCP Foundation, you need to be ready for anything. That's why, as part of the Elite Foundation Training Regiment, senior researchers and guards are always running tests, even against things that aren't recorded anomalies under the auspices of the Foundation. That's why today, for a real change of pace here at SCP Explained, we're not talking about the SCP Foundation. We're talking about made-up monster stories crowdsourced over the internet. We're seeing how the Foundation might fare against iconic creepypasta monsters and maniacs like Herobrine, Jeff the Killer, The Slenderman, Eyeless Jack, Smile Dog, and many, many more. We've even created all new mobile task forces to take each one down. So could any of them best the Foundation's best and brightest? Let's take a look and find out. And be sure to tell us which is your favorite creepypasta entity down in the comments below. Let's get creepy. Jeff the Killer First up, we've got everyone's favorite disfigured, knife-wielding, homicidal teenager. Whether it's his terrifying visage or the iconic go-to-sleep catchphrase that's forever carved into your mind, there are probably a lot of people out there who have lost nights of sleep worrying that this pale-faced monster could be crawling through their window. But we know what you're probably wondering. Isn't Jeff just a serial killer? Why would the SCP Foundation use up its time chasing down any old regular human murderer? We'd ask for you to think again. Jeff has displayed feats that clearly mark him as anomalous. Despite suffering debilitating burns to his face and body, he still shows superhuman strength, agility, and durability. He's also able to see without eyelids, suggesting some supernatural element is at play. Victims have also reported him dodging shotgun blasts while stalking prey. So, how would the Foundation catch him? Seeing as Jeff's modus operandi is breaking into the homes of his victims while they sleep, the best method would be staking out a neighborhood where he's been shown to be active, keeping close observations on houses, and even setting up personnel from Mobile Task Force Sigma-9 My name is Jeff! in vacant houses as honey traps. Jeff is undeniably strong, fast, and tough, but if attacked and surrounded by operatives with superior tactics, he could be subdued without casualties. Then it would just be a matter of transferring him to a standard high-security humanoid containment cell. Speaking of horrifying creatures that come to you in the dead of night, the Rake. This supernatural entity has been around for almost a thousand years, as far as scattered reports are aware. It's also been reported across four continents and a huge number of locations within those continents. Though most recently, it's been reported in rural New York State and Idaho in the early 2000s. The Rake is an inhuman beast most often known for its large, frightening eyes and its long, rake-like claws. Not only does the monster feed on human beings, but it also produces a traumatic level of fear in its victims. Thankfully, an entity like this is far more familiar territory for the SCP Foundation. Using their state-of-the-art web crawler software, they could catalog reported sightings as they happen, 
and use clusters of these sightings to triangulate the location of the rake and dispatch field agents to perform reconnaissance missions. From there, it would just be a matter of waiting to strike and sending in Mobile Task Force Zeta-13 Rake Steppers, fitted with Dr. Dan's scramble goggles to prevent them from being affected by the seemingly cognitohazardous effects of viewing the rake. When the creature is placed in containment and kept in a state of perpetual bright light, it would simply be a matter of applying a Scranton Reality Anchor to prevent the creature from somehow phasing out of containment. Just make sure you avoid its big, staring eyes in the meantime. Though, that won't be a problem with the next creepypasta monster, Eyeless Jack. This stealthy creature has its no eyes on one thing and one thing only, your kidneys. And unless you want to die or spend the rest of your life on a dialysis machine, we recommend you keep your distance from him. He's discreet, devious, and diabolical. And if you wake up in the middle of the night to see him staring down at you, it may be the last time your body is able to filter toxins out of its blood naturally. Thankfully, we have a way to make the Foundation put a stop to his organ harvesting ways. Sometimes, to catch a jack, you need to use a jack. There's no way to catch Eyeless Jack without delicious live kidney bait, so we'd recommend sending in someone who has kidneys to spare, Dr. Jack Bright. Bright could be the perfect bait without losing his life, luring Eyeless Jack into a decoy house while Mobile Task Force Gamma 391 hit the road Jack, prepares to spring their cunning trap and plunge this unpleasant kidney muncher into a humanoid containment cell forever. But our next creepypasta entity doesn't want your kidneys, it wants your life. Smile Dog. Our next entity seems like a harmless little JPEG to the untrained eye. A little freaky, sure, but nothing to lose your mind over. But we know that there's far more to this grinning husky than meets the eye. If some reports are to be believed, this image may even be connected to the devil himself. If you're unlucky enough to see this image in the world, it may already be too late for you. Those who see it, typically as an email attachment from a mysterious address, spend the last week of their life in a hell of the mind before eventually succumbing to a bleak and mysterious death. It's a classic cognitohazardous image, and the most frightening part is that it's self-propagating, with one of the only ways to even mildly alleviate the effects seeming to be spreading the word by subjecting another person to this nightmare. That's when we bring in Mobile Task Force Row 19, Naughty Dog, an elite group of hardened military programmers handpicked from the CIA's Cyber Warfare Unit. They use their very particular set of skills to design web crawler software that roots out and takes down Smile Dog images across the web, and hopefully, one day find the origin of this whole thing. The next creature, on the other hand, We've given up on finding the origin of that. The Expressionless. This entity kind of looks like a terrifying store window mannequin, except rather than modeling fast fashion, she prefers to swallow cats whole and murder hospital staff. Oh, and she also calls herself God. Isn't she just so quirky? Her primary abilities seem to be extreme strength and large, sharp teeth that will easily rend through human flesh. Thankfully, not anything the SCP Foundation hasn't dealt with countless times before. Seeing as the only recorded incident involving the Expressionless took place at a hospital in Los Angeles, that would be the most sensible area to stake out. A detail from the creature's original encounter is also telling. It reacted severely to the doctor's attempts to sedate it, implying that chemical sedation is an effective method of incapacitating the beast. That's why every member of Mobile Task Force Kappa-99 Ain't No Dummy is a sharpshooter with a tranquilizer rifle capable of putting a hippo to sleep with a single shot. She'll probably feel less like a god in her containment cell, but while this monster is expressionless, the next one has one very notable expression, Mr. Widemouth. Compared to some of our other creepypasta contenders, Mr. Widemouth may not look like much, but that, our dear friends, is exactly what this nasty little malefactor wants you to think. He may look like Gizmo's slightly demented cousin, but his intentions are even more sinister than that of your average gremlin. If you're a kid home on a sick day, 
Mr. Widemouth might strike up a conversation. After gaining your trust, he'll try to lure you to his special place beyond the trees for some fun. But take it from us, all you'll find out there is your doom. This crafty little creep's small stature and manipulative stealth abilities might pose somewhat of a challenge for the SCP Foundation, but that doesn't mean they can't get him with a little intelligence and elbow grease. Mobile Task Force Alpha 18, the Smile Smashers, will follow reports of children disappearing from their isolated homes under mysterious circumstances. Then, using an extra strength butterfly net straight from the folks at Foundation R and D, they can chase down and capture the nasty little monster. But that won't be the case for this next demonic offering. No, this creepypasta legend is the one that captures you. No End House. In recent years, there's been a spike in interest in so-called extreme haunted houses. If you're not sure what these places are like, basically picture a CIA black site with the occasional plastic skeleton. It's all waterboarding, stress positions, and car batteries. But even those places are nothing compared to the nightmare of No End House. It's a moving, possibly even sentient spatial anomaly hiding in a haunted house attraction. And if you find yourself inside, best believe you're never going to see the outside ever again. Thankfully, Mobile Task Force Delta 35, McCamey's Bane, are on the case. Around Halloween every year, they use web crawlers to detect chatter around no end house events, so they can swoop in and intercept, preventing hapless thrill seekers from being devoured by the house and providing amnestic treatment for anyone who has too close of a call. Sadly, the Foundation will not be able to provide refunds for those who already paid. Speaking of paying, You'll really pay if you end up in our next creepypasta location of doom. Abandoned by Disney. Mowgli's Kingdom, an abandoned tropical Disney attraction based on the Jungle Book movie, is abandoned for a reason. It's a hotbed for anomalous activity, including freakishly large mutant snakes, reports of ghostly activity, and most prominent of all, a terrifying photo-negative Mickey Mouse that stalks any hapless urban explorers who happen to find their way onto the site. Of course, the Walt Disney Corporation keeps it all hush-hush, and the SCP Foundation is happy to give them a hand on that front. Even if the frightening photo-negative Mickey was removed from the site, it's likely the other may appear and continue haunting the site. And seeing that the site cannot be moved as a whole, the Foundation's best bet is to form a perimeter around the abandoned Disney attraction, preventing anything normal from getting in and anything abnormal from getting out. Mobile Task Force Omega-17, Sons of Shere Khan, are ever vigilant and maintain a strong presence in the surrounding area. But you don't need to go anywhere for this next anomalous terror. If you're a big Nintendo fan, it might be sitting in your house right now. Ben Drown. This haunted NES cartridge of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask contains the restless spirit of its last owner, a guy named Ben who, well, drowned. If you slot this creepy little gaming experience into your Nintendo Entertainment System, you'll soon find that the soul of Ben is communicating with you directly, telling you about how he died and why his consciousness lingers on embedded in the code of the game. Thankfully, other than the psychological trauma of experiencing the game, you're unlikely to be actually harmed by playing it. However, Mobile Task Force Beta 51, gamers don't have rights, are still on the case. They'll try to intercept all cursed copies of the game and administer amnestics to anyone who is unfortunate enough to play it. While it is still undeniably spooky, it does feel like a relief to finally find a safe class anomaly on this list. The same can, sadly, not be said about our next creature, the Goat Man. If you're a fan of camping, then this malicious mimic is going to be your worst nightmare. This monster has existed as a fixture of terror in everything from a number of Native American mythologies to iconic 4chan green text posts. You may be thinking, oh, what's so scary about a goat? But this thing is no goat. Aside from the fact that it's the greatest of all time at getting you to crap your cargo shorts in the woods. First, you'll smell blood in the air, and then feel an odd electrical static, like the feeling all around you right before a lightning strike. Then you'll hear noises, strange noises. Something not quite like a voice, like an animal throat straining to form human words. 
That's when you might notice your group of friends has one more person than you remembered. And the one thing worse than noticing that is not noticing it. Because if you don't, you may end up as the shape-shifting goat man's latest victim. Mobile Task Force Theta 11 Got Your Goat are constantly on the hunt for this one, but its extreme intelligence and ethereal nature make it a nightmare to track. But forget nightmares to track. It's time for Laughing Jack. This candy striped clown from hell is a really nasty customer. Definitely do not engage unless you've got a Scranton Reality Anchor on hand and you've got a backup from members of Mobile Task Force IOTA 40, Put Jack in the Box. As a former imaginary friend gone rogue, Laughing Jack is a semi-intangible reality warper of considerable power. He targets his victims with sadistic glee, pulling them into his dark carnival to experience all kinds of nasty tortures. Laughing Jack shows no remorse, giggling while committing every evil act you can imagine. You'll probably only find this clown funny if you're already a depraved serial killer, and his sense of humor is likely to utterly break your mind unless you've been given amnestic treatment from the SCP Foundation. This is an anomaly that would probably get along swimmingly with SCP-106, the old man. They could chat over a few drinks one evening and share notes on how to cause the maximum pain to their hapless victims. That being said, few people understand maximum pain more than the next horrifying abomination on our roster, the Russian Sleep Experiment Test Subjects. As anyone familiar with the work of GRU Division P will tell you, the Soviets performed some pretty horrific occult activities throughout the 20th century. One of the most disturbing of these was the infamous Russian Sleep Experiment, wherein a group of unfortunate political prisoners were doused on a classified anomalous gas that robbed them of their ability to sleep. A chemical compound that the scientists hoped might increase the productivity of their workers and soldiers by eliminating sleep. Instead, over several terrifying days, the chemical and the sleep deprivation that ensued caused the subjects to instead become demonic monsters. While current accounts of the story suggest that all the subjects were killed, we can't say for sure there weren't more out there, or that the experiment hasn't been repeated. As such, Mobile Task Force Omicron 8, Nighty Night, is constantly on the lookout for freakish skeletal men wandering through the woods, never sleeping outside the dark forests where Siberian gulags used to be based. Better safe than sorry, right? Though of course, you won't feel safe at all if you've spent your childhood watching scary media. Like horror movies or eerie SCP YouTube channels, like and subscribe by the way. Or scariest of all, a strange little puppet show called Candle Cove. Feel a little chill go down your spine. Oh yes, you remember this show, don't you? You love seeing all those cute little puppets going on swashbuckling pirate journeys on their adorable boat, the Laughing Stock. Though there was always that villain, wasn't there? You think his name was Jawbone, but that's not what you called him. You called him the Skin Taker, because he always had that long cloak made of tanned human skin. You also remember that one episode that was just all the characters screaming. I mean, how could you possibly forget? And most of all, you remember asking your mom about it, and her telling you that you never actually watched a show called Candle Cove. You just sat around watching Static for hours on end. Of course, the SCP Foundation keeps close tabs on everything related to this traumatic childhood memory. Broadcasts of the show are seemingly impossible to contain. All the Foundation can really do is track down people who have seen it and provide amnestic treatment. Though trust us, there are things that will make your childhood far worse than just watching Candle Cove. Like running into this next iconic monster, the Slenderman. This terrifying entity is powerful as he is iconic. A shape-shifting, faceless, tentacled nightmare in a three-piece suit who likes to hide in forests and abandoned buildings, either stealing children away or influencing their minds until they become his proxies. Supernatural servants who do anything their inhuman master asks them to. The Slenderman is one of the most powerful monsters in all of Creepypasta, so the Foundation certainly has their hands full with keeping his tentacles under wraps. All that Mobile Task Force Chai-90, Marble Hornets, can do is track sightings, 
and keep children out of the woods when the danger of potential Slenderman encounters arises. Getting him actually contained basically seems out of the question. Whew. After all this, we might need to relax. Maybe grabbing a nice sugar-free soda and playing a session of Minecraft might make us feel better. We'll be safe there, right? Well, probably. Unless we encounter Herobrine. The SCP Foundation, funnily enough, is actually no stranger to anomalies trapped in Minecraft. They've got SCP-4335, a welt in the crucible, to thank for that. But this Minecraft horror story is a little more personal. Herobrine is a mysterious user with the Minecraft default skin, except with one difference. Completely white eyes. This mysterious figure invades different Minecraft servers, acting incredibly strange towards the people who created them. What makes this more than just some random troll? Well, according to legends, Herobrine is the manifestation of the dead brother of Minecraft's creator, Notch. Naturally, the Foundation doesn't want people running into ghosts on Minecraft, so they dispatch Mobile Task Force Chai69, blocked and reported, to quarantine any servers where Herobrine is sighted, and spread misinformation that the crafty little entity had never actually existed in the first place. What is the truth of the situation? It's unclear. And that's exactly how the Foundation likes it. So there we have it, folks. How the SCP Foundation would counteract some of the most infamous creepypasta creeps and creatures out there. Which was your favorite? Do we miss any? And would you like to see any of these expanded into a full video in the future? Let us know down in the comments, if you dare. <laughs>
Oh, no, not my cube. If you open it now, my plan is doomed. Loki pleaded. Thor responded with a laugh of his own. Nice try, brother, but I'm going to open it. And so the God of Thunder did. Thor popped the cube's lid and braced himself for whatever cosmic force was about to be released. But for some reason, nothing happened. Still curious, Thor took a cautious look inside. As it turned out, the only thing within this apparently non-magical cube was what appeared to be a fully developed photograph. What in Odin's name is this? Thor removed the image and held it close to his face. It appeared to depict an emaciated pale humanoid with long spindly limbs standing in the corner of a compact room with smooth metal walls. In all his many years traveling the Nine Realms, Thor had never seen anything like it. Whatever the creature actually was, it certainly did not look happy. Of course, what Thor was actually looking at was a photo taken of SCP-096 inside of its containment unit at the Foundation. The Shy Guy, as its nickname suggested, did not like having its face looked at, even via secondary means, such as photography or video recording. The anomalous humanoid sense of shame about its own appearance was so great that a mere moment after Thor fixed his Asgardian eyes upon its visage, SCP-096 began to stir in its containment unit. The creature wailed and covered its face with both of its hands on its long, sinewy arms. It screamed and carried on for a duration of two minutes, after which point SCP-096 sprinted towards the steel walls of its containment unit and smashed through. Reaching speeds greater than most motor vehicles, SCP-096 began to zero in on Thor's location. As was always the case when another being saw its face, the Shy Guy was compelled to utterly annihilate the offending observer with its bare hands. Thor himself had no idea that SCP-096 was en route and continued to squint at the photograph, perplexed by the mysterious entity depicted therein. Loki now resumed his mad laughter because once more, he had managed to trick his foolish brother into falling for one of his ingenious schemes. Make sure to get a good look, brother. Loki gloated. Yes, look at the full creature. That will bring about your inevitable destruction. Thor was annoyed. If you think that showing me a gross picture of some lowly wretch will strike fear into my heart, you've truly forgotten what it means to be an Asgardian. Save your sentiments for the halls of Valhalla, the green-clad evildoer cackled. You'll be there soon enough. And with that, Loki used a charm to turn himself invisible and vanish completely from Thor's sight. Thor stomped his foot on the ground angrily. He wasn't sure how, but it seemed as though Loki had gotten the last laugh once again. Loki! He shouted after his brother. Come back here and face me with honor! Then the God of Thunder sighed pensively and thought to himself, Who am I kidding? He's never going to change. Thor looked at his trusty hammer. Moan your old friend, it seems like we've saved the day yet again. Shall we away back to Avengers HQ? He then shook Mjolnir up and down like a puppeteer simulating a nod. Splendid idea, Mjolnir. Glad you thought of it. Thor chuckled, already in better spirits. That's when he began to hear the footsteps of SCP-096 rapidly approaching him. Thor turned his head towards the sound and saw the same disquieting creature from the photograph that was inside Loki's cube, zooming headlong towards him with reckless abandon. The Asgardian blinked. He almost couldn't believe his eyes. Whatever that thing was, it was faster than Thor could have possibly anticipated. Was it looking for the photograph? He wondered. Hello there! Thor called out as SCP-096 continued to make a beeline at the caped superhero. The God of Thunder waved the photograph of SCP-096 in the air. Is this your, um, selfie? In all likelihood, Loki had been his usual conniving self and stole that self-portrait from the miserable creature hoping that it would mistake Thor for the thief. The God of Mischief had probably even used a glamour to disguise himself as Thor when he did the deed. Thor believed that all he had to do was clear up this misunderstanding, and that he and this strange beast could go their separate ways without coming to blows. It was a naive, optimistic, and ultimately incorrect view of the situation, but at least the hero's heart was in the right place. I don't need this, so... Thor said, trying to reason with the creature. You can have it back if you'd like. But SCP-096 showed no signs of stopping, and was seemingly enraged even further by Thor flaunting its decidedly unflattering photograph. The Shy Guy kicked the ground and shot forward with a powerful burst of speed. 
One of its elongated arms slammed into Thor's face with enough force to nearly knock the Asgardian off his feet. Thor was so surprised that he instinctively whacked the creature with Mjolnir, sending SCP-096 careening backwards down the street. It wasn't launched more than a dozen feet before its powerful arms and legs dug into the pavement and slowed its velocity to zero. Even though the thing from the photo had taken a direct hit from Mjolnir, it barely looked phased on a physical level. One thing was for sure, the shy guy was still incredibly distraught, and it was directing all of those negative emotions towards the god of thunder. What was this thing? What is this thing? Thor wondered to himself. It was fast, strong, and durable to an unearthly degree. If this thing wanted to engage in single combat, Thor wouldn't back down. He was an Asgardian warrior, and sometimes that meant facing challenges head-on, no matter how suddenly they arose. Still, his time with the Avengers had taught him that having a clear reason to fight was sometimes even more important than the fight itself. Hey, quick question, um, what are you? He said aloud to the creature. SCP-096 didn't answer. Within seconds, it was on Thor again like a bilg snipe on another bilg snipe. The screaming humanoid swung wildly, pelting its opponent with blow after blow. Thor tried once more to communicate with his unknown enemy. I have no quarrel with you, weird one, Thor spoke. So take your noodle arms and be gone! For all of its relentless ferocity, the humanoid abomination left countless openings that a seasoned warrior like Thor could easily exploit. Of course, most mortal combatants would be unable to endure the brunt of the Shy Guy's attacks for long enough, but true to his nature, Thor was a god. The Avenger struck back with another crushing blow from Mjolnir, aimed straight for the creature's sternum. Once again, the monster was pushed back for a moment and then resumed its maddening onslaught. A blow like that should have at least busted a rib or two. Were the bones of this horrible thing made of vibranium or some other rare metal out of the depths of space? Thor realized he was now fighting on the defensive. While he had faced foes in the past with much greater physical strength than the Shy Guy, including his superhero colleague Bruce Banner's mean, green, ever-loving alter ego, the Incredible Hulk, the sheer tenacity of SCP-096 meant that being careless with his own protection could lead to Thor taking unnecessary hits that would eventually wear him down in a prolonged fight. The wiry humanoid certainly didn't show any signs of slowing down or tiring, even though it had to be expending a lot of energy to move so quickly. Between his alternating deflections and counterblows against the creature, Thor mulled over his brother's words from earlier. Loki was right about one thing. This is a fell creature if ever there was one. Still, as long as there is thunder in my blood, I won't allow a hairless curl like this to bring me my own destruction. Think, Thor. What would Stark do at a time like this? He says he's the smart one after all, humor him. With his highly sophisticated tactical acumen that was similar to Iron Man except for the fact that it was much better and stronger, Thor efficiently assessed his current situation. While the Pale Beast was undoubtedly violent and far mightier than most terrestrial creatures, its attention and all the brute strength that came with it had been fixated solely on Thor since it arrived in the city. The Asgardian's best guess as to why was the photograph that Loki had tricked him into looking at. Devious trickster that he is, Loki must have known that this thing would hunt down and attempt to pulverize the latest being to see its face. Which now, of course, happened to be Thor. The revelation of this fact meant that Thor no longer had to worry about the fate of civilians if he chose to relocate to a less populated battlefield, since the creature was now guaranteed to follow him. Nobody else needed to get hurt. While running from the fight wasn't exactly the God of Thunder's favorite strategy, it would massively reduce the chance of collateral damage. He'd be saving lives in classic Avengers fashion. Captain America would be so proud. Not that Thor would have done it any differently, even if he didn't have the Star-Spangled Man's approval. SCP-096 leaped in towards Thor to deliver its next walloping strike, but the Asgardian quickly grabbed it by the wrist and pulled the ferocious creature off its feet. He lifted it up and over his head before slamming it down hard into the pavement. With a bit of space between himself and his anomalous foe, Thor began to swing Mjolnir around by its leathery wrist strap. The Shy Guy desperately scrambled to its feet to resume the attack. But by that time, Thor had already thrown himself skyward. He soared between the buildings using the force of Mjolnir's trajectory, making it his mission to exit the city as soon as possible. Thor looked down to see that SCP-096 was following him along the ground, exactly as he predicted it would. 
While the battle with the beast would most certainly continue the second he dropped back to Earth's surface, he could rest assured that the place where the showdown would take place could be chosen by him. He saw an evergreen forest on a nearby mountain and decided that it would do nicely as a place to finish this. I'm sure no one would mind a few stray bolts of lightning around here, Thor thought. The God of Thunder was amused by the prospect of going all out against this being. Even though it probably had its reasons for wanting to destroy the one that saw its face, Thor was past the point of taking chances on diplomacy. This distressing creature was, after all, an adversary that Loki had plotted to send after him through one means or another. And because of that, it was likely to have power and guile to spare. Thor breaking a sweat to vanquish the thing would be a fitting replacement for the fight that he would have to have with Loki. Thor's feet hit the ground on a stony mountain ledge, and once again he struck that iconic superhero landing pose. Remarkably, the Shy Guy had kept pace with Thor almost the entire time the Asgardian had been flying, smashing through every tree and boulder that stood in its path. Even so, Thor was more than ready for it. Storm clouds rumbled overhead. The sky above the mountain was trembling as Thor decided that it was time to bring down the thunder on his unfortunate foe. Boom! Crack! The heavens flashed with electrical might as Thor channeled the energy from several lightning bolts through Molnir before unleashing a consolidated blast of unbridled power onto SCP-096. The Shy Guy didn't even attempt to dodge as Thor's Thundershock treatment bombarded it with light and heat, the likes of which few mortals could withstand. Thor released a second blast, then a third, surrounding SCP-096 with as much lightning as these earthly skies would offer him. After keeping at this for a while, Thor decided to let up momentarily to check in on his foe, only to see that there were no signs of visible damage on the creature. It wasn't even slightly singed. The God of Thunder could feel his brother laughing at him from somewhere out of sight and out of reach. The monstrous humanoid in the forest below was proving to be far more than Thor had bargained for, but he was nowhere near ready to give in and accept defeat. Still, maybe this wasn't a fight worth having on Earth. All Thor's electrical attacks were doing was destroying trees, and the planet was already facing unprecedented levels of deforestation due to the greed of human CEOs and shady entrepreneurs. Thor certainly didn't want to be part of the problem, and now that it was occurring to him, he realized that he should probably try to do something about that once the situation with the Shy Guy was resolved. It didn't matter how close of a friend Elon Musk was to Tony Stark, these overreaching humans had to be given a stern talking to by the God of Thunder, with or without hammer in his hand. Of course, Thor's environmentalist concerns had to go on the back burner for now since SCP-096 was advancing towards him once again, with no hint of slowing down. Let's see if you can follow me back to Asgard, you son of an elf, Thor thought. He held his hammer aloft and counted on Hemdal to deploy the Bifrost. The Rainbow Bridge arrived seconds before SCP-096's arms would have reached the Asgardian, and as expected, it instantly carried Thor into the interdimensional space between his destinations. Amidst the swirling sea of multicolored lights, Thor shared a laugh with nobody but himself and Mjolnir. So much for Shy Guy, said Thor. Looks like it'll have to resolve those body issues on its own time. I've been through something similar so I can relate. Best of luck, pitiful beast. But while Thor was congratulating himself for his strategic retreat, he almost didn't notice that his foe hadn't actually stopped in its pursuit. As a matter of fact, SCP-096 was currently inside of the Bifrost and swiftly gaining on the God of Thunder. The Shy Guy was truly running in the 90s. Well, 90 miles per hour or more, but it made the same difference. The creature grabbed Thor by his ankles and screeched in mortified rage. Thor punched SCP-096 in the face, hoping to shake it off, but to no avail. The two opponents spun through the Bifrost, locked together in an unbreakable grapple, until they collided with the walls of interdimensional space. Thor knew exactly where this was going, and he wasn't happy about it. Like a sheet of ice composed of photons, the outer limits of the Bifrost broke away, sending both combatants shooting off into the void. Seconds later, a wormhole spit Thor and SCP-096 out in a vast junkyard filled with the remains of countless spaceships and alien life forms. Great, I'm trapped in this garbage world again. I knew I should have picked somewhere closer. Thor shook off the nauseating effects of the failed interdimensional trip. SCP-096 was already hale and hearty for another round. Thor grimaced with frustrated anticipation. Uh, how about a quick five-minute rest? Thor implored the Shy Guy. 
Gentlemen Struess, SCP-096 roared and dashed forth, more crazed than ever. Thor exhaled in futility. I thought not. He whipped Molnir around and hurled it straight for SCP-096's skull. The reliable Urus steel hammer made contact, knocking the creature onto its back. At the very least, Thor could always count on his signature weapon to help him out. Or could he? When the Asgardian tried to call the hammer back, he was shocked to find that SCP-096 had somehow grabbed a hold of its handle. Even more surprisingly, it now appeared to be wielding the hammer as easily as Thor could. Son of a... You're telling me that thing is worthy? The shy guy now with Molnir in hand pounced on Thor, swinging the hammer with no technique or finesse. It was everything Thor could do to simply avoid the creature's range. A blow from Molnir was enough to cause serious injury to even the most formidable Asgardian warrior. Damn you, Molnir! We talked about this! Thor thundered. We're friends, aren't we? But none of his words could get through to the hammer now that it was in the hand of SCP-096. In an act of righteous defiance, Thor called the Fury of Lightning into his own body. This strange foe which had come from Loki's latest prank was about to find out what happened when a god of thunder got serious. With the speed of a lightning bolt, Thor flew at SCP-096 and punched it so hard that its grip loosened on Molnir for all but a second, and that second was all Thor needed to reclaim his weapon. His hand clung tightly to Molnir's handle as he swung the weapon into the Shy Guy's body with all of his might. The shockwave of this forceful blow launched piles of debris high into the air and sent SCP-096 tumbling across the surface of the planet like a thrown piece of discarded food at an Asgardian feast. With another pulse of electricity, Thor magnetized the portions of the rubble which contained spaceship parts and used his manipulation of that same energy to bury the Shy Guy in the deepest heap of trash he could manage. And with one last flick of Molnir, Thor sent himself hurtling through the largest wormhole in the sky above and back into space where it would be far more difficult for his foe to follow him. Finally, with some distance, Thor breathed a sigh of relief. You almost had me that time, Loki. What an unusual being. Fought like a berserker, but was somehow also pure of heart. A kindred spirit to myself, perhaps? Even so, I truly hope to never meet that thing again. Anyone working at the SCP Foundation will no doubt be familiar with SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. For those of you that aren't, it essentially does what it says on the can. Or rather, it's assembled just like it is in the flat pack furniture instructions. While on the outside it appears to be an average, unassuming branch of the affordable Swedish furniture outlet, inside is a different story. Crossing the boundary of SCP-3008's automatic doors and venturing a little too deep into its maze-like confines leads to an endless labyrinth of Kullens and Hurdals, a dimensionally transcendental area that defies our ordinary human understanding of physical space. Lurking deep within the aisles of the infinite IKEA are SCP-3008-2s, better known as the Staff a race of misshapen, faceless humanoids with long, freakish arms that prey on anyone that enters once night falls. And yes, there are people inside SCP-3008, trapped souls that have wandered into the wrong IKEA, only to end up missing, sometimes spending months or even years inside, if they ever get out at all. An alert was ringing, filling the air with loud, blaring noise. Every member of Foundation personnel stationed outside the infinite IKEA was rushing about, guards standing at the ready. The storefront of SCP-3008 had been silent for quite a long while, with nothing reported going in or coming out. But the Foundation knew far better than to assume that SCP-3008 didn't have surprises in store for them. Pun fully intended. Hey, don't you dare click off, we know where you live and Red Right Hand are lining up the shot. <clears throat> Anyway, there appeared to be some kind of commotion beyond the doors that quickly slid open just in time for something to be slung through the front entrance. It almost looked as if the IKEA itself had spat something out, like it was so toxic it couldn't endure having to keep it within its confines any longer. Cautiously approaching with their weapons raised, the Foundation's on-site security team moved towards the discarded mess to get a better look at whatever it was. It turned out to be a person, a man in around his late fifties, beaten within an inch of his life. He was wearing some kind of rudimentary circlet or crown around his head, 
seemingly fashioned by hand out of stationery and other materials scavenged from the paper shop department of the infinite Ikea. Speaking of, the man was wearing an Ikea manager's uniform, with a name tag pinned to his chest that identified him as Chris. Hanging from his neck was an Ikea-branded notepad with a message scrawled on it. But before you find out what that message was, we have another important message for you. One that directly impacts you. Yes, I'm talking directly to you. It comes from the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access. We know you've heard a lot of big claims from a lot of different VPN providers, but you absolutely must hear why we've chosen PIA as our personal VPN and why you should do the same. Unlike the SCP Foundation and some of those other VPN services out there, PIA is the world's most transparent VPN provider. They never record or store any user data at all. Don't believe us? Their no-log policy has been proven multiple times in court and was even verified by an independent audit by Deloitte. And they stay transparent so that you don't have to. With PIA's VPN, your IP address is hidden and your connection is encrypted, keeping your digital life protected from the prying eyes of network admins or even a certain mobile task force unit. And they've just launched what is maybe their coolest feature yet. With servers now in all 50 US states, you can look like you're surfing the web from exactly where you want. Need to look like you're checking out that SCP database entry from Indiana? They've got an IP address for you there. Or maybe you're on the West Coast and want to catch the early East Coast premiere of your favorite show and avoid spoilers. Not a problem with private internet access. I could go on and on about all the features I regularly use, but why not try it yourself by going to www.piavpn.com forward slash SCP and get an 82% discount on private internet access. That's just $2.11 a month. Plus, get three extra months completely for free. Not long before Chris was found in his roughed-up state outside the only IKEA that goes on forever, he was working at a different branch, one that was much smaller on the inside. Chris was the manager of the store, and widely regarded by his employees to be an awful person. Nobody knew if he had always been that way, or if instilling him in a position of power over other retail workers had somehow caused him to develop a bit of a god complex. Either way, there was little he ever did to invoke much camaraderie with his colleagues. Whenever any of the store's workers were on their breaks, which they usually had to remind Chris were permitted by law and not optional, conversation often turned to their collective poor opinions of their manager. He'd been given the job out of pretty blatant nepotism. It was well known how cozy Chris was with the regional manager of all the IKEA stores in the area. On top of that, Chris had a pretty nasty habit of trying to force his employees to stay behind after their scheduled shifts had finished, while also refusing to pay them for overtime. You see, it was his own mismanagement of the work rota that had left the store understaffed at crucial moments of the day. The solution, you would think, should be obvious. Hiring a few more new staff to help with the workload and to start their shifts at times when others were about to clock out for the day. Ah, but new employees wouldn't work for free. Their wages would come out of the store's budget, and why would Chris want to take on new workers? As the person in charge of payroll, he could help himself to that money, adding the wages of prospective colleagues as a bonus, on top of his own unjustifiably exorbitant salary. Perhaps the worst part about having Chris as a manager was that he seemed to get away with murder. As long as the store kept making a profit, then the management above him didn't care how badly he treated his employees or flouted the rules for his own gain. But it was those same colleagues who had suffered and been scorned by Chris's behavior who had finally had enough. Retail work is hard. Having to deal with rude and impolite customers on a day-to-day -day basis, working long hours of uninteresting and repetitive labor, all for a paycheck that only just covered rent. Like we said, it is a hard line of work, and the people in it deserve the utmost respect. But you throw a megalomaniacal manager into the mix, and you've got a ticking time bomb on your hands. One that'll sooner or later explode. It was witnessing Chris blatantly framing a younger member of staff that finally triggered detonation. The kid had only been a student, working at IKEA all through his weekends to make enough money to pay his bills. Chris saw this less experienced employee not as a human being doing his best, but a chance to make a quick buck by breaking the rules. The manager started stealing cash from the register, 
then blamed it on his young staff member when the losses started to show on the store's monthly financial reports. Seeing that for themselves, the other members of the staff knew that it was the manager's responsibility to empty the registers regularly, so they didn't have too much cash in them in case of a robbery. Given how much they all despised Chris, it didn't take much effort for the entire workforce to organize a walkout halfway through the working day. Outraged, Chris had tried calling any colleagues that were off shift, barking at them to come in and work on their days off. All of them said no. The thing is, when you work in retail, complaints to upper management never seem to go anywhere. Like we said, if the store's making profit, that's all they care about. But seeing such drastic action from the staff of the store he was supposed to be running, the IKEA higher-ups came down on Chris like a hammer. They instructed that he be sent to another IKEA outlet for a whole afternoon to receive some mandatory interpersonal training. Little did anyone realize that this was the last anyone would ever see of him. Not that his old staff was sad to hear that he had disappeared. Arriving at what looked like an ordinary IKEA, Chris parked his car outside. The place seemed deserted, no customers filing in and out of the front doors, the only other vehicles in the parking lot looking like they had just been abandoned by their owners. The manager scoffed to himself. These people running this store were going to teach him how to do his job? Indignantly, he clipped his name tag on and stepped out of his car, marching across the asphalt towards the entrance. The automatic doors gently slid open, shutting smoothly behind Chris as he stepped inside. The whole store was quiet, barely a peep from anywhere. The high ceiling of the IKEA store he so poorly managed carried a lot of noise and made any sound echo throughout the building. The squeaking of shoes against the vinyl floors, the bustle of customers, the electronic beep of cash registers, and the lull, dulled music played over the intercom. But there was none of that here. A deathly silence filled the aisles of flat pack furniture, display models of hemnesses and tricils standing as still and foreboding as gravestones. Suddenly, the sound of movement reverberated from between one row of aisles. Chris began marching towards its source, expecting to find an employee who would point him in the direction of the office where his training was supposed to be conducted. Sure enough, within a few steps, Chris spotted a figure in a familiar bright yellow t-shirt and blue pants, the same uniform his IKEA underlings wore at his store. Excuse me, he called as he strode towards the employee, shoes clomping against the floor with every step. You need to tell me where your manager is. I'm from the store across town, here for some pointless training seminar. Chris hadn't waited until he was close enough to engage in pleasant conversation, instead making his demands as he approached. The figure in the IKEA uniform, however, didn't turn to face him. Hey, I'm talking to you, Chris shouted. You deaf or something? There was a pause, telling Chris that what happened next wasn't in response to what he said, although that didn't make it any less frightening. The figure, who had been hunched over near the floor, suddenly drew itself up to its full height. It towered over Chris. It must have measured close to seven whole feet. As it turned, the malignant manager saw its face, or that it didn't have one. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but a smooth surface without any discernible features. Its arms were elongated, huge claw-like hands hanging down to the creature's knees. Being a coward, Chris turned and ran immediately. Confrontation was another area his employees had noticed he was sorely lacking in. Whenever faced with a rude and cantankerous customer, Chris would never defend his colleagues or their actions. Instead, he would suck up and brown nose to customers who were clearly in the wrong, essentially rolling over the minute anyone raised their voice. So now confronted with a lumbering, faceless entity, his self-preservation instincts were kicked into overdrive, and he raced deeper into the store. Not exactly in the best shape, he slowed to a halt, wheezing as he tried to catch his breath. That was when, looking around, Chris noticed just how long the aisle seemed. He was sure he would still be able to see the front door from here, yet couldn't spot the entrance anywhere from where he was currently standing, panting like a thirsty dog. He looked over his shoulder. There was no sign of the staff member he'd encountered. Little did Chris know that it had lumbered off in the opposite direction the second he had run away from it, hardly paying him any mind, at least while the lights were still on. Unable to find the entrance or even a fire door he couldn't escape through, it didn't take long for the lights inside the infinite IKEA to dim. 
marking the start of the night cycle. Something about it being darker made the sounds of shuffling even more noticeable. There were more than one of those faceless, uniformed creatures. Trembling Chris climbed inside a klepstad, a wardrobe with a sliding door. Barely able to sleep with his knees tucked up under his chin, he spent the entire night inside the cramped, confined space. Every sound of movement from outside brought with it the mental image of one of the staff sliding open the outer door and reaching down to grab him. The whole sleepless while, Chris couldn't help but think about what he could have possibly done to deserve this cruel fate. The next morning, the lights came back on and started to bleed through the seams of the flat pack wardrobe, waking Chris from what little restless sleep he had gotten. He paused, unsure if he should venture out in case he came across another one of the staff. Suddenly, he heard the sound of voices, muted and muffled by the door of the Klepstad, but definitely real human voices. Had it all been some horrible nightmare? Had he fallen asleep at work and been stuffed into a wardrobe by his ungrateful employees? Oh, now he had them. He would sue every last one of them out of their jobs. Sliding the door open and tumbling out of the Klepstad, Chris found himself flying face down on the store floor, his legs too cramped to move. Just as he tried to will them into moving again, a voice called out to him. Hey, mister, it said. You okay there? A trio of footsteps raced over to where he was. And before he could get a good look at who they belonged to, hands were pulling Chris up off the floor. He looked at his rescuers, bemused to see other people in this endless void of affordable homeware. They were two men and a woman, each in disheveled clothing that looked like they had been wearing the same thing for years. Easy there, fella, one of the men spoke. Name's Buster. Which settlement are you from? What do you mean by settlement? Chris asked, confused. Looks like we got another newbie, the woman chuckled dryly. When'd you get here? Ah, uh, yesterday, I think, the former manager answered. Time can be a bit screwy in here, the second man chimed in. I'm Nolan. This here is Janine. You got a name? Uh, Chris, he nodded. You hungry, Chris? The three survivors led Chris through the winding expanse of the Ikea without an end, navigating the identical aisles with the expertise of people that had been here long enough to know their way around. In what felt like the tiniest fraction of the time that he had been lost the day before, they brought Chris to the food court. It was bustling with activity, more so than the one at his store, with people patiently lining up to take their fill of food from the Ikea menu. After joining the queue, Buster returned and handed Chris a plate of Swedish meatballs with mashed potato, peas, cream sauce, and lingonberry jam. So pleased to see food again, Chris began to gluttonously devour the whole plate while the others explained some of what was going on here, although he was barely listening. According to Janine, who had been there the longest, the inside of this Ikea was like an endless maze. There was no clear way out, even when retracing steps back the way one first entered. Nolan then weighed in and explained that there were pockets of people who had survived this long inside SCP-3008 by forming their own little communities. Thanks to the sheer amount of space within the store, these settlements were almost the size of small townships, built using whatever furniture, appliances, and other materials the other survivors had been able to scrounge up. How come you don't run out of food? Chris interjected. It replenishes every day, man, Buster replied, gesturing to the food court around them. Sure, it's not ideal if you aren't a huge fan of Ikea food, but you get used to it. Could be worse, all things considered. Then what the hell do you all do for money? The stubborn manager demanded. Look around you, Janine scoffed. We don't need it in here, we're cut off from the rest of the world. Stuff like money hardly makes a difference. Can't get us home or keep us fed, so what's the point? Chris sighed. Evidently frustrated at the prospect of living inside an Ikea, yet not having the opportunity for monetary gain. So, who's in charge? He asked. Who runs this place? Well, no one. Nolan shrugged. Settlements all work together, help each other out if needed, but we don't have any singular person running things. Hearing that out loud caused a twisted idea to form in Chris's balding head. Asking to be escorted by Buster to the right aisle, he started gathering up what he needed to make a rudimentary crown. What's that for? Buster asked, a little concerned about what Chris was planning. Oh, you wouldn't understand, he replied, not looking up from applying hot glue. Don't worry, I'll explain it in nice, simple terms when I'm ready. That night, despite being welcomed into the trio's town of Lighting with open arms, Chris slipped back to the food court while the other settlers were sleeping. Carefully, he avoided the lurking staff and their drone calls of, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. Reaching his destination, the malicious manager lay in wait for the next morning, 
hiding out underneath the counter where the food was served. The next morning, the collected survivors of the infinite Ikea were met with an unfamiliar sight as they approached the food court. All the food had gone. It had still replenished overnight like it usually did, but someone had gathered it up before anyone had a chance to eat. Stood atop the counter with a smug look on his face, Chris made a show of placing his crown over his head. Morning, everyone, he announced. From today, things are going to be a little different around here, but I'm sure we'll be able to work together like one big happy family. Holding the gathered SCP-3008 residents as his literal captive audience, all of them hungry and irritable, Chris outlined what he had determined to be the best system possible for how things should be run inside the Endless Store. I will keep all the food secure and safe, and we're going to start rationing it out, he explained. What for? A voice shouted from the crowd. It reappears every night anyway. Well, here's what we're going to do. If you just shut up and let me finish, Chris replied calmly but with a condescending tone of superiority. According to Chris's grand scheme, every day each settlement would be allocated what he deemed to be an acceptable amount of ration food to feed its population of survivors. Then he made an offer to anyone who was willing to help him. If someone provided their services in collecting the food each morning and distributing the rationed amount, then Chris would allow them to take an extra portion of rations just for themselves. You see now? He asked the crowd, oblivious to how many of them were scowling at him. Anyone that wants to help, they get rewarded with a little bit extra. Call it a bonus. What if we don't want to help you? Another onlooker called. Well, that's fine by me, Chris sneered back. More for those who want it. I think what they mean is, Janine shouted from the group. What if we don't want you to implement this ridiculous system at all? What's to stop us from just taking the food we need every morning like we did before you showed up? Typical, he tutted. How lazy. You just want the privilege of having more, then you should work to earn it. And as for your silly little notion of just taking, I'm going to be here every morning. I'll get to decide who eats and who doesn't, and how much they deserve. And if anyone wants to take more than they deserve without offering their help in return, then they'll get half of the rations they would get, and so will their settlement. So with those queries out of the way, allow me to introduce myself as your new store manager. When they recovered Chris's body outside of the entrance to SCP-3008, the Foundation had no way of knowing exactly who had beaten him up so badly. The other survivors inside the infinite Ikea might have done it themselves, while overthrowing his short-lived stint as manager. Or they might have decided not to lower themselves to that level, and instead shunned him from entering their settlements, leaving him to fend for himself. With the staff around every corner and their history of turning aggressive towards humans come nightfall, Chris's chances of survival were slim. The only real clue was the note that had been found with him which read, You can have him back. We don't want him. Now if you aren't quite ready to check out of the infinite Ikea, then you should go and check out Life in the Endless Ikea for another tale of a trapped soul in SCP-3008. And then, if you ever want suggestions on what to do if you find yourself in the same predicament, then How to Actually Beat SCP-3008 The Infinite Ikea is the only survival guide you'll ever need.